mastering the core teachings of the buddha an unusually hardcore dharma book written by the arahat daniel m ingram m d narrated by kirk ziegler copyright 2008 daniel m ingram forward and warning when i was about fifteen years old i accidentally ran into some of the classic early meditation experiences described in the ancient texts and my reluctant spiritual quest began i did not realize what had happened nor did i realize that i had crossed something like a point of no return something that i would later call the arising and passing away i knew that i had had a very strange dream with bright lights that my entire body and world had seemed to explode like fireworks and that afterwards i somehow had to find something but i had no idea what that was i philosophized frantically for years until i finally began to realize that no amount of thinking was going to solve my deeper spiritual issues and complete the cycle of practice that had already started i had a very good friend in the band who employed me as a sound tech and roadie he was in a similar place caught like me in something we would later call the dark night and other names he also realized that logic and cognitive restructuring were not going to help us in the end we looked carefully at what other philosophers had done when they came to the same point and noted that some of our favorites had turned to mystical practices we reasoned that some sort of non-dual wisdom that came from direct experience was the only way to go but acquiring that sort of wisdom seemed a daunting task if not impossible he was a bit farther along than i was in his spiritual crisis and finally i had no choice but to give it a try he quit the music business moved back to california and lived in a run-down old mobile home driving pizza to save money so that he could go off on a spiritual quest he finally did some intensive meditation retreats and then eventually took off to asia for a year of intensive practice under the guidance of meditation masters in the burmese theravada buddhist tradition when he came back the beliefs of his practice were obvious and a few years later i began to try to follow a similar path in 1994 i began going on intensive meditation retreats and doing a lot of daily practice i also ran into some very odd and interesting experiences and began to look around for more guidance on how to proceed and keep things in perspective good teachers were few and far away their time limited and often expensive to obtain and their answers to my questions were often guarded and cryptic even my old music friend was keeping most of what he knew to himself and issues around disclosure of meditation theory and personal practice details nearly cost us our friendship frustrated i turned to books reading extensively poring over texts both modern and ancient looking for conceptual frameworks that might help me navigate skillfully in territory that was completely outside my previous experience despite having access to an astounding number of great and detailed dharma books i found that they left out lots of details that turned out to be very important i learned the hard way that using conceptual frameworks that were too idealistic or that were not fully explained could be as bad as using none at all further i found that much of the theory about progress contained ideals and myths that simply did not hold up to reality testing as much as i wanted them to i also came to the profound realization that they have actually worked all this stuff out those darn buddhists have come up with very simple techniques that lead directly to remarkable results if you follow instructions and get the dose high enough while some people don't like this sort of cookbook approach to meditation I am so grateful for their recipes that words fail to express my profound gratitude for the successes they have afforded me. Their simple and ancient practices revealed more and more of what I sought. I found my experiences filling in the gaps in the texts and teachings, debunking the myths that pervade the standard Buddhist dogma, and revealing the secrets meditation teachers routinely keep to themselves. Finally, I came to a place where I felt comfortable writing the book that I had been looking for, the book you now hold in your hands. This book is for those who really want to master the core teachings of the Buddha, and who are willing to put in the time and effort required. It is also for those who are tired of having to decipher the code of modern and ancient Dharma books, 
as it is designed to be honest, explicit, straightforward, and rigorously technical. Like many of the commentaries on the Pali Canon, it is organized along the lines of the three basic trainings that Buddha taught, morality, concentration, and wisdom. Throughout this book I have tried to be as utilitarian and pragmatic as possible, and the emphasis is always on how to actually get it at the level that makes some difference. All sections also assume to some degree that you have a practice of some sort, hang out in some sort of spiritual scene, and know a bit of the standard Dharma lingo. All sections also assume that you are willing to do the work. I have tried to include enough information to make this book capable of standing on its own as a manual of meditation and for walking the spiritual path. However, I have also tried to focus on those areas that I consider to be my core competencies, and also those areas of the spiritual path that I do not feel have been adequately covered in the works that have come before this one. This book shines in areas of technique and the fine points of very high-level practice. However, the spiritual life is vast beyond measure and cannot possibly be adequately covered in a single book. Thus, I will often refer you to other excellent sources for more details on those topics that I feel have already been covered quite well by other authors. I strongly suggest checking out at least some, if not all, of these other sources. Like my own practice, this book is heavily influenced by the teachings of the late, great Mahasi Sayada, a Burmese meditation master and scholar in the Theravada Buddhist tradition, and by those in his lineage and outside it. There are numerous references to other excellent traditions as well, some Buddhist and some not. It is my sincere wish that all diligent students of meditation find something in this book that is of practical value to them. I have included a few of my own experiences and labeled them as such. This is done to try to add some sense of the reality of what is possible, both in terms of successes and failures. They should add a human dimension to the theory. However, if you find that these stories get in the way, or if they seem to have too much of the quality of, let me tell you about my personal spiritual quest, please do us both a favor and skip over them without a second thought. I have also written this book in what is clearly my own voice. Those who have read this work, who know me, tell me that they can almost hear me saying it. I have also left in a lot of my neurotic stuff and made it as obvious as I can. I will assert that anyone who writes puts their stuff in there, even if they try to hide it. So at least you should be able to see it clearly, rather than it being hidden and covert. If you want a book that is just the straight dogma and theory, Without this sort of voice, there are lots to choose from, and I will mention a number along the way. I have also included a modicum of social commentary, some of which has a definite bite to it. Some of you may not find it helpful, or even find it quite distasteful and offensive. Some of you will quickly dismiss it as harsh or wrong speech. I am torn between the feeling that there really are some important points in those sections, and the understanding that not everyone will be able to make good use of information and opinions presented in such strong terms. Thus, I ask you to please skip over those chapters and get to the friendlier, more technical sections beyond them, if you don't find them helpful. To facilitate doing so, I have included a lightning flash in the titles of those chapters that contain potentially inflammatory material, so they may be treated appropriately. While I feel that the points made in those chapters are important and potentially quite valid and useful, they are not absolutely necessary for understanding the chapters that follow them. The world is brimming with very nice and friendly Dharma books. There are hundreds available on the shelves of any mega bookstore. However, I believe that there is room for a book that sometimes conveys its message in a very different voice though I respectfully give you the option to choose of how much of that voice you want to hear. It is the unrestrained voice of one from a generation whose radicals wore spikes and combat boots, rather than beads and sandals, listened to the sex pistols rather than the moody blues, wouldn't know a beat poet or early sixties dharma bum from a hole in the ground, and thought the hippies were pretty frickin' knave, not that we don't owe them a lot. 
it is also the unrestrained voice of one whose practice has been dedicated to complete and unexcelled mastery of the traditional hardcore stages of the path rather than some sort of vapid new age fluff or pop psychological head trip if that ain't you consider reading something else as a highly regarded senior meditation teacher and scholar who will remain anonymous said to me after skimming through an earlier draft of this book most buddhists are just aging boomers who want to do something to feel better about themselves as they get older and are not really interested in this sort of thing i wish them great success in getting those valid needs met and so i must reluctantly advise such individuals to avoid reading this book or at least the chapters marked with a flash this is simultaneously an admission of the limitations of this work an invitation to adopt a more empowering view of what is possible on the spiritual path and a warning i have had other motivations for writing this book a number of people have attempted to have me be their meditation teacher i have done what i can to encourage them to practice well go on retreats and explore but as soon as i get the sense that they are not into really doing the work or are trying to idolize me even in small ways I go out of my way to alienate them completely. I greatly prefer the company of fellow adventurers who wish to explore the mysteries of this life together than any other sort of relationship. Dharma friends may be at different stages in the practice, and one friend may teach another something useful, but this has a very different feel from people who are formally teacher and student. Thus, writing this book allows me to hand them the better part of what I know and say, here, if you're really into it, there is more than enough here to allow you to plunge as deep as you care to. If not, I have wasted little of my time and can avoid being put on some strange pedestal or pillory, at least to my face. That said, I do have the explicit goal of facilitating others to become living masters of this material, that they may go forth and help to encourage more people to do so. The more people are able to teach from a place of deeply established personal experience, the more people will be able to learn the Dharma well, and the saner and happier the world will be. This brings me to the question of the issue of what some would call hierarchy. The simple fact is that there are those who have attained to what is called awakening, enlightenment, realization, etc., and those that haven't. There are those with strong concentration abilities and those without. There are those who have their morality tripped together and those that don't. There are those who are masters of some things and those that have more work to do. While there is a strangely pervasive movement in the West to try to imagine everyone as equal in the world of spirituality, it is obviously completely delusional and wrong-headed. When I went looking for teachers and friends to practice with and help me along, rather than get mad that some people claimed to know more than I did, I was excited by the opportunity, however rare, to study with people who knew what they were doing. This just makes sense. Read this as another warning. If you get good enough at these things, people will often have bad reactions to you if you go around talking about it and the number who will instead find your achievements a source of inspiration and empowerment, as they rightly should, will likely be few. On that same front, it is a very strange thing to have such a completely different language, set of experiences and perspectives from most of the people around me. I can often feel like an alien, wearing a trench coat of normalcy, and I dream of a world where conversations about the sorts of events and insights that have come to dominate my everyday experience are much more common and normal. Reading between the lines, you should take this admission as yet another warning. If you get way into this stuff, you will discover this same loneliness. I should also mention that I consider myself and many of those who hail from the lineages from which I primarily draw to be Dharma cowboys, mavericks, rogues, and outsiders. Really wanting to get somewhere is a sure ticket to feeling this way in most Western Buddhist circles. What is ironic is that I also see myself as an extreme traditionalist. The strange thing is that these days to be a Buddhist traditionalist one who really tries to plunge the depths of the heart, mind, and body, as the Buddha so clearly admonished his followers to do, is to fly in the face of much of mainstream meditation culture. 
in that same vein i should further mention that the path i have followed has been dangerous destabilizing more often than calm excruciating more often than pleasant harder to integrate than most other dharma paths i have heard of and in general quite a rough ride it has also been profound amazing and more glorious than most other paths i have heard tell of surfing the ragged edges of reality has been easier for me than slowing the thing down in my explorations accidents and adventures i have learned a lot about how not only to make very fast progress in meditation but also a lot about how to do so without completely wiping out i hope that i can pass on some of the knowledge of both in this book this should be seen as another warning this book and the path presented in it are not for the damaged and unstable spiritual seeker you have to have your psychological trip fairly together to be able to handle the intense techniques side effects and results i am about to discuss i hope that you will find my take on the dharma refreshing empowering clear practical honest and open i have done my best to make it so i would like to thank the very many people whose influence friendship support and kindness went into making this work what it is though they were way too numerous to list here this is an interdependent universe and so to write that this work is simply by me is not in accord with reality it would be absurd not to acknowledge the extensive support of carol ingram sonia borman david ingram christina jones christopher titmus charter rogel bill hamilton keith folk and robert burns all of who were very instrumental in making what is good in this book and my own practice possible i would also like to thank john howley roger windsor daniel rizzuto and michael wade for all their help with editing however the responsibility for any flaws this work may contain must fall squarely on me i can't be sure that all of these fine people would even want their names associated with this work but i reserve the right to express my deep gratitude none the less a brief note on style the english language has no great way to use pronouns that refer to a single person without getting gender specific various solutions exist such as constantly using he slash she which can be very distracting alternating between he and she and recasting the sentence in the plural where the pronoun they may be used for better or for worse i'm going to use the pronoun they to mean he slash she thus using what is ordinarily a plural pronoun with verbs in a singular i am not particularly thrilled with this solution but i don't think it is much worse than the others should a reader disagree i hope that he slash she will find a way to forgive me or at least that she will understand the problem making room in his heart for one more author struggling with this linguistic limitation i must also admit that i'm somewhat erratic in my use of capital letters and you may just have to live with it may this work be for the benefit of all beings may you realize what you are truly looking for pursue it relentlessly despite all obstacles and find it part one the fundamentals introduction to part one if you didn't read the foreword and warning do so now the buddhist path has often been called a spiritual path and this use of religious language can be very inspiring for some people the buddhist path could also be thought of in terms of a scientific experiment a set of exercises that the buddha and those who have followed him have claimed lead to very specific effects effects that they deemed worthwhile using this sort of practical language can also be very inspiring for some people in an attempt to inspire a wide audience i will use both spiritual and practical or technical language when discussing these issues however my preference is generally for the practical language you could throw out all the spiritual trappings of the buddhist path and still have a set of basic practices that lead to the effects promised you could also keep all of the spiritual trappings do the basic practices and produce the same results assuming of course that you had the extra time and resources necessary to do both part one contains some traditional lists that were taught by the buddha and relate directly to spiritual training 
They make important and practical points in very concise ways. These teachings were made compact and portable on purpose, so that people could remember them and use them. It is their very simplicity that makes them so practical and down to earth. I, however, am going to take these very compact teachings and go on and on about them. It turns out that the Buddha sometimes made things so simple that we are left wondering what the heck he was talking about and how to do something useful with his teachings. Basically, he was saying, get to know your actual reality really, really, really well and try to do right by yourself and the world. As we all know, this is not always as easy as it sounds. So that is why I include all of the traditional commentary. Thus, these teachings are designed to help people get in touch with their reality in some way that makes a difference. They can also help people avoid some of the common pitfalls on the spiritual path and in life in general, some of which I will talk about later. To that end, we will begin with an introduction to the three trainings, morality, concentration, and wisdom. The three trainings encompass the sum total of the Buddhist path. Thus, they will be used as the framework for this book. The three trainings involve skills that we consciously and explicitly try to master. Each training has its own specific set of assumptions, agendas, practices, and standards for success in those practices. These are actually fairly different from each other, and all sorts of problems can arise if we mix these up and use the assumptions of one training when pursuing the others. Each training also has its common pitfalls, limitations, and shadow sides. These are rarely made clear, and the failure to do so has caused much confusion. Thus, I will do my best to make them clear, particularly in Part 2, Light and Shadows. Each training also has specific standards for success and mastery. These can sometimes seem a bit technical particularly the maps of the high concentration states and the stages of insight, so I will wait until Part 3, Mastery, to present these in order to keep Part 1 focused on the basic framework and practices that make the whole thing possible in the first place. While I think that each part of this book contributes to the whole, there are reasons why you might want to skip to certain sections first and fill in the rest later. For instance, if you are having powerful visions or kundalini experiences, you might want to read the first few chapters of Part 3, and then go back and read the rest. If you are simply interested in the maps of the stages of insight, go straight to the chapter called The Progress of Insight. If you just want to get right to some core insight practices, read the chapters on the three characteristics and the seven factors of enlightenment. Should you be in a mood for some scathing social commentary, the beginning of Part 2 is for you. If you just want to hear my take on enlightenment, then models of the stages of enlightenment might be a good place to start. I struggled for a long time, debating whether to present the maps that tell what these practices lead to at the beginning or at the end of the book. I have included them last, but you might be the sort who wants to see them first, and if so you should read the chapter called The Three Characteristics, and then skip straight to Part 3. In my ideal world, everyone would read through this book two or three times cover to cover, and then work on committing the more important sections to memory. Morality, the first and last training. The original Pali word for this training is sila, which I am translating as morality. People translate it in various ways, with some other possibilities being virtue and decency. Regardless of the word we choose, it is likely to have both positive and negative implications. If the word morality bothers you due to the associations that it brings to mind, take a look at the assumptions, agendas, and practices of this training and come up with your own word for it. I don't think that it is so important what we call it. I do, however, think that we should give some attention to trying to live it. From my point of view, training in morality has as its domain all of the ordinary ways that we live in the world. When we are trying to live the good life in a conventional sense, we are working on training in morality. 
when we are trying to work on our emotional psychological and physical health we are working at the level of training in morality when we philosophize we are working on training in morality when we exercise we are working on training in morality when we try to take care of ourselves or others we are working on training in morality when we try to defend the environment reform the government or make this world a better place we are working on training in morality when we try to find a good and healthful job try to build a healthy marriage or raise healthy children or shave our heads and move to a remote desert we are working on training in morality whatever we do in the ordinary world that we think will be of some benefit to others or ourselves is an aspect of working on this first training the second two trainings those having to do with attaining unusual states of mind and those having to do with the ultimate realizations have limits in that we can master them absolutely however this cannot be said of the first training there is no limit to the degree of skill that can be brought to how we live in the world thus morality is also the last training the training that we will have to work on for all of our life we may be able to attain to astounding states of consciousness and understand the true nature of reality but what people see and what is causal are the ways that these abilities and understandings translate into how we live in the world there are basic assumptions that are extremely helpful when undertaking training in morality it is very helpful to assume that some sort of basic moral code is helpful for getting along in this world and thus that there is some practical benefit to be derived from training in morality it is also helpful to assume in some loose and non-dogmatic way that the more good we do in the world the more good there will be in that world and thus the more good things will happen to us and all other beings it is also worth assuming the corollary of this that the more we do bad things in the world the more bad things will be in that world for us and for all beings these assumptions are not unique to buddhism nor are they in any way extraordinary societies and traditions throughout the ages have advocated that we find a place in our life for these assumptions realize that defining bad and good is often very much a question of perspective but don't fall into the paralyzing trap of imagining that it is useless to try anyway it is better to try to do your best and fail than not to try at all thus we are assuming that what we think say and do have consequences when undertaking training in morality we are assuming that we can control what we think say and do thus creating consequences that are beneficial rather than accepting our current level of intellectual emotional and psychological development as being beyond our power to change we consciously and explicitly take the empowering view that we can work with these aspects of our lives and change them for the better we assume that we can change our world and our attitudes towards our world we take responsibility for our actions and their consequences further as a part of our empowerment we assume that the more of our resources and abilities we bring to this training the likelier we will be to succeed we have a body we have reason we have our intuition we have our heart and we have ability to learn and remember we have a community of others with wisdom to share we have books and other media that contain advice for living the good life and we have our friends and family we can draw on all of this and more to try to live a good life a life where our thoughts words and deeds reflect as closely as possible the standards we have consciously adopted and defined for ourselves the more consciously engaged we are with our task the more we are likely to be successful crucial to the control of what happens in our lives is our intent thus training in morality places a lot of emphasis on intent with the basic assumption being that the more our intentions are kind and compassionate the more we are likely to be able to manifest kind and compassionate thoughts words and deeds further it is helpful to assume that training in morality requires us to pay attention to what is happening in our lives when we are not paying attention to what we are thinking saying and doing 
we will not easily be able to craft these in a way that fits with the assumptions of this training. If we are not paying attention to what the consequences of our thoughts, words, and deeds are, both in the short term and the long term, we are unlikely to be able to gain enough experience to be able to guide our training in morality successfully. It is also helpful to assume that training in morality will help us when we get to formal meditation practices, the next two trainings in concentration and wisdom, providing a foundation of good mental and physical habits that can support those practices. Thus, even if we have little interest in being moral because of the benefits it can bring, if we are interested in obtaining the results of the other two trainings, we should also engage in training in morality. These assumptions naturally lead to the specific agendas we have for what happens when undertaking training in morality. We consciously aspire to have the actions of our body, speech, and mind live in a way that fits with the assumptions of this training. In short, we have standards for our mental, emotional, and physical lives, and we try our best to live up to those standards. When we are working on training in morality, we consciously cultivate actions, words, and thoughts that we deem to be kind and compassionate. By kind, I mean that we work to promote the happiness and welfare of ourselves and others. By compassionate, I mean that we work to relieve the suffering of ourselves and others. Thus, our agenda is for our intentions to be kind and compassionate, for our minds to be aware of what we are thinking, saying, and doing, and for our experience to tell us, as best it can, how to craft our life to reflect our intentions. Training in morality tends to be discussed in terms of what one shouldn't do, and also what one should do. The standard Buddhist short list of the five things that one should try to avoid, called the five precepts, are killing, stealing, lying, taking mind-altering substances that lead to heedlessness, and using sexual energy in ways that are harmful. These are obviously not unique to Buddhism, and seem to be part of the basic set of standards for behavior that societies and cultures throughout the ages have found to be helpful and practical. The standard list of things that one should try to do includes being kind, compassionate, and appreciative of the successes of others. Wrestling with the question of how we can meet this fairly reasonable standard, and yet honor where we are and what is going on around us, is the practice of this first training. We will make all kinds of mistakes that can be very educational when trying to work on this first training. If you mess up, remember to be kind to yourself. There are many great techniques for cultivating a more decent way of being in the world, but there are no magic formulations. You must figure out how to be kind to yourself and all beings in each moment, as training in morality takes into account all of the ordinary ways in which we try to live a good and useful life. It is so vast a subject that I couldn't possibly give anything resembling a comprehensive treatment of it here. However, if you wish for further elaboration on some of the basics of training in morality, I suggest that you check out some of the following works. For a Future to be Possible by Thich Nhat Hanna A Heart as Wide as the World and Loving Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness, both by Sharon Salzberg Light on Enlightenment by Christopher Titmus A Path with Heart by Jack Cornfield Training in morality at its best is grounded in theoretical or direct appreciation of one more assumption, that of interconnectedness. Interconnectedness at this level means an appreciation of the fact that we are all in this together and that we all share the wish to be happy. When we take into consideration our own needs and the needs of those around us, we are more likely to be naturally kind and considerate of ourselves and others. Thus, we try to make it a habit to try to take it into account the feelings, opinions, and welfare of those around us. The obvious trap here is to fail simultaneously to take into account our own needs. Work on balancing both in a way that is sustainable and healthy. There are countless other pitfalls we can run into when training in morality, as it is such a vast area of work. I will spend a lot of time in Part 2 detailing some of the more common side effects and shadow sides of training in morality, 
but realize that it is an endless subject. However, one pitfall that must be addressed here, as it is so common, is that of guilt. We have grown up in a culture in which we can be extremely hard on ourselves, causing ourselves astounding amounts of pain to little good effect. If we can learn to substitute wise remorse, a remorse that simply says, Well, that didn't work, and this is unfortunate. I should try my best to figure out a way and hopefully do something better next time. We will be much more able to train successfully in living a good and useful life. Some people, unfortunately, seem to think that the primary message of training in morality is that they should continuously cultivate the feeling that they have taken up a heavy yoke of responsibility and self-oppression. In fact, some people seem to revel in that unfortunate feeling. Those more fortunate will think, It is so much fun to try to live a good, healthy, and useful life. What a joy it is to find creative ways to do this! There are a few things more helpful on the spiritual path and life in general than a positive attitude. Thus the related and all-too-common pitfall is that people stop having fun and trying to be successful in worldly terms. There is absolutely no reason for this. If you can have fun in healthy ways, have fun! It is not just for breakfast anymore. Also, success is highly recommended for obvious reasons. Pick a flexible vision of success in the ordinary sense for yourself and go for it. Play to win. This is your life, so make it a great one. There is no reason not to try, so long as you can do so in a kind and compassionate way. One more great thing about the first training is that it really helps with the next training, concentration. So here's a tip. If you are finding it hard to concentrate because your mind is filled with guilt, judgment, envy, or some other hard and difficult thought pattern, also work on the first training, kindness. It will be time well spent. Concentration, the second training. On to concentration, the ability to steady the mind on whatever you wish, and attain unusual and profound altered states of consciousness. Training in concentration relates to formal meditation practice. It is also called training in samadhi, meaning depths of meditation, or sometimes samatha practice. Concentration practice involves working at a level that might be considered unusual, particularly contrasted with the ordinary level of training in morality. Training in morality is something to which everyone can relate. Training in concentration is only easy to relate to if you have attained to unusual states of consciousness, or at least have faith that they can be attained. Training in concentration has had thousands of pages dedicated to it, and there are probably thousands of concentration exercises. Some very commonly used objects of meditation are the breath, my personal favorite, one's posture, a mantra or koan, a candle flame, various visualization exercises, and even the experience of concentration itself. The object you choose should be one on which you would be happy to steady your mind. The essential point about meditation is this. To get anywhere in meditation, you need to be able to really steady the mind and be present. That's just all there is to it, and it is largely a question of just doing it. There is an important shift that happens in people's practice when they really make the commitment to developing concentration and follow through with it. Until one does this, not much is likely to happen in one's meditative practice. If you decide to do a concentration practice, stay on that object like a rabid dog until you have enough stability and skill to let the mind rest on it naturally. The first formal goal when training in concentration is to attain something called access concentration, meaning the ability to stay consistently with your chosen object with relative ease to the general exclusion of distractions. This is the basic attainment that allows you to access the higher stages of concentration and also to begin the path of insight, the third training. So make attaining access concentration your first goal in your meditative practice. You will know when you have it. 
So, the essential formal concentration practice instructions are Pick an object. The list above is a great place to begin. Find a place to practice where you are as free from distractions as possible. Pick a sustainable posture. It really doesn't matter so much. Focus your attention on the object as completely and consistently as possible for the duration of that practice period, allowing a few lapses in concentration as possible, and learn to stabilize all of your attention on that object. The more you practice and the better you practice, the better you will become. Find the balance of effort and steadiness that works for you. Practice again and again until you can attain excess concentration. While this paragraph may seem trite or sparse, it contains the formal instructions on how to begin training in concentration. Should you need someone to tell you how long to practice, start with ten minutes a day and work up to an hour or two each day as your life allows. If you can learn to hold your attention completely on your chosen object for even one solid minute, you have some strong concentration skills. That said, you might have ten hours a day to devote to practice. Don't let me hold you back. How long it will take you to develop access concentration is dependent upon a number of factors including practice conditions, your natural and cultivated concentration ability, the strength of your drive to succeed, and how much you practice. Sharpening your concentration may help almost everything you do and can provide a mental and emotional stability that can be very useful. Concentration can also lead to some very nice states called jhanas and other names. These can be extremely blissful and peaceful. Being able to access these states of mind can be ridiculously enjoyable and can increase steadiness and stability of mind. These are of value in and of themselves, and also serve the important function in the Buddhist tradition of providing a disposable foundation for insight practices, such as the third training. I will leave off describing the high concentration attainments until Part 3, so as to keep this section focused on the essential skills necessary for meditation. As once you gain access concentration, getting into those states is very easy. Until you can get into access concentration, you ain't got squat. Thus, pick an object, practice well and often, learn to attain to access concentration, finish reading this book, and by that point everything should be very straightforward. Now, it must be said that concentration practices, like all practices, have their shadow sides. For instance, high and unusual experiences can become addictive and seductive, causing them to receive more attention and focus than they deserve. They can also lead people to becoming very otherworldly and ungrounded, very much the way that hallucinogens can. They can also bring up lots of our psychological stuff. This last limitation could be a benefit if we are in a mood to deal with this stuff. Perhaps the most important limitation of concentration practices is that they do not lead directly to the insights and permanent understandings that come from training in wisdom, as much as we might like them to. That brings us to the third training. The third on the list is wisdom. In this case, a very special kind of wisdom that I will often call ultimate or fundamental wisdom. This may also be rendered as understanding or insight. The whole trick to this training is to understand the truth of the sensations that make up our present experience. The great mystics from all traditions have reported that there is something remarkable and even enlightening about our ordinary experiences if we take the time to look into them very carefully. Those that undertake training in wisdom have decided to do the experiment and see for themselves if this is true, or if those old dead dudes were just making it all up. Obviously, the first assumption that must be made is that there is some understanding that is completely beyond any ordinary understanding, even beyond the altered states of consciousness that can be attained if we train in concentration. The next assumption is that there are specific practices that can lead to that understanding if we simply do them. The third and perhaps most vital assumption is that we can do them and be successful. The assumption that is rarely stated explicitly, but often implied, 
is that we must be willing to stay on a sensate level, at the level of the actual sensation that makes up experiences, if we wish to gain the insights that are promised by the mystics. The corollary of this assumption is that we must be willing to set aside periods of time during which we abandon the ordinary way of working in the world that is called training in morality and even the unusual way of working with altered states of consciousness that is called training in concentration. We assume that the teachings on wisdom point to universal truths, truths that can be perceived in all types of experience without exception. We assume that if we can simply know our sensate experience clearly enough, then we will come to understand for ourselves. The primary agenda for doing insight practices is to increase our perceptual abilities so that the truths mentioned by the great mystics become obvious to us. Thus, rather than caring what we think, say, or do, or caring about what altered state of consciousness we are in, when training in wisdom, we actively work simply to increase the speed, precision, consistency, and inclusiveness of our experience of all the quick little sensations that make up our experience, whatever and however they may be. Thus, the essential formal insight meditation instructions are, find a place where the distractions are tolerable, pick a stable and sustainable posture, and for a definite period of time, notice every single sensation that makes up your reality as best you can. Just as with concentration practices, more time and more diligent practice pays off. These simple instructions can easily seem overwhelming, vague, or strangely trivial to many people. And so I'm going to spend a lot of time laying out a large number of empowering concepts and more structured practices that have helped countless practitioners over thousands of years to follow these basic instructions. While all three trainings all contain some similar elements, there are some important contrasts that must be made between them. The gold standard for training in morality is how kind and compassionate our intentions are and how well we lead a useful and moral life. The gold standard for training in concentration practices is how quickly we can enter into highly altered states of consciousness, how long we can stay in them, and how refined, complete, and stable we can make those states. The gold standard for insight practices is that we can quickly and consistently see the true nature of the numerous quick sensations that make up our whole reality, regardless of what those sensations are, allowing us to cut to a level of understanding that goes utterly beyond specific conditions. It is absolutely vital that the difference between these gold standards be understood. Consider this way. These gold standards do not overlap and may even seem to contradict one another. This is a very practical assumption. All these differences seem to be extremely difficult to explain clearly. I will make this basic point again and again throughout this book. So having gained enough morality to be temporarily free of excessive negative mind states and enough concentration to steady the mind somewhat, look into the bare truth of the sensations of this moment. This is called insight meditation and other names, and it is designed to produce wisdom. Sounds simple, and while it is, it also isn't. There are many types of insight that we may derive from experiencing the world. Usually, we might think of training in wisdom as having to do with relative issues like how to live our lives. In this sense, one might just try to be wiser. Perhaps we could skillfully reflect on something that went badly, and see if perhaps in the future some wisdom gained from that experience might change the way we live our life. This is an ordinary form of wisdom, and so the insights we derive from such reflections and observations are insights into the ordinary world. On the other hand, these sorts of reflections can only take us so far, and to really get what Buddha was talking about, we need to go far beyond these conventional definitions of wisdom and attain to ultimate insights by doing insight practices. Many people try to make insight practices into an exercise that will produce both insights into the ordinary world and also ultimate insights. I have come to the conclusion that we should not count on ultimate teachings to illuminate our relative issues or vice versa. 
and so I feel that it is important to keep the relative and ultimate wisdom teachings separate. Failure to do so causes endless problems and makes progress on either front more difficult rather than easier. Thus, I will revisit this topic again and again throughout this book, doing my best to clearly differentiate those practices that produce ordinary wisdom from those practices that fall within the third training and lead to ultimate realizations that are independent of our relative insights. There are many wisdom traditions and many styles of insight practices. I will lay out a number of them explicitly and hint at many others in the chapters that follow. When choosing an insight tradition, I would suggest you look for a tradition that is tried and true, meaning that it is either very old and well-tested, or at least can, in modern times, demonstrate that it consistently leads to unshakable realizations. I can verify that the specific practices I will present lead to the effects I promise, if they are applied as recommended. Even better, you should verify this for yourself. A brief note of caution here. Occasionally, when people begin to really get into spirituality, they may get a bit fascinated with it and may forget some of the useful relative wisdom they have learned from before. Caught up in ultimate wisdom and their spiritual quest, they can sometimes abandon conventional wisdom and other aspects of their former life to a degree that may not be very wise. They falsely imagine that by training in insight, they are also mastering or transcending the first training, that of living in the ordinary world. We awaken to the actual truth of our life in all of its conventional aspects by definition, so make sure that yours is a life you will want to wake up to. In summary, by seeing deeply into the truth of our own experience, profound and beneficial transformation of consciousness are definitely possible. You guessed it, we're talking about enlightenment. The Big E, Awakening, Freedom, Nirvana, the Unconditioned, and all of that. The arising of this understanding is the primary focus of this book. There are actually lots of interesting insights that typically occur even before awakening. Again, there are no magic formulae for producing ultimate insights, except for the three characteristics. The three characteristics are so central to the teachings of Buddha that it is almost inconceivable how little attention the vast majority of so-called insight meditators pay to them. They are impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and no self. I cannot possibly stress enough the usefulness of trying again and again to really understand these three qualities of all experience. They are the stuff from which ultimate insight at all levels comes pure and simple. They are the marks of ultimate reality. Every single time I say, understand the true nature of things, what I mean is, understand the three characteristics. To really understand them is to be enlightened. Somehow, this exceedingly important message does not typically seem to get through to insight meditators, and thus they spend so much time doing anything but looking precisely moment to moment into the three characteristics. They may be thinking about something, lost in the stories and tape loops of the mind, trying to work on their stuff, philosophizing, trying to quiet the mind, or who knows what. And this can go on for year after year, retreat after retreat. And of course, they wonder why they don't have more insight yet. This is a tragedy of monumental proportions. But you do not have to be a part of it. You can be one of those insight meditators that knows what to do, does it, and finally gets it, in the grandest sense. The big message here is, drop the stories. Find a physical object like the breath or body or pain or pleasure or whatever, and look into the three characteristics precisely and consistently. Drop to the level of bare sensations. This is Vipassana, insight meditation, or whatever you want to call it. It is the way of the Buddhas. All the opening to it, just being with it, letting it go, and all of that are quite important, as we will see later. But insight meditators must, repeat must, look into the following. Impermanence. All things are impermanent. 
This is one of the most fundamental teachings of the Buddha, and the second to last sentence he uttered before he died. All phenomena are impermanent. Work out your salvation with diligence. In his last words, he said everything you need to know to do insight practices. Things come and go. Nothing lasts for even an instant. Absolute transience is truly the fundamental nature of experiential reality. What do I mean by experiential reality? I mean the universe of sensations that you actually experience. There are many gold standards for reality. However, when doing insight practices, the only useful gold standard for reality is your own sensate experience. From the conventional point of view, things are usually thought to be there, even when you can no longer experience them, and are thus assumed, with only circumstantial evidence, to be somewhat stable entities. Predictability is used to assume continuity of existence. For our day-to-day -day lives, this assumption is adequate and often very useful. For example, you could close your eyes, put down this book, and then pick it up again where you left it with eyes. From a pragmatic point of view, this book is where you left it, even when you were not experiencing it in any way. However, when doing insight practices, it just happens to be much more useful to assume that things are only there when you experience them, and not there when you don't. Thus, the gold standard for reality when doing insight practices is the sensations that make up your reality in that instant. Sensations not there at that time do not exist, and thus only the sensations arising in that instant do exist. In short, the vast majority of what you usually think of as making up your universe doesn't exist the vast majority of the time from a pure sensate point of view. This is exactly, precisely, and specifically the point. Knowing this directly leads to freedom. It is wise to reflect on death and all of that, for it is useful and true. This is a reflection on ordinary reality, and thus an aspect of training in morality, that is commonly used to develop motivation to train in insight. Far better to see one sensation arise and pass away. What do I mean by this? I mean that sensations arise out of nothing, do their thing, and vanish utterly. Gone utterly gone. Then the next sensation arises, does its thing, and disappears completely. That's the stuff of modern physics, one might say. What does that have to do with practice? It has everything to do with practice. We can experience this because the first set of vibrations we have access to isn't actually that fast. Vibrations, that's right, vibrations. That's what this first characteristic means that reality vibrates, pulses, appears as discrete particles, is like TV snow, the frames of a movie, a shower of vanishing flower petals, or however you want to say it. Some people can get all into complex wave or particle models here, but don't. Just look into your actual experience, especially something nice and physical, like the motion and sensations of the breath in the abdomen. The sensations of the tips of the fingers, the lips, the bridge of the nose, or whatever. Instant by instant, try to know when the actual physical sensations are there and when they aren't. It turns out they aren't there a good bit of the time, and even when they are there, they are changing constantly. We are typically quite sloppy about what are physical sensations and what are mental sensations, memories, mental images, and mental impressions of other sensations. These two kinds of sensations actually oscillate back and forth, a back and forth interplay, one arising and passing, and then the other arising and passing, in a somewhat quick but quite penetrable fashion. Being clear about exactly when the physical sensations are there, will begin to clarify their slippery counterpart that helps create the illusion of continuity or solidity flickering mental impressions. Coming directly after a physical sensation arises and passes is a separate pulse of reality that is the mental knowing of that physical sensation, here referred to as consciousness, as contrasted with awareness in Part 3. By physical sensations I mean the five senses of touch, taste, hearing, 
seeing, and smelling. This is the way the mind operates on phenomena that are no longer there, even thoughts, intentions, and mental images. Since I just used this dangerous phrase, the mind, I should quickly mention that it cannot be found. I am certainly not talking about the brain, which we have never experienced, as the standard for insight practices is what we can directly experience. As an old Zen monk once said to us in his extremely thick Japanese accent, Some people say there is mind. I say there is no mind. But never mind. <laughs> However, I will use this dangerous phrase, the mind, often, or even worse, our mind. But think to yourself when you read it. He's just using conventional language. But really, there are just utterly transient mental sensations. Truly, there is no stable entity called the mind which can be found. By doing insight practices, I will fully understand this. If you are able to do this, we'll get along just fine. This mental impression of a previous sensation, often called consciousness in Buddhist parlance, is like an echo, a resonance. The mind takes a crude impression of the object, and that is what we can think about, remember, and process. Then there may be a thought or an image that arises and passes, and then, if the mind is stable, another physical pulse. Each one of these arises and vanishes completely before the other begins. So it is extremely possible to sort out which is which with a stable mind dedicated to consistent precision and to not being lost in stories. This means that the instant you have experienced something, you know that it isn't there anymore, and whatever is there is a new sensation that will be gone in an instant. There are typically many other impermanent sensations and impressions interspersed with these, but, for the sake of practice, this is close enough to what is happening to be a good working model. Engage with the preceding paragraphs. They are the stuff upon which great insight practice is based. Given that you know sensations are vibrating, pulsing in and out of reality, and that, for the sake of practice, every sensation is followed directly by a mental impression, you now know exactly what you are looking for. You have a clear standard. If you are not experiencing it, then stabilize the mind further and be clearer about exactly when and where there are physical sensations. Spend time with this as long as it takes. The whole goal is to experience impermanence directly, such as things flickering, and what those things are doesn't actually matter one bit. How freeing! Interpretation is particularly useless in insight meditation, so you don't have to spend time doing it when you are on the cushion. Throughout this book I recommend reflecting on spiritual teachings and how to bring them to bear on our life, but not on the cushion. Thoughts, even supposedly good ones, are just too slippery and seductive most of the time, even for advanced meditators, though if you can avoid getting lost in their content, they are as valid a stream of objects as any other. Try to limit yourself to a few minutes of reflection per hour of meditation. This should be more than enough. There are simply no substitutes for this sort of momentum in practice. How fast are things vibrating? How many sensations arise and vanish each second? This is exactly what you're trying to experience. But some very general guidelines can provide faith that it can be done and perhaps point the way as well. Begin by assuming that we are talking about one to ten times per second in the beginning. This is not actually that fast. Try tapping five to ten times per second on a table or something. It might take two hands, but it's manageable, isn't it? You could obviously experience that, couldn't you? That's the spirit. There are faster and slower vibrations that may show up, some very fast, maybe up to 40 times per second, and some very slow, that are actually made up of faster vibrations. But let's just say that 1 to 10 times per second can sometimes be a useful guide in the beginning. Once you get the hang of it, the faster and slower vibrations are no big deal. Alternately, depending on how you practice, conceiving of this as like a shower of raindrops, a pointless painting in motion, or 3D TV snow might help. Reality is obviously quite rich and complex, 
and thus the frequencies of the pulses of reality can be somewhat chaotic, but they actually tend to be more regular than you might expect. Also, there are not really any magic frequencies. Whatever frequency or pulse or whatever you're experiencing at the moment is the truth of that moment. However, in the beginning, you should go for faster vibrations over slower ones and then try for wider ones over those that are narrower. Don't worry if things look or feel solid sometimes. Just be with the solidity clearly and precisely, but not too tightly, and it can start to show its impermanence. Be aware of each exact moment in which you experience solidity and its beginning and ending. Remember that each experience of solidity is a separate, impermanent sensation. Many people begin practicing and really want to solidify something like the breath so that they can actually pay attention to it. They become frustrated when they have a hard time finding the breath or their body or whatever. The reason they can't find it is not because they are a bad meditator, but because they're having direct insight into how things actually are. Unfortunately, their theory of what is supposed to happen involves really perceiving something solid and stable, so they get very frustrated. You should now be able to avoid a lot of that frustration and begin to appreciate why knowing some theory is important. It is also worth noting here that the frequency or rate of these vibrations may change often, either getting faster or slower, and that it is really worth trying to see clearly the beginning and ending of each vibration or pulse of reality. These are actually at least two different sensations. It is also useful to check out exactly what happens at the bottom, middle, and top of the breath if you are using the breath as an object, and to examine if the frequency stays stable or changes in each phase of the breath. Never assume that what you have understood is the final answer. Be alert. Explore carefully and precisely with openness and acceptance. This is the door to understanding. One last thing about vibrations. Looking into vibrations can be a lot like any other sport. It can be thought of the way we might think of surfing or playing tennis, and this sort of game-like attitude can actually help a lot. We're out to bust some vibrations, as a friend of mine enthusiastically put it. You don't know quite what the next return or wave is going to be like, so pay attention. Keep the mind on the pulse of the sensations of your world, just as you would on the wave or ball, and keep playing. I highly recommend this sort of speed in practice, not only because that is how fast we have to perceive reality in order to awaken, but also because trying to experience 1 to 10 sensations per second is challenging and engaging. Because it is challenging and engaging, we will be less prone to getting lost in thoughts rather than doing insight practices. Our minds have the power to perceive things extremely quickly, and we actually use this power all the time to do such things as read this book. You can probably read as many words per second. If you can do this, you can certainly do insight practices. If you can perceive one sensation per second, try for two. If you can perceive two unique sensations per second, try to perceive four. Keep increasing your perceptual threshold in this way until the illusion of continuity that binds you on the wheel of suffering shatters. In short, when doing insight practices, constantly work to perceive sensations arise and pass as quickly and accurately as you possibly can. With the spirit of a race car driver who is constantly aware of how fast the car can go and still stay on the track, you are strongly advised to stay on the cutting edge of your ability to see the impermanence of sensations quickly and accurately. I will relate four of many little exercises that I sometimes do that I have found useful for jump-starting and developing insight into impermanence. They will demonstrate how we can be creative in exploring our reality precisely, but hopefully they will not be thought of in some sort of dogmatic way. These objects and postures are not that important, but understanding impermanence directly is. In one of these exercises, I sit quietly in a quiet place, close my eyes, put one hand on each knee, and concentrate just on my two index fingers. 
basic dharma theory tells me that it is definitely not possible to perceive both fingers simultaneously so with this knowledge i try to see in each instant which one of the two fingers physical sensations are being perceived once the mind has sped up a bit and yet become more stable i try to perceive the arising and passing of each of these sensations i may do this for half an hour or an hour just staying with the sensations in my two fingers and perceiving when each sensation is and isn't there this might sound like a lot of work and it definitely can be until the mind settles into it it really requires the concentration of a fast sport like table tennis this is such an engaging exercise and requires such precision that it is easy not to be lost in thought if i am really applying myself I have found this to be a very useful practice for developing concentration and debunking the illusion of continuity. You can pick any two aspects of your experience for this exercise, be they physical or mental. I generally use my fingers only because, through experimentation, I have found that it is easy for me to perceive the sensations that make them up. In another related exercise, I do the same sort of thing, sitting quietly in a quiet place with my eyes closed. But instead I concentrate on the sensation of the front and back of my head. With the knowledge that the illusion of a separate perceiver is partially supported by one impermanent sensation incorrectly, seeming to perceive another impermanent sensation which it follows such as the sensations in the back of the head, incorrectly seeming to perceive the sensations in the front of the head, which they follow. I try to be really clear about these sensations and when they are and aren't there. I try to be clear if the sensations in the head are from the front or the back of the head, in each instant, and then try to experience clearly the beginning and ending of each individual sensation. This practice also requires a table tennis-like precision. Half an hour to an hour of this can be quite a workout until the mind speeds up and becomes more stable, but this sort of effort pays off. When I am engaged with this practice, there is little room to be lost in thought. I have also found this a very useful practice for developing concentration and debunking the illusion of continuity and the illusion of a separate self. More on that later. In another exercise, which is quite common to many meditation traditions, I sit in a quiet place, close my eyes, and concentrate on the breath. More than just concentrating on it, I know that the sensations that make up the concept breath are each impermanent, lasting only an instant. With this knowledge, I try to see how many individual times in each part of the breath I can perceive the sensations that make up the breath. During the in-breath, I try to experience it as many times as possible, and try to be quite precise about exactly when the in-breath begins and ends. More than this, I try to perceive exactly and precisely when each sensation of motion or physicality of the breath arises and passes. I then do the same for the out-breath, paying particular attention to the exact end of the out-breath, and then the beginning of the new in-breath. I don't worry about how I am breathing because it is not the quality of the breath which I am concerned with, or even what the sensations are, but the ultimate nature of these sensations, their impermanence, their arising and passing away. When I am really engaged with bending the mind to this exercise, there is little room to be lost in thought. I have found this to be a very useful practice for developing concentration and penetrating the illusion of continuity. In the last exercise, I take on the thoughts directly. I know that the sensations that make up thoughts can reveal the truth of the three characteristics to me, so I have no fear of them. Instead, I regard them as more glorious opportunities for insight. Again, sitting quietly in a quiet place with my eyes closed, I turn the mind to the thought stream. However, rather than paying attention to the content like I usually do, I pay attention to the ultimate nature of the numerous sensations that make up thoughts, impermanence. I may even make the thoughts in my head more and more intense just to get a good look at them. It is absolutely essential to try to figure out how you experience thoughts, otherwise you will simply flounder in content. What do thoughts feel like? 
Where do they occur? How big are they? What do they look like, smell like, taste like, sound like? How long do they last? Edges. Only take on this practice if you are willing to try to work on this level, the level that tries to figure out what thoughts actually are, rather than what they mean or imply. If my thoughts are somewhat auditory, I begin by trying to perceive each syllable of the current thought, and then each syllable's beginning and ending. If they are somewhat visual, I try to perceive every instant in which a mental image presents itself. If they seem somewhat physical, such as the memory of a movement or feeling, I try to perceive exactly how long each little sensation of this memory lasts. This sort of investigation can actually be fairly easy to do, and yet is quite powerful. Things can also get a bit odd quickly when doing this sort of practice. But don't worry about that. Sometimes thoughts can begin to sound like the auditory strobing section of the song Crimson and Clover, where it sounds like they are standing at a spinning microphone. Sometimes the images in our head can begin to flash and flicker. Sometimes our very sense of attention can begin to strobe. This is the point. The sensations that imply a mind and mental processes are discontinuous, impermanent. Again, this practice requires steadiness and determination, as well as precision. When I am really engaged with this, there is no time to be lost in the content of the thoughts, as I am trying too hard to be clear about the beginning and ending of each little flicker, squawk, and pulse which makes up thought. This can be an especially fun practice when difficult thoughts are distracting me from a physical sensation. I can turn on them, break them down into meaningless little blips, little vibrations of suchness, and then they don't have the power to cause me any trouble. They just scatter like confetti. They are seen as they are, small, quick, and harmless. They have a message to convey, but then they are gone. When I am done with this exercise, I return to the physical objects, and they are rising and passing. However, I have found taking on the sensations that make up thoughts to be another very useful exercise for developing concentration and penetrating the illusion of continuity. It doesn't matter if they are good thoughts or bad thoughts, as all mental sensations are also dripping with ultimate truth that is just waiting to be discovered. And thus, I can proceed in my investigation with confidence regardless of what arises. Whether our illusions are penetrated using physical sensations or mental sensations is actually completely irrelevant. Hopefully, these exercises will give you some idea about how one might practice understanding impermanence. Impermanence is a true mark of ultimate reality. So just understanding this again and again can be sufficient to drum it into our thick heads, debunk the illusion of continuity, and once this is drummed into our thick heads, we are free. This can be a subtle business, so be patient and persevere. Remember all three trainings. Following flickering sensations and understanding the other two characteristics of suffering and no self that they manifest can be a powerful and direct cause for deep insight and awakenings. For five years of my practice, I was basically a one-technique freak, and that technique was noticing how sensations flicker. I would do it as often as I could. Basically, whenever I didn't have to be doing something that required concentration on the specifics of my life, I would be riding in the elevator, just trying to see when I could feel each foot, or lying down to sleep and noticing how many times I could experience the sensations of my breath in each second. I also tried to notice this aspect of things for every single sensation that occurred during my formal practice. I used lots of objects, usually those that were presenting strongly at the time, and would use some vibrations on the above techniques as well as some others that I will mention shortly to keep me from getting stuck. But the aspect of my world that I tried to notice, things flickering, was always the same. I found that by making this sort of commitment to understanding one of the most basic assumptions of insight practices, I was able to make fast progress and gain the ultimate insights I was looking for.
Section 3. Suffering. The next characteristic is suffering or unsatisfactoriness. Sounds grim or pessimistic at first, and perhaps deservedly so in one sense. But it is also a powerful statement that our moment-to-moment -moment experience will not permanently satisfy ever. It will never happen. Why? Because everything is impermanent. That's one reason why. I just said that nothing lasts, meaning that you can actually experience everything that you normally think of as a solid world arising and passing instant to instant. So what could last for even the blink of an eye to satisfy? Nothing. The point is not to be a radical, pessimistic, nihilistic cynic. The point is that it is not a thing that will help, but an understanding of something in the relationship to things. There is no thought, mind state, or whatever which will do it. This is not to say that conventional day-to-day -day wisdom, such as taking care of ourselves and others, isn't also quite important. It very much is. Remember that awakening is not a thing or a mind state or a thought. It is an understanding of perspective without some separate thing that perceives. There is a great relieving honesty in the truth of suffering. It can be very validating of the actual experience of our life, and also give us the strength to look into the aspects of life that we typically try to ignore and run from. Even some deep and useful insights can be distinctly unpleasant, contrary to popular belief. There is more to this truth, and it relates to the third characteristics, no self. We are caught up in this bizarre habit of assuming that there is an I. Yet the definition of this seemingly permanent thing has to keep constantly changing to keep up the illusion in an impermanent world. This takes up a lot of mental time and is continually frustrating to the mind, as it takes so much constant work and effort. This process is called ignorance, such as the illusion of an I, and thus everything else is not I. This is the illusion of duality, and the illusion of duality is inherently painful. There is just something disconcerting about the way the mind must hold itself and the information it must work to ignore in order to maintain the sense that there is a permanent and continuous self. Maintaining it is painful, and its consequences for reactive mind states are also painful. It is a subtle chronic pain, like a vague nausea. It is a distortion of perspective that we have grown so used to that we hardly notice it most of the time. The suffering caused by continually trying to prop up the illusion of duality is fundamental suffering. This definition of suffering is the one that is most useful for insight practices. To actually feel moment to moment this quality of reality can be hard to do, not because suffering is so hard to find. It has actually been said to be the easiest of the three to tune into, but because it takes a certain amount of bravery. Yet it is so well worth it. If we finally wake up to this quality of suffering, we will effortlessly let go, drop it like a hot coal that we have finally realized that we are holding. It really works like that, and letting go in this way means being free. Investigate your experience, and see if you can be open to that fundamental, non-story-based aspect of your bare experience that is somehow unsettling, unpleasant, or unsatisfactory. It can be found to some degree in every instant regardless of whether it is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Once you have some mental stability, you can even look into the bare experience of the sensations that make up the stories, that spin in your mind, and see how unsatisfactory and unsettling it is to try to pretend they are a self or the property of some imagined self. If we continue to habituate ourselves to this understanding moment to moment, we may get it into our thick heads and finally awaken. My favorite exercise for examining suffering is to sit in a quiet place with my eyes closed and examine the physical sensations that make up any sort of desire, be it desire to get something, get away from something, or just tune out and go to sleep. At a rate of one to ten times per second, I try to experience exactly how I know that I wish to do something other than simply face my current experience as it is. 
moment to moment i try to find those little uncomfortable urges and tensions that try to prod my mind into fantasizing about past or future or stopping my meditation entirely for that meditation period they are my prey and nourishment opportunities to understand something extraordinary about reality and so i do my very best to let none of them arise and pass without the basic sense of dissatisfaction in them being clearly perceived as it is i turn on sensations of the desire to get results turn on the pains and unsettling sensations that make my mind contract turn on the boredom that is usually aversion to suffering in disguise turn on the sensations of restlessness that try to get me to stop meditating anything with fear or judgment in it is my bread and butter for that meditation period any sensation that smacks of grandiosity or self-loathing is welcomed as a source of wisdom a half an hour to an hour of this sort of consistent investigation of suffering is also quite a workout particularly as we spend most of our lives doing anything but looking to these sorts of sensations to gain insight from them however i have found this sort of investigation pays off in ways i could never have imagined looking into unsatisfactoriness may not sound as concrete as the thing about vibrations but i assure you it is even the most pleasant sensations have a tinge of unsatisfactoriness to them so look for it at the level of bare experience pain is a gold mine for this i am absolutely not advocating cultivating pain as there is already enough there just knowing in each precise instant how you actually know that pain is unsatisfactory can be profound practice don't settle for just the knee-jerk answer that of course pain is unsatisfactory know exactly how you know this in each moment but don't get lost in stories about it this is bare reality ultimate reality we're talking about just be with it engage with it and know it as it is at a very simple level no self the last and perhaps the most misunderstood of the three characteristics is no self also rendered as egolessness or emptiness emptiness for all its mysterious sounding connotations just means that reality is empty of a permanent separate self the emphasis here absolutely must be on the words permanent and separate it doesn't mean that reality is not there or that all of this is illusion solidity is an illusion permanence is an illusion that the watcher is a separate thing is an illusion but all of this isn't an illusion sure all experience is utterly transient and ephemeral but that is not quite the same as everything being an illusion there is a habit of reading just a bit too much into things and coming out with the false conclusion that all of this means that there is some separate permanent us reality is actually fine just as it is and always has been but there is a deeper understanding of it that is called for let's talk a little bit about this concept and how the illusion of a self is created in the first place before we talk about how to use this powerful and profound concept of no self in simple ways in practice some theory really can be useful to the practice as all of it can be understood directly once one has some stability of mind and a bit of insight into what is mind and what is body and when each is and isn't there we have this notion that there is really a permanent i we might say hello i am and be quite convinced that we are talking about a permanent separate thing that can be found however if we are just a bit more sophisticated we might ask what is this i which we are sure is us we have grown so accustomed to the fact of the definition changing all the time that we hardly notice it but the point of insight practice is to notice it and to see just what it is that we are calling i in each moment we may begin with the obvious assumption we are our body this sounds nice until we say something like my body well if it is my body that seems to imply that at the moment whatever it is that owns the body wasn't the body suppose someone points to our toenails they surely seem to be me until we clip them and then they are not me is this really the same body as when we were born it isn't even made of the same cells and yet it seems to be a permanent thing look more closely at the sensate level 
and you will see that moment to moment it isn't. At the level of actual experience, all that is found is flickering stuff. So impermanence is closely related to no self, but there is more to no self than that. Perhaps thoughts are the I. They may seem more like the true I than the body does. But they come and go too, don't they? Can we really control these thoughts? Are they something solid enough to assume that they are an I? Look closely and you will see that they are not. But again, no self is more profound than this. There also seems to be something that is frequently called the watcher, that which seems to be observing all this, and perhaps this is really the I in question. Strangely, the watcher cannot be found, can it? It seems to sometimes be our eyes, but sometimes not. Sometimes it seems to be images in our head, and sometimes something that is separate from them and yet watching the images in our head. Sometimes it seems to be our body, but sometimes it seems to be watching our body. Isn't it strange how we are so used to this constant redefinition of ourselves that we never stop to question it? Question it! This odd sense of an unfindable watcher, to which all of this is happening, yet which is seemingly separate from all that is happening, which sometimes seems in control of us, and yet which sometimes seems at the mercy of reality. What is it really? What is going on here? One of my teachers once wisely said, If you are observing it, then it isn't you by definition. Notice that the whole of reality seems to be observed. The hints don't get any better than this. Here are three more points of theory that are very useful for insight practices and one's attempts to understand what is meant by no self. 1. There are absolutely no sensations that can observe other sensations. Notice that reality is made entirely of sensations. 2. There are no special sensations that are uniquely in control of other sensations. 3. There are no sensations that are fundamentally split off from other sensations occurring at that moment. To begin to unravel this mystery is to begin to awaken. Simply put, reality with a sense of separate watcher is delusion, and unconditioned reality, reality just as it is, is awakening. Quick point here. People can use the truth of no self to rationalize all sorts of strange behaviors because they misunderstand it as nihilism. It's all illusion anyway, they might say. It absolutely isn't. All of this can only be understood at the level that makes the difference by simple, clear, precise practice. So just keep at it. One more related thing here that is very important. Ego is a process of identification not a thing in and of itself. It is like a bad habit, but it doesn't exist as something that can be found. This is important, as this bad habit can quickly co-opt the language of egolessness and come up with phrases as absurd as, I will destroy my ego. But, not being a thing, it cannot be destroyed. But by understanding our bare experience, our minds, the process of identification can stop. Any thoughts with I, me, my, and mine in them should be understood to be just thoughts which come and go. This is not something you can talk yourself out of. You have to perceive things as they are to stop this process. A commonly heard one is, I am always identifying with things, I am always attached to things, with the implication that there is actually someone who is bad for doing this. Try to avoid this sort of story-making. This sort of unmindful mental spinning, but be kind to yourself if it happens. The sensations that make up these thoughts are just empty in the best of ways. So who is it that awakens? It is all of this transience which awakens, though for a more mystical, thorough, and seemingly ridiculous answer, take a look at No Self versus True Self in Part 3. We don't have to sort this all out at once. We can begin with simple steps and the rest will fall into place if we are diligent and skillful. So, now that I have made the possible seem mystical and obtruse, hopefully I will make it seem very attainable. 
the big practical trick to understanding egolessness is to tune into the fact that sensations arise on their own in a natural causal fashion even the intentions to do things this is a formal practice instruction this may sound hard until you think about it and then perhaps it may become so obvious it may seem trite but it isn't and understanding it again and again moment to moment can bang the truth into us and if we fully get it we will be free so start and perhaps remain with obvious things like physical sensations they just show up and check out over there don't they tune into this allow this quality of things arising and passing on their own to show itself notice that whatever is observed isn't us do this again and again and again at a rate of one to ten times per second as before that is all there is to it see that wasn't so hard thoughts breath and all of our experience don't quite seem to be in our control do they that's it know this moment to moment don't struggle too much with reality except to break the bad habits of being lost in stories poor concentration and a lack of understanding of the three characteristics allow vibrations to show themselves and tune into the sense that you don't have to struggle for them to arise reality just continues to change on its own that's it really investigate this again and again until you get it notice that this implies to each and every sensation that you experience so while we can direct the mind to penetrate into phenomena with great precision and energy we can also sit quietly and allow reality to just show itself as it is both perspectives are important and valuable and being able to draw on each along the way can be very helpful said another way we can realize that reality is already showing itself settle quietly into this moment and be clear and precise about it obviously there is a bit of a paradox here relating to effort and surrender in many ways it is at the heart of the spiritual life there is a lot of advice available on this point but in terms of insight meditation practice i would say this if when meditating you can perceive the rising and passing of phenomena clearly and consistently that is enough effort so allow this to show itself naturally and surrender to it if not or if you are lost in stories then there are some teachings coming up in the other lists that may help for day-to-day -day reality the specifics of our experience are certainly important but for insight into the truth of things in meditation they largely aren't said another way it is neither the object of meditation the causes of the object of meditation nor the significance of the object of meditation but the truth of the sensations that make up that object which must be understood once you can tell what is mind and what is body that's for the most part enough so don't make stories but know this things come and go they don't satisfy and they ain't you that is the truth it is just that simple if you can just not get caught up in the content and know these simple basic and obvious truths moment to moment some other wordless and profound understanding may arise on its own a useful teaching is conceptualizing reality as six sense doors touch taste seeing hearing smelling and thought it may seem odd to consider thought as a sense door but this is actually much more reasonable than the assumption that thoughts are an us or ours or in complete control just treat these thoughts as more sensations coming in which must be understood to be impermanent unsatisfactory and not self in this strangely useful framework there are not even ears eyes skin a nose a tongue or a mind there are just sensations with various qualities some of which may imply these things for an instant bare experience is just dancing flickering color form energy in space basically and the knowledge of these which is not as fundamentally different from them as you might suspect try to stay close to that level when you practice the level of the simple direct obvious literal but whenever you are lost in interpretation much beyond this that ain't insight meditation as much as people would like it to be have i said this enough okay then i realize that most people go into meditation looking for stability happiness and comfort in the face of their own existence 
I have just said that I have spent many years cultivating extreme experiential instability, careful awareness of the minutia of my suffering, and the clear perception that I don't even exist as a separate entity. Why this would be a good idea is a very complex topic that I will try to deal with later, but I can honestly say that these practices are without doubt the sanest thing I have ever done in my life. One more little carrot. It is rightly said that to deeply understand any two of the characteristics simultaneously is to understand the third, and this understanding is sufficient to cause immediate first awakening. THE FIVE SPIRITUAL FACULTIES The five spiritual faculties are said to be like a cart with four wheels and a driver. If any of the four wheels is too small or wobbly or not in balance with the others, then the going on the spiritual road will be rough. If the driver is not paying attention then, there will also be problems. The four wheels symbolize faith, wisdom, energy, and concentration. The driver symbolizes mindfulness. This is really a useful little teaching and quite a fine list. The trick is that faith and wisdom must both be made strong and kept in balance, as must energy and concentration. Mindfulness may always be increased, so for this one the sky is the limit, but don't be too obsessive about it. This sounds really simple and perhaps obvious, but there is quite a lot here, and on the spiritual path it is worth checking upon ourselves regularly and asking if the first four are all strong and in balance and if we might be just a bit more mindful. Faith and Wisdom Let's start with faith and wisdom. Faith in deficiency can lead to cynicism, giving up, half-hearted effort, and bitterness. Faith in excess can lead to blind adherence to dogma, sectarian arrogance, being disappointed when you realize that your teachers are human, an inability to examine realistically and revise your approach to spirituality when necessary, and many other problems. Wisdom in deficiency can lead to stupidity, blindness, gullibility, and foolish interpretations of the teachings. Wisdom in excess can lead to harmful cleverness, vanity about one's insights, an overemphasis on knowledge and study over practice and direct experience, and desperate attempts to think yourself to enlightenment. Note, Zen koan training is something else entirely. You can see that an excess of wisdom is similar to a lack of faith, and an excess of faith is similar to a lack of wisdom. When this balance is right, there is a heartfelt steadiness, a quality of balanced and genuine inquiry, an ability to persevere, and yet a certain humility. Faith at its best produces deep gratitude for life in all its richness, for its lessons, difficulties and blessings, and for the chance to awaken. Wisdom, at its best, comes from deep investigation of life as it goes far beyond the reach of reason and rational thought, transcending the paradoxes that these inevitably create. In the end, wisdom and faith converge. How do we apply this? Most of us will suffer from imbalances of wisdom or faith with some regularity. So if things are going a bit off, just check in with the five spiritual faculties and ask, Could I perhaps work? a bit on wisdom, faith, or bringing these into balance? This is a powerful question, and if we are willing to be honest with ourselves, it can correct a lot of errors on the spiritual path. Another good way to apply this is to look at the list of symptoms of imbalance above and see if perhaps some of these apply to us. This is an easy way to see what might need some attention. Energy and Concentration Energy and concentration work just the same way. They must both be strong, but must also be in balance. When energy is deficient, there is sloth, torpor, dullness, and tiredness. When energy is in excess, the mind and body may be restless, jumpy, strained, and irritable. It may even be unable to focus at all, because so much emphasis is being placed on effort itself. When concentration is deficient, the mind won't stay with an object and tends to get lost in thought. When concentration is in excess, one can get lost in one's objects or be focused too narrowly and tightly for reality to breathe. Again, too much energy is related to a lack of concentration and vice versa. When this balance is right, 
the posture is straight and steady, but not rigid, and the mind is bright and focused, steadily on objects and their back-and-forth interplay. When energy and concentration begin to come online without mindfulness being strong yet, the mind may be prone to getting caught in obsessive thinking fueled by the strong energy and concentration, so watch for this and stay grounded in physical objects. So simply pay attention to how your practice is going and adjust the levels of energy and concentration accordingly. Finding the balance takes time and may require regular adjustment as we learn to use the power of our minds. Sometimes it is helpful to be very gentle with our attention, as if we were trying to feel the wind on our skin from the flapping of a nearby butterfly's wings. Sometimes it is helpful to use our attention like a machine gun. Often we do just fine somewhere in between. A willingness to play around with various combinations of energy and concentration produces the necessary personal experience to figure out what helps and what is too much or too little. Many of the problems that meditators ask meditation teachers relate directly to just balancing energy and concentration. So engage with what that might mean and see if you can apply this little teaching to help you see clearly. Mindfulness Mindfulness is in a category all by itself, as it can balance and perfect all the others. This does not mean that one shouldn't be informed by the other two pairs, but that mindfulness is really, really important. Mindfulness means knowing what is as it is right now. It is the quality of mind that knows things as they are. If you are trying to do this, you are balancing energy and concentration, and also balancing faith and wisdom. From energy the mind is alert and attentive. From concentration it is stable. Faith here may also mean acceptance, and wisdom here is clear comprehension. Notice that this has nothing to do with some sort of vague spacing out, in which we wish that reality would go away and our thoughts would never arise again. I don't know where people get the idea that vague aversion to experience and thought is related to insight practice, but it seems to be a common one. Mindfulness is about being very clear about our actual reality as it actually is. It is about being here now. The ultimate truth is found in the ordinary sensations that make up our world. If you are not mindful of them or reject them because you are looking for depth and transcendence, then you will be unable to appreciate what they have to teach and be unable to do insight practices. So if you know things just as they are, this is enough. We just keep coming back to that one, don't we? But from lots of different angles. Each one of these angles might be useful to you at different times, and having a few little lists to look at as we walk our path can bring fresh perspectives and keep us from getting stuck. The five spiritual faculties have also been presented in another order that can be useful. Faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. In this order, they apply to each of the three trainings. We have faith that training in morality is a good idea, and that we can do it. So we exert energy to live up to a standard of clear and skillful living. We realize that we must pay attention to our thoughts, words, and deeds in order to do this, so we might try to be mindful of them. We realize that we often fail to pay attention, so we try to increase our ability to concentrate on how we live our life. In this way, through experience, we become wiser in a relative sense learning how to live a good and useful life. Seeing our skill improve and the benefits it has for our life, we generate more faith and so on. We also may have faith that we might be able to attain to high states of consciousness, so we sit down on a cushion and energetically try to stabilize our attention. We realize that if we are not paying attention, being mindful, then this is impossible. So we work on mindfulness of our object and of the qualities of the state we wish to attain. We develop strong concentration on an object, stabilizing it more consistently. We attain to high states and thus gain an understanding of how to navigate in that territory and the uses of doing so. Our success creates more faith, and so we apply energy to further develop our concentration abilities. We begin to think it might be possible to awaken. We have faith, 
so we energetically explore the sensations that make up our world without exception. With an alert and energetic mind we explore this heart, mind and body, just as it is now with mindfulness. Reality becomes more and more interesting, so our concentration grows, and this combination of the first four produces fundamental wisdom. Wisdom leads to more faith, and the cycle goes around again. The teaching of the five spiritual faculties has also been explored at great length in many books, and there really is a lot to it. In its simple form you can easily apply it, and it can really help sometimes. Balance and strengthen, strengthen and balance. These are the cycles we go through with these faculties, and there is no limit to the level at which they can be mastered. One other thing is accurately said of the five spiritual faculties as they apply to insight training. When they are balanced and perfected, this is sufficient cause for awakening. Section 4 The Seven Factors of Enlightenment the seven factors of enlightenment are mindfulness, investigation of the truth, energy, rapture, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. So, we have three concepts from the five spiritual faculties and four that seem new, but have actually already been touched on to some degree. The order here is closely related to the stages of something called the progress of insight, which is like a map of standard stages through which diligent insight meditators pass in cycles. This connection is a fairly advanced topic that we will explore later. The seven factors of enlightenment might be regarded as a pyramid with mindfulness as the base, and each factor supporting and helping create the other. However, every factor is also important at every stage as well, so we will look into each of these and see what they can tell us. Mindfulness Mindfulness has already been covered above, but in practice I will say that mindfulness can be really useful in sorting out what is mind and what is body, as mentioned on the section on impermanence in the three characteristics. You might want to read that one again, as it is really relevant to practically applying these two first factors of enlightenment. Basically, we need to know the basic sensations that make up our world. This is the crucial formation of insight practices. Not surprisingly, the first classic insight that leads to the others is called knowledge of mind and body, and arises when we learn to clearly distinguish between the two as they occur. So with mindfulness, we sort out what is physical, what is visual, what is mental, what is pleasant, what is unpleasant, what is neutral, and all of that. We know what is mental sensation, and what is a related physical feeling. We can know what specific sensations make up our emotions. We can know each thing and the mental impression of it that follows it. We can know the intentions that precede actions and thoughts. We can know where sensations are in relation to each other. We can know exactly when they occur and how they change during their very brief stay. We can and should sort these out as best we can. Be patient and precise. Become fluent in the sensations that make up your reality. While I have tried to avoid advocating one specific insight tradition or technique over any other, there is an exercise you might find helpful when trying to do this. It is commonly called noting, and it has its origins in the Pali Canon in Sutta 111, one by one as they occurred, of the middle-length discourses of the Buddha very worthwhile reading. It is primarily used in the Mahasi Sayada insight tradition from Burma, though related exercises are found in various Zen traditions, notably Soto Zen and Korean Chan, and probably in Tibetan Hinayana traditions as well. Noting is the practice that got me the most breaks and insights in my early practice, particularly when coupled with retreats, and my enthusiasm for it is understandably extreme. I still consider it the foundation of my practice, the technique that I fall back on when things get difficult, or when I really want to push deep into new insight territory. Thus, of all the techniques and emphasis I mention in this book, take this one the most seriously, and give it the most attention. 
Its simplicity belies its astonishing power. The practice is this. Make a quiet mental one-word note of whatever you experience in each moment. Try to stay with the sensations of breathing, noting these quickly as rising, as many times as the sensations of breath rising are experienced, and then falling in the same way. This could also be considered fundamental insight practice instructions. When the mind wanders, notes might include thinking, feeling, pressure, tension, wandering, anticipating, seeing, hearing, cold, hot, pain, pleasure, etc. Note these sensations one by one as they occur, and then return to the sensations of breathing. Here are some valuable tips for successful noting. Don't get too neurotic about whether or not you have exactly the correct word for what arises. The noting should be as consistent and continuous as possible, perhaps one to five times per second. Speed and ability to keep noting no matter what arises are very important. Anything that derails your noting practice deserves aggressive and fearless noting the next time it arises. Note honestly and precisely. So long as you note whatever arises, you know that you were mindful of it. Noticing each sensation and those that follow, you will see their true nature. Seeing their true nature, you will gain profound insights. What the sensations are doesn't matter one bit from the point of view of noting practice. What is important is that you know what they are. The difference between these two perspectives should be clearly understood. This practice is directly related to koan practices such as what is it and is loosely related to breathing exercises where you count breaths from one to ten one of my very best insight meditation teachers a monk from singapore would hold interviews every two days i was on my third retreat it was a beautiful center in penang malaysia that was very conductive to practice i would come in and describe all sorts of experiences that i was all excited about and he would simply listen calmly to me go on and on, and then finally ask, Did you note it? That was almost all he ever said. It was amazing how easy it was to forget that simple instruction, and equally amazing how extremely useful it was when I remembered to follow it. He didn't seem to care about anything other than that I got to know my reality as it was with great precision and consistency. I knew very little theory then. But during those two weeks I practiced noting quickly all day long and made the fastest progress I have ever made in my life, getting all the way to the very brink of first awakening in a mere fourteen-day retreat. Since that time I have been a big fan of this particularly direct and down-to-earth method. There are many techniques for waking up to the truth of our experience, of which noting is just one. I have found it to be extremely powerful and fast but each person must find what works for them. The trick is to get to know one's reality as it is, and what techniques one uses to do this do not matter much so long as they work and bring results. What is meant by results will be clearly spelled out in The Progress of Insight in Part 3. Investigation of the Truth Once we start to know what our objects are, what our actual reality is, then we can get down to the good stuff. Knowing the truth of these things, called appropriately investigation of the truth, also called investigation of the Dharma. Dharma just means truth. So once mindfulness has made things a bit clearer, we can know that things come and go, don't satisfy, and ain't us. Hey, the three characteristics again. They are the truth. The sooner we understand this, the better and nothing helps us understand them like seeing them again and again. Forgive this brief digression, but I am no fan of the popular term mindfulness meditation, as mindfulness is essential for both concentration practices, which lead to temporary bliss states, and insight practices, which lead to fundamental freedom. The crucial difference between these meditation practices is that insight practices also stress investigation of the three characteristics, whereas concentration practices emphasize stabilizing in the illusion of solidity and continuity while ignoring the fact that the sensations that make up this are all impermanent, etc. 
thus i hope that one day the modern meditation world drops this confusing term in favor of more precise language in addition to the categories of sensations mentioned above in mindfulness one should also consider consistent investigation of all sensations that seem to have to do with the direction and movement of attention as well as investigating all sensations that have to do with questioning wanting the application of energy and even the individual sensations that make up the process of investigation itself these are very interesting objects as are the hindrances traditionally books on meditation spend a lot of time discussing the possible hindrances to meditation i will not the hindrances are an important topic but they can easily begin to seem more ominous than they really are hindrances are just anything of which we are not mindful and of which we did not investigate the truth now that we know to be mindful and investigate the three characteristics of all moment-to-moment -moment experiences there will only be hindrances when we forget to do this if we do not forget to do this there will be no hindrances no phenomena are inherently a hindrance unless we do not understand them if we did not understand at least one of the three characteristics of each of the sensations that make up a phenomenon no matter what it was it was a hindrance remember that the content of reality is not our concern in insight meditation but the ultimate truth of the sensations that make up experiential reality is so whatever seems to be in the way of your practice remember that the experience of that moment is the practice and contains all the truth you could ever need all phenomena are of the nature of ultimate truth when we know deeply that these are all of the nature of ultimate truth phenomena ceases to be a fundamental problem the buddha was a master of teaching through analogies that were easily accessible to those listening to him i am certainly not in his league in this regard and this will be clearly demonstrated by the analogy i am about to use for investigation however it has its points and so after much consideration i have included it here buddha gave his analogies names and i have named this one the analogy of shooting aliens bear with me here just about all of us in this day and age have at least seen if not played video games involving shooting aliens as the game goes on the aliens come in faster and faster some taking multiple hits to kill them some of these games penalize us for wasting ammunition causing us to really focus on exactly where and when these aliens are arising so that we may shoot them exactly when they arise as efficiently as possible before they shoot us a few of you may already be thinking get that bloody violent analogy out of this book of holy wisdom the Buddha used many similar analogies. One that comes to mind has to do with a horse trainer, teacher, who kills horses that simply will not be broken, stops teaching unreachable students. Thus you pansy critics can all drop dead. Anyway, in this analogy, the aliens are all of the little sensations that make up our experience. Shooting them is paying attention to them and seeing their true nature perhaps with the aid of noting practice like a gun with a laser sight on it the alien shooting at us is what happens when we do not see their true nature as they become a hindrance binding us on the wheel of suffering for the duration of our inability to shoot them some may even take us out of the game cause us to stop practicing entirely the aliens that take multiple hits to kill are our big issues those things that are difficult for us to break into their composite sensations. Being penalized for shooting wastefully is what can happen if we note sensations that we didn't actually experience because we fell into repetitive, imprecise, mantra-like noting habits. Further, the speed, precision, and playful attitude required for video games is exactly like the feel of well-done insight practices. If you watch some kid playing a fast alien shooting game, you will notice that they are really going for it. They are shooting very fast and definitely not thinking about anything but doing that. This is exactly the sort of dedication and passion that helps with insight practices. When our mindfulness and investigation are on hair trigger, being aware of every little sensation that arises and passes, we are bound to win sooner or later. 
The motto, Note first, ask questions later, is just so helpful if we are to keep practicing precisely without getting lost in the stories. Again, off the cushion, the stories can have some value if not taken too seriously. On the cushion, take no prisoners. Note them all, and let God sort them out. This is seemingly extreme, but actually very powerful and profound advice. Do not dismiss the analogy of shooting aliens. Where the analogy of shooting aliens breaks down is that all these aliens want is attention and acceptance. They come to us so that we will greet them clearly and openly, but if we fail to do this, they can get very troublesome. Their little alien hearts are being broken when we don't get to know them as they are. So who can blame them when they get mischievous and try to trick us into paying more attention to them by causing trouble? Sure, it's a bit childish of them, but we don't always get to meet mature and well-adjusted aliens. Thus, rather than killing our aliens by shooting them, we give them what they want by noticing or noting them. We don't invite the pretty ones to stay with us forever, nor do we ignore the boring aliens. We don't kick the ugly ones from our door, either. Like a politician on the campaign trail, we extend a hand to all, say hello, and then quickly do this for lots of others. When we meet them, greet them, get to know and accept and even love them, they go away happy. I realize that I've just gone from being excessively violent to being excessively sentimental, but somewhere in there there is what insight practices are all about. I have already mentioned numerous possible exercises, perspectives, and emphasis on what may be used when exploring our reality for the purpose of awakening, and I will continue to mention more as we go along. However, I recommend that the foundation of your practice be investigation of the three characteristics of the sensations that make up your reality. If you find it too complicated to try to investigate all three characteristics at once, then I recommend quick and precise investigation of impermanence. If this seems too difficult, I have found the simple practice of noting very quickly to be more than efficiently powerful for gaining clear and direct insights into the true nature of things. Should you find that the numerous instructions and avenues of inquiry I present are too confusing, remember this paragraph and stick to these simple but profound practices. When in doubt, note it out energy. So, we diligently investigate the ultimate truth of our experience, and this can actually be really invigorating once we get into it. Just as playing video games can be very exciting, we have lots of sensations coming in all the time that are screaming to be understood. When we rise to this challenge, things can really begin to jump. Once we have sorted out what is mind and what is body, and begun to see a bit of the three characteristics, this in itself can produce lots of energy, the third of the seven factors. This can be just a bit scary at first, until we get used to how quick and powerful our minds can be. As mentioned in the five spiritual faculties, energy is a very good thing, as it obviously energizes our practice. We can always call up just a bit more energy when we need it, and this is a good thing to realize. However, being mindful and investigating diligently can also lead to increased energy. So now you have more than one way to go about this. Thank you, Seven Factors of Enlightenment. Rapture When energy comes online with mindfulness and investigation, this can produce something called rapture. Rapture has two general meanings, the first of which relates to deep joy, pleasure, and enthusiasm. These are valuable spiritual qualities, and ye of dark puritanical inklings take heed of this. It is much easier going on the spiritual path if we are generally enthusiastic about what we are doing. This should be no surprise, but somehow it is often overlooked. I'm definitely not advocating hedonistic epicureanism here. But to walk the spiritual path with a sense of joy, a sense of wonder, a bit of a smile, and especially a sense of humor, is really good for you and everyone who has to be near you. Sure, there will be hard times and difficulties that can have good lessons to teach us, but be open to what joy and happiness life can bring. Spiritual practice can also produce all kinds of odd experiences. 
some of which can be very intense, bizarre, and far out. This is the other connotation of the word rapture, as these experiences are also commonly referred to as raptures. Some of these might be really pleasant, some may just be weird, and some might completely suck. All the strange physical sensations, pains, pleasures, movements, visions, lights, perception distortions, etc., which may or may not show up as a result of spiritual practice, are all just raptures. Repeat, just raptures. Don't get hung up on them or make stories out of them, as compelling as they can be, and don't think they are required either. They aren't. The sensations that make them up come, go, ain't you, and don't satisfy. Most are just by-products of meditation and strong concentration. Many produce no wisdom, some, of course, can provide deep insights into the truth of things, but don't get stuck on these. Many of these lessons show up once and never again. Some people can get so serious and fixated on suffering that they fight the pleasant raptures and even cling to the difficult ones. Don't do this. The joy and pleasure that may arise in meditation has wonderful healing aspects to it, and it can lead to deep tranquility concentration and equanimity which are all really good things don't cling to pleasant states either as you will just get stuck and be frustrated when they end which they always do in general if you try to fight or cling to raptures you will get stuck and if you can accept them as they are this will be of benefit see equanimity at the end of this list as well as the expertly written chapter nine of a Path with Heart by Jack Cornfield. This is a good place for me to mention the concept of Vedana, which is a Pali word that relates to the degree of pleasantness, unpleasantness, or neutrality of a sensation. If one pays too much exclusive attention to sensations that are either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, while ignoring the other sensations going on at that time, then one is likely to be missing many opportunities for insight. Preoccupation with pleasant sensations can cause one to become a vapid bliss junkie. Preoccupation with unpleasant sensations can cause one to become dark and depressed. Preoccupation with neutral sensations can cause one to become dull and emotionally flat. Thanks to the esteemed Christopher Titmus for the inspiration for this paragraph. Our experience tend to be a complex mixture of many flavors of sensations. They are all quite worthy of investigation. The take-home message here is that rapture and raptures are to be understood as they are and related to wisely, accepting all sensations that make them up, be they pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Learn when to put the brakes on practice if the difficult raptures are teaching you their important lessons a bit too fast for you to keep it together, and learn how to open to the wonderful joy and bliss which spiritual practice may sometimes produce. Tranquility Joy, bliss, and rapture can produce tranquility. We can associate being peaceful with tranquility. Focusing on tranquility and a more spacious and silent perspective in the face of difficult raptures can help you ride them out, and just sitting silently and observing reality do its thing can be very powerful practice. There are actually whole schools of spiritual practice dedicated to this. Thus, tranquility is a really good thing in meditation. We may think of great spiritual masters being internally tranquil, and while it may or may not be true, there are reasons why we associate tranquility with spirituality. A mind that is not tranquil will have a harder time concentrating and being balanced. It is just as simple as that. Being kind and moral can help with tranquility, as this lessens the harsh thought patterns in our minds. This does not mean that non-tranquil moments are not spiritual, or that we must adopt some sort of restrained and artificial flatness. Remember, all types of sensations, mind states and actions are valid, phenomena for investigation and real expressions of what is going on. Real tranquility comes from a deep understanding of all of this, but all too often this ideal becomes some sort of dehumanizing exercise in passivity. Real tranquility often comes naturally, 
though it may be skillfully cultivated as well. Cultivating equanimity of the kind mentioned later is helpful for cultivating tranquility, as is deepening in pure concentration practices, the second spiritual training. Tranquility, concentration, and equanimity are intimately related. Concentration Concentration we have seen twice before, and we will see it again in much more detail in Part 3. One of the challenges of deep tranquility is keeping the mind concentrated. This may seem like a direct contradiction of what I have just said, but there may be stages of practice where there can be so much tranquility that the mind can get quite dull and hard to focus. So, just as tranquility is good for concentration and acceptance, too much is similar to not having enough energy. Remember, balance and strengthen, strengthen and balance. As these are the seven factors of enlightenment, they apply directly to insight practices, training in wisdom. Thus, the concentration being referred to here is a very different kind of concentration than that used for attaining high concentration states. It is called momentary concentration. In the context of insight, Concentration really means that we are able to very consistently investigate each sensation that arises, one after the other. In this way, we have stability in our ability to investigate, in that it can happen again and again without interruption. But we are not trying to attain stable states or anything else, as we are doing insight practices. Equanimity As mentioned before, Concentration can produce great stability of mind, and this can lead to equanimity. Equanimity is that quality of mind that is okay with things, or balanced in the face of anything, even a lack of equanimity. This may sound a bit strange, but it is well worth considering. Equanimity also relates to a lack of struggle, even when struggling, to effortlessness, even in effort, to peacefulness, even when there is no tranquility. When equanimity is really well developed, one is not frightened of being afraid, worried by being concerned, irritated by being irritated, pissed off at being angry, etc. The fundamental nature of the mind is imperturbable and absolutely equanimous. Phenomena do not disturb space or even fundamentally disturb themselves from a certain point of view. There are actually whole spiritual traditions that involve just tuning into this basic truth. There can be great value in learning to see the space around things, rather than just being caught up in the things themselves. A useful phrase from one of these traditions is cultivating space like meditative equipoise. The more we habituate this way of being, the more we connect with the truth of our minds. There are also some really excellent teachings, especially from Zen and Taoism, also spelled T-A-O-I-S-M, that relate to this, such as the teachings about no defilements, no enlightenments, or practice is enlightenment, nothing to perfect, nowhere to go, etc., and checking in with some of these teachings can be very helpful. This is the important counterbalance to spiritual striving and gung-ho practice that can get very future-oriented if done correctly. In the end, even if you have all kinds of insights, if you don't have equanimity, you will be beating your head against a wall, and it actually might feel like that or worse. Once again, we are back to knowing this moment just as it is. This just as it is quality is related to mindfulness and also to equanimity. In the end, we have to accept the truth of our lives, of our minds, of our neuroses, of our defilements, of impermanence, of suffering, and of egolessness. We have to accept this, and this is what they are talking about when they say, just open to it, just be with it, just let it be, just let it go, and all of that. From a pure insight practice point of view, you can't ever fundamentally let go of anything. So I sometimes wish the popularity of this misleading and indifference-producing admonition would decline, or at least be properly explained. However, if you simply investigate the truth of the three characteristics of the sensations that seem to be a solid thing, 
you will come to the wondrous realization that reality is continually letting go of itself. Thus, let it go, at its best, actually means don't give a bunch of transient sensations to an excessive sense of solidity. It does not mean stop feeling or caring, nor does it mean pretend that the noise in your mind is not there. If people start with just open to it, and yet don't develop strong mindfulness, look into the three characteristics and gain deep insights, then their practice may be less like meditation and a lot more like psychotherapy, daydreaming, or even self-absorbed, spiritual, rationalized, neurotic indulgence in mind noise. This was noticing the high prevalence of this activity and the pervasive and absurd notion that there was no point in trying to get enlightened that largely demolished my vision of being a happy meditation teacher in some mainstream meditation center somewhere. Psychotherapy, on the other hand, can be a fine undertaking, but it is a completely different endeavor from meditation and falls squarely in the domain of the first training. I do not, however, advocate wallowing in self-absorbed mind noise and anyone who has been to a small group meeting on a meditation retreat knows what i'm talking about this is what happens when people don't ground the mind in the object of meditation on the other hand even if you gain all kinds of strong concentration look deeply into impermanence suffering and no self but can't just open to these things can't just let them be can't accept the sometimes absurd and frightening truths of your experience, then you will likely be stuck in hell until you can, particularly in the higher stages of insight practices. Reflect on these previous three paragraphs now and often, as many, many errors on the spiritual path come from not understanding the points made therein. Too often there is an imbalance between the first three, mindfulness, investigation, and energy, and the last three, Tranquility, Concentration, and Equanimity The vast majority of aspiring insight meditators are, to be honest, way, way too slack about the first three. Just so, some gung-ho meditators get into trouble when they don't cultivate enough acceptance, balance, and peace related to the second three. When people focus only on the middle factor, rapture, they become vapid bliss junkies. In short, all seven factors are very important. The order here is important. Start with good technique, mindfulness, investigation, etc., and work on the others along the way. In summary, you must have both insights and acceptance, and each perspective can and should help the other along the way. They are actually one and the same. One last thing about equanimity. Its near enemy and its deadening impostor is indifference. Real equanimity is accepting the full range of the heart and experience, whereas indifference is dry, flat, and heartless. This point is frequently misunderstood. However, being accepting of the full range of the heart doesn't mean always acting on whatever impulse comes up. Act only on the impulses of the heart that seem skillful and kind. To balance and perfect the seven factors of enlightenment, you guessed it, is sufficient cause for awakening. Thus checking in from time to time with this little list and seeing how you are doing, and what might need some improvement, is a good idea. And just having this list in the back of your mind somewhere can be helpful. It is important to note that only one factor, investigation of the three characteristics separates training in concentration from training in fundamental insight when purposefully training in concentration we decide to be mindful of a limited and specific concentration object such as the breath or even a rarefied state of consciousness we do not however investigate the individual sensations that make up that state as it would break apart under that investigation and produce insights. If we are not looking for ultimate insights at that point in time, then we should avoid investigating that state. However, we do apply energy to stabilize our concentration, and this produces rapture, a characteristic of the early concentration states. We also cultivate concentration very strongly, obviously, and also tranquility and equanimity 
which help us stabilize early states and attain to higher ones. Thus, six of the seven factors of enlightenment are cultivated by training in concentration, and it is often recommended as a preliminary training before training in insight, for this and other reasons. Training in morality also cultivates some of the seven factors of enlightenment, though in a less formally meditative way. In order to work well in the ordinary world, it is very helpful to be mindful of what we are doing, saying, and thinking, and also what effects these produce in the world, so that we can consciously work to craft the life we want to lead as best we can. It is helpful to exert energy as we craft our life for obvious reasons. We can also cultivate tranquility, the ability not to take life too seriously, to relax, finding that balance of focus and ease that makes for a good life. We can learn to concentrate on staying on track with our tasks, goals, and aspirations, though in this case concentration is more like a form of discipline than the concentration of formal meditation, though discipline of action, speech, and mind is vital for the other two trainings. Finally, we can learn that we cannot get rid of all of the bumps on our road, so having the shock absorbers of equanimity, the ability to stay spacious and accepting of what happens, is also very helpful for crafting a good and healthy life. Section 5 The Three Trainings Revisited The three trainings provide a great framework for thinking about spiritual work, a framework that can help us maintain a clear and empowering way of thinking about what we are doing. In this chapter, I will discuss many important aspects of the spiritual path and use the three trainings, actually the scope of each of the three trainings, to provide an easy and powerful way of dealing with these complex topics. Just to review, the scope of the first training, which I call morality, is the ordinary world, the conventional world, the world that we are all familiar with before we even consider more specialized topics such as meditation. The goal is to act, speak and think in ways that are conducive to the welfare of yourself and others. The scope of the second training, concentration or depths of meditation, is to focus on very specific and limited objects of meditation, and thus attain to specific altered states of consciousness. The scope of the third training is that of insight or wisdom, is to shift to perceiving reality at the level of individual sensations, perceive the three characteristics of them, and thus attain to profound insights into the nature of reality, and thus realize stages of enlightenment. First, I will consider happiness in the context of scopes of the three trainings. As training in morality is such a vast subject, the ways we can find happiness is also a vast subject, and becomes interesting primarily in comparison with the scope of the other two trainings, those of concentration and wisdom. The common denominator of the concentration attainments is that we learn to get ourselves into states of consciousness that are some mixture of blissful and peaceful, as well as increasingly spacious and removed from our ordinary experience. These can be a source of happiness that is far more intense and reliable than the happiness found in the ordinary world. Being able to access as much happiness and peace as we wish, when we wish, reduces our anger at the world for not providing us with these making us less needy and greedy. There is also the happiness that comes from seeing the true nature of the sensations that make up our world, and thus attaining to stages of realization or enlightenment. There are three areas of renunciation that correspond to the scopes of the three trainings. We can renounce aspects of the ordinary world by simply abandoning these things. We can quit our job, leave our relationship, stop smoking crack, and shave our heads. We can try to be less angry or fearful. We can work on our communication skills, trying to avoid lying and slander. Some of these may be easier than others, and some of these may be helpful and some not. But the important point here is that these sorts of forms of renunciation are, for better or for worse, renunciation of aspects of the ordinary world within the context of the first training scope. Or, we can renounce renouncing these things and do them. Renunciation is a very arbitrary concept when applied to the first training. 
There is also the renunciation that comes from being willing and able to attain the temporary concentration attainments. We are willing to spend some time removed from the ordinary experience of the world and enter into states where the ordinary world becomes more and more removed from us. It is not usually that hard to convince people that there may be occasions when having the ability to renounce the ordinary world in this way for some period of time could be advantageous. We can all imagine taking a little bliss break and finding it helpful in some appropriate context. There is also the type of renunciation associated with insight practices, in which one is willing to break from the gross conceptual way of working that is helpful for the scope of the ordinary world, break from the more restricted and refined conceptual way of working that is necessary to attain stable altered states of consciousness, and move to perceiving sensations individually and directly, seeing the true nature of them. This is a much more subtle and sophisticated form of renunciation than the other two, and it is not always easy to convince people that having this option open to them is a good idea. While enlightenment generally sounds very appealing, it suddenly sounds strange in the context of seeing all sensations as being utterly transient, a source of pain, if we make artificial dualities out of them, and not self. People often mix up the three kinds of renunciation, the most common error being that they imagine that they must give up aspects of the first two trainings, a happy life and fun concentration states, in order to renounce them in the insight way, in which they see the true nature of the sensations that make up these things. They imagine that they must give up their job or relationship in order to see its true nature, or imagine that they must not enter into high states to see their true nature. This basic conceptual error causes many of the problems that people find on the spiritual path. That brings me to the three forms of suffering. First, there is the form of suffering that Buddha is most famous for talking about, ordinary suffering, the standard list including these things as birth, sickness, old age, death, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. These are ordinary forms of suffering that we can try to mitigate as best we can by ordinary methods. For example, by working within the scope of the first training, such as the conventional world, I am a big fan of trying to find worldly happiness so long as we do not neglect the importance of the other two trainings. There is also the form of suffering relating to the scope of the second training that comes from being limited to our ordinary state of consciousness, with our only way out coming from sleep or the use of chemical substances. We yearn for bliss that is not so bound up in things like whether or not we get a good job, for experiences like those found in the concentration states. Our minds have this potential, and the failure to be able to access these states at times when doing so would be helpful and healthy is a source of bondage. I am a big fan of being able to attain these wonderful states so long as we do not neglect the other two trainings. There is also the kind of suffering that comes from making artificial dualities out of non-dual sensations, and all of the unnecessary reactivity, misperceptions, distortions of perspective and proportion, and basic blindness that accompanies that process. This kind of suffering, relating to the scope of training in wisdom, is not touched by the first two trainings, and thus forms a background level of suffering in our life, and also increases the potential for further suffering in the other two scopes. This form of suffering is gradually relieved by the stages of enlightenment, as fewer and fewer aspects of reality have the capacity to trick the mind in this way. I am a big fan of awakening and thus eliminating this pervasive form of suffering, just as long as we do not also neglect the other two trainings. The suffering of the ordinary world can be extremely unpredictable, and working to relieve it is a very complex business, the work of a lifetime, and perhaps an eternity. The suffering related to being unable to access refined altered states of consciousness is mitigated by simply taking the time to learn the skills necessary, and then refining them until they are accessible to us when we wish. There are limits to these states, and so the basic states attainable by training in concentration can be very thoroughly mastered within a lifetime, and even within a few years or perhaps months for those with talent and diligence. The stages of enlightenment are permanent, and once they are attained, that aspect of our suffering is forever eliminated and never arises again. 
This can be accomplished by those who take the time to learn the skills necessary to see individual sensations clearly and are willing to work on that level. These basic facts can be used to help us plan our quest for happiness and the elimination of the various forms of suffering in our life. We can direct our studies, our training, and work on specific skills that lead to specific effects and abilities in the order we choose, within the limits of our life circumstances and the resources available to us. For instance, it might make sense to learn concentration skills early in our life, as they cultivate so many of the skills necessary for the other two trainings and can provide increased sense of ease and well-being. For example, rather than popping a cold beer at the end of a hard day, we could bathe our body and mind in as much bliss and peace as we can stand for as long as we wish. If we master concentration practices, we have the option to make such choices. It might also make sense to work on insight practices early rather than later, so as to reduce the amount of time during our life that we spend with the fundamental suffering caused by the illusion of duality. There is only so much we can do to prevent ordinary suffering for ourselves and others, though it is always good to do what we can. Thus it is also good to realize that we can also reduce and eliminate the other forms of suffering through learning the two basic styles of meditation more easily than we can eliminate much of our conventional suffering. There are three ways in which words such as enlightenment are used, and these may also relate to the scopes of the three trainings. However, I feel that this is a dangerous habit, and I strongly advocate using enlightenment and similar words to refer only to ultimate insights, meaning the stages of awakening in the high and traditional sense. While we may hear people speak of committing enlightened actions, or of thinking in enlightened ways, I have come to the conclusion that for spiritual training we either need to be very careful to explain that these are very conventional and relative definitions of enlightenment, or not use such language at all. Some traditions give some of the very high concentration states an ultimate status. I also advocate strongly against this, as did the Buddha. These states are so compelling and seductive for some people that they imagine they are enlightened in the non-dual sense when they are merely having temporary unitive or unknowing experiences. That is, experiences where reality did something that was sufficiently lacking in specific qualities or intensity to be clearly known. Thus, I strongly suggest that such attainments never be associated with the language of enlightenment in any way. Thus, I define enlightenment as permanently eliminating the basic perceptions that either duality or unity is the answer, and thus attaining to permanent, non-dual realizations that are unshakable. It has nothing whatsoever to do with how things manifest, and everything to do with some basic understanding of those things. I devote an entire chapter to explaining this more fully, but it is important for the discussion in between here and there to have been introduced to the strict and formal definition of enlightenment that I will be using. These frameworks can also be useful for looking at other common issues, such as thoughts of past and future, that people run into when they get into meditation. Confusion arises when these pieces of advice are applied outside of the scope for which they were meant. When working on our ordinary lives, for example, within the scope of the first training, the content of our thoughts on past and future is very helpful, in fact, absolutely necessary. With experience, we generate a body of memory of what leads to what in this world, and with our predictive ability, we can use this to try to craft a well-lived life, however we define that. However, when working on training in concentration, such thoughts are generally ignored or suppressed by deep concentration on another object. When doing insight practices, it doesn't matter so much if thoughts of the past or future arise, so long as we ignore their content, notice that they occur now, and notice the true nature of the individual sensations that make up those thoughts. It is common to hear of people trying to apply one piece of advice to a scope for which it was never intended, like trying to stop thinking when trying to deal with their daily life. This sort of practice would simply promote stupidity, and there is already more than enough of that. In short, when evaluating or applying a piece of spiritual advice, make sure you understand the specific context for which it was designed. I thought it would be fun to envision the three trainings as characters, 
and have them critique each other and then talk with each other about ways that they could reinforce each other. I will do this in the form of a short play in one act. While I will exaggerate and dichotomize their issues with each other for comic effect, I do think that each of the points made has some validity. Hopefully you will see through the humor to the important points being illustrated. The curtain opens. Morality, concentration, and insight are sitting in a bar having a discussion. A large stack of empty shot glasses sits in front of each character. Morality. You navel-gazing, self-absorbed, good-for-nothing freaks. I go out and work all day long to make this world fit to live in, while you two sit on those sweat-covered cushions and cultivate butt-rot. I go out and make good money, keep food in our mouths, a roof over our head, deal with our stuff, and you go out and spend our money up at that freak house you call a meditation center, when there's important work to be done. I want to work on my tan. Insight. Who are you calling self-absorbed? I can't be self-absorbed by definition. If it wasn't for me, you would be so stuck in dualistic illusion that you wouldn't know your ass from your elbow. You conceptually fixated, emotionally mired, bound-up manifestation-looking, twelfth sandwich-eating. Concentration. Yeah, and by the way, Mr. Oh-so-worldly, you should lighten up sometimes. Work your fingers to the bone, what do you get? Bony fingers, that's what. And that goes for you, too, Mr. Enlightenment. If you didn't have my skills, you'd be shit out of luck, unable to focus, and dead boring to boot. Who brings up the deep joy and wondrous minds around here? I do, that's who. So you two should just shut up. Insight. Oh, yeah? Well, Mr. La La Land, if it weren't for me, we'd be so caught up in your transit highs that we might just get arrested. Somebody call the law. You two are so easily sucked into blowing things out of proportion that without me you two would have all the perspective as of a dung heap. Morality. Dung heap? You'd be lucky to have a dung heap if it wasn't for me, you emptiness fixated, oh, I'm so conceptual vibration junkie. What good is having perceptive if you just don't go out and use it? Concentration. Yeah, and speaking of perspective, I give you guys more perspective than you have any idea of. Not only do I provide a bridge between our resident save-the-world poster child and the void-fixated flicker boy, I help you two get your twitchy little minds right. I help the Boy Scout here gain more and more deeper insights into his screwed-up emotional world and stuff than he ever could have on his own. And if it wasn't for me, Mr. Altman would just be spinning his wheels in the parking lot. And furthermore, I am fun, fun, fun. Insight. Yeah, well, maybe... But you don't know when to stop, you other worldly space case. If relative man and I hadn't pulled you out of the clouds, you'd still be lost in some formless thinking that you had half a clue. I'm the one with the clue. There ain't nothing in the world like what I know, and without it, you two's whole pathetic little sense of identity would be bound up in a world beyond your control. I am your salvation, and you know it. Morality. Beyond my control, my ass. I make things happen in this world, great things. I am the one that really gets us somewhere. I make a difference. Who cares if there's no self when people are starving in Africa? Insight. Who cares is exactly my point. There is no separate, permanent self that cares. Morality. I know you are, but what am I? Exactly. Jerk. Concentration. See? You guys gotta chill out. Get some balance and peace in your life. Take a few moments and just breathe. Leave your worries and cares behind and fly the friendly skies. It's free, legal, and oh, so recommended. You can quit whenever you like. All your friends are doing it. Come on, just relax. Morality. All right, fly guy. When are we going to deal with our emotional issues, huh? When are we going to save the world? We can't just go on vacation forever. Insight. Your problem is that you can't see the sensations that make up these issues as they really are. So you make such a big frickin' deal out of them. I mean, I see your point, but you are so reactive and blind that you are hardly the one for the job. Solidify these things into huge monsters. Forget you have done this, and then freak out when they come running after you. You need a clue, you confused little shrew. Morality. Oh, yeah. Don't think that just because you can see the true nature of the issues that make up your reality that you won't still have some stuff to deal with. Now that's delusion. Insight. 
It's even more deluded to think that you can really have a completely healthy perspective on anything without me, you monster maker. Concentration. Dude, do you see those angels floating through the wall? Morality. Where in the hell did I find you, freaks? Insight. Short memory, eh? You found us when you realized you couldn't do it on your own. You needed us to really be able to do the job you wanted to do, to really make a difference and be as happy and effective as you could be. Morality. Yeah. And when can I get rid of you? Concentration. When you have mastered us completely. Jinx. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Bartender. The End. If you find that you've gotten to the point when you cannot laugh at your own path, stop immediately and figure out why. I hope you have found this little irreverent dialogue entertaining. While obviously a bit ridiculous, these sorts of tensions can arise until we really have a solid grasp of each training. When we have this, they will work together as they were meant to. The Four Noble Truths The Four Noble Truths, suffering, its cause, its end, and the path that leads to its end, are fundamental to the teachings of the Buddha. He was fond of summarizing his whole teaching in terms of them. Actually, when asked to be really concise, he would just say the first and third, suffering and the end of suffering. This was what he taught. Like the other little lists here, they have great profundity on many levels and are worth exploring in depth. Truth number one, suffering. The first truth is of suffering. Hey, didn't we just see that in the three characteristics? Yes, isn't that great? We also just saw it in the three trainings revisited. There must be something important about it. Why do we practice? Suffering, that's why. It is just that simple. Why do we do anything? Suffering. Plenty of people balk at this and say that they do lots of things because of reasons other than suffering. I suppose that to be really correct, I should add in ignorance and habit. But these are intimately connected to suffering. This is worth investigating in depth. Perhaps there is something more to this first truth that may have been missed on first inspection, as it is a deep and subtle teaching. Actually, to understand this first truth is to understand the whole of the spiritual path. So take time to investigate it. The basic gist of the truth from a relative point of view is that we want things to be other than they are, and this causes pain. We want things that are nice to be permanent. We want to get what we want and avoid what we don't want. We wish bad things would go faster than they do, and these are all contrary to reality. We all die, get sick, have conflicts, and constantly seem to be running around, either trying to get something, greed, or get away from something, hatred, or tune out from reality altogether, delusion. We are never perfectly happy with things just as they are. These are the traditional, relative ways in which suffering is explained, but these definitions can only take us so far. At the most fundamental level, the level that is the most helpful for doing insight practices, we wish desperately that there was some separate, permanent self, and we spend huge amounts of time doing our best to prop up this illusion. In order to do this, we habitually ignore lots of useful information about our reality, and give our mental impressions and simplifications of reality much more importance than they are necessarily due. It is this illusion that adds a problematic element to the normal and understandable ways in which we go about trying to be happy. We constantly struggle with reality because we misunderstand it, i.e., because reality misunderstands itself. So what's new, one might say? Good point. It isn't new, is it? This has been the whole of our life. The big question is, is there some understanding which makes a difference? Yes, or we wouldn't be bothering with all of this spirituality stuff. Somewhere, down deep in our being, there is a little voice that cries, There is another way! We can find this other way. Connecting with the truth of suffering can actually be very motivating for spiritual practice. Most traditional talks on the Buddha's teaching begin with this. More than simply motivation for spiritual practice, tuning into suffering is spiritual practice. Many people start meditating and then they get frustrated with how much suffering and pain they experience, never knowing that they are actually starting to understand something. 
They cling to the ideal that insight practices will produce peace and bliss, and yet much of what they find is suffering. They don't realize that things on the cushion tend to get worse before they get better. Thus, they reject the very truths they must deeply understand to obtain the peace they were looking for, and thus get nowhere. They reject their own valid insights that they have obtained through valid practice. I suspect that this is one of the greatest and most common stumbling blocks on the spiritual path. There is a flip side to suffering which can help, and that is compassion, the wish for there not to be suffering. Wherever there is suffering, there is compassion, though most of the time somewhat twisted by the confused logic of the process of ego. More on this in a bit, but it leads directly to the second noble truth, the cause of suffering. Truth number two, desire. The second noble truth is that the cause of suffering is desire, also rendered as craving or attachment. We want things to be other than they are because we perceive the world through the odd logic of the process of ego, through the illusion of the split of the perceiver and the perceived. We might say, of course we want all things to be great and not unpleasant. What do you expect? The problem isn't actually quite in the desire for things to be good and not to be bad in the way that we might think. It is, in fact, just a bit subtler than that. This is a really slippery business, and many people can get all into craving for non-craving and desiring for non-attachment. This can be useful if it is done wisely, and it is actually all we have to work with. If common sense is ignored, however, desiring non-attachment may produce neurotic, self-righteous, repressed aesthetics instead of balanced, kind meditators. A tour of any monastery or spiritual community will likely expose you to clear examples of both sides of this delicate balance. So don't make too much of a problem out of the fact that it seems that one must desire something in order to seek it. This paradox will resolve itself if we are able to experience reality in this moment clearly. Craving, attachment, and desire are some of the most dangerous words that can be used to describe something that is actually much more fundamental than these seem to indicate. The Buddha did talk about these conventional forms of suffering, but he also talked about the fundamental suffering that comes from deep longing for a refuge that involves a separate or permanent self. We imagine that such a self will be a refuge, and so we desire such a self. We try to make certain sensations into such a self, we cling to the fundamental notion that such a self can exist as a stable entity, and that this will somehow help. The side effects of this manifest in all sorts of addictions to mind states and emotions that are not helpful. But these are side effects and not the root cause of suffering that the Buddha was pointing to. As stated earlier, a helpful concept here is compassion, a heart aspect of the practice and reality related to kindness. You see... Wherever there is a desire, there is suffering, and wherever there is suffering, there is compassion, the desire for the end of suffering. You can actually experience this. So obviously there is some really close relationship between suffering, desire, and compassion. This is heavy but good stuff and worth investigating. We might conceive of this as compassion having gotten caught in a loop, the loop of the illusion of duality. This is sort of like a dog's tail chasing itself. Pain and pleasure, suffering and satisfaction always seem to be over there. Thus, when pleasant sensations arise, there is a constant, compassionate, deluded attempt to get over there to the other side of the imagined split. This is fundamental attraction. You would think that we would just stop imagining there is a split, but somehow that is not what happens. We keep perpetuating the sense of a split even as we try to bridge it, and so we suffer. When unpleasant sensations arise, there is an attempt to get away from over there, to widen the imagined split. This will never work, because it doesn't actually exist. But the way we hold our minds as we try to get away from that side is painful. When boring or unpleasant sensations arise, there is an attempt to tune out altogether and forget the whole thing to try to pretend that the sensations on the other side of the split are not there. This is fundamental ignorance, and it perpetuates the process, as it is by ignoring aspects of our sensate reality that the illusion of a split is created in the first place. These strict definitions of fundamental attraction, aversion and ignorance are very important. 
particularly for when I discuss the various models of the stages of enlightenment. Given the illusion, it seems that somehow these mental reactions will help in a way that will be permanent. Remember that the only thing that will fundamentally help is to understand the three characteristics to the degree that makes the difference, and the three characteristics are manifesting right here. Remember how it was stated above that suffering motivates everything we do? We could also say that everything we do is motivated by compassion, which is a part of the fundamentally empty nature of reality. That doesn't mean that everything we do is skillful. That is a whole different issue. Compassion is a very good thing, especially when it involves oneself and all beings. This is sort of the flip side of the second noble truth. The whole problem is that misdirected compassion, compassion that is filtered through the process of ego and its related habits, can produce enormous suffering and often does. It is easy to think of many examples of people searching for happiness in the strangest of places and by doing the strangest of things. Just pick up any newspaper. The take-home message is to search for happiness where you are actually likely to find it. We might say that compassion is the ultimate aspect of desire, or think of compassion and desire on a continuum. The more wisdom or understanding of interconnectedness there is behind our intentions and actions, the more they reflect compassion and the more the results will turn out well. The more greed, hatred, and delusion or lack of understanding of interconnectedness there is behind our intentions and actions, the more they reflect desire and the more suffering there will likely be. This is sometimes referred to as the law of karma, where karma is a word that has to do with our intentions and actions. Some people can get all caught up in specifics of this that cannot possibly be known, like speculating that if we kill a bug we will come back as a bug and be squished. Don't. Cause and effect, also called interdependence, is just too imponderably complex. Just use this general concept to look honestly at what you want, why, and precisely how you know this. Examine what the consequences of what you do and think might be for yourself and everyone, and then take responsibility for those consequences. It's a tall order and an important practice to engage in, but don't get too obsessive about it. Remember the simplicity of the first training, training in kindness, generosity, honesty, and clarity, and gain balance and wisdom from the other two trainings as you go. Sometimes looking into suffering and desire can be overwhelming. Life can sometimes be extremely hard. In these moments, try looking into the heart side of the equation, compassion and kindness. Connect with the part of your heart that just wishes the suffering would end and feel that deeply especially as it manifests in the body. Just this can be profound practice. There are also lots of other good techniques for cultivating a spaciousness of heart that can bear anything, such as formal loving-kindness practices. See Sharon Salzberg's excellent loving-kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness. Finding them and practicing them can make the spiritual path much more bearable and pleasant. And this can make it much more likely that we will be able to persevere, gain deep insights, be able to integrate them into our lives, and use them to benefit others. The take-home message is to take the desire to be happy and free of suffering, and use its energy to do skillful things that can actually make this happen, rather than getting caught in the old unexamined patterns of searching for happiness where you know you will not find it. The three trainings are skillful, and can inform the whole of our life. By following them, we may come to the end of many forms of suffering and be in a better position to help others do the same. Truth number three, the end of suffering. This brings us nicely to the third noble truth, the end of suffering. Now, as noted before, there are three types of suffering pertaining to the scope of each of the three trainings. Traditionally, the Buddha talked about the end of suffering as relating to mastering the third training, and thus becoming highly enlightened. The first point is that it can be done, and is done today by meditators like you, from many spiritual traditions. Yes, there are enlightened people walking around, and just not a rare few that have spent twenty years in a cave in Tibet. This is really important to understand and have faith in. The other point is that, with the end of fundamental desire— which we will render here as the end of compassion and reality being filtered through the odd logic of the process of ego. 
there is the end of fundamental suffering that's it done is what has to be done gone 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 beyond and all that all beings can do it and there is to make a bit of a mystical joke no time like the present now it must be said that the buddha also praised those who had mastered the two trainings and thus eliminated what suffering could be eliminated by those methods even very enlightened beings can benefit from mastering the concentration states however there are some complex and difficult issues related to eliminating all of the ordinary suffering in the world and thus related to mastering the first training which is an endless undertaking it is because of this particular issue that such teachings as the bodhisattva vow arose and i will deal with these complexities toward the end of this book truth number four the path the fourth noble truth is the noble eightfold path that leads to suffering's final end another list hopefully you have come to like these little lists by now and so one more will hopefully be seen as another manageable little guide on how to find the end of suffering luckily we have already seen the whole of the noble eightfold path in other parts of some of the other lists and it is summarized in the three trainings of morality concentration and wisdom the morality section is just broken down into three specifics skillful action skillful speech and skillful livelihood skillful means conducive to the end of suffering for us and for all other living beings be kind honest clear and compassionate in your whole life in your actions speech and work notice that nothing is excluded here the more of our lives we integrate with the spiritual path the better simple to remember and also a powerful guide the concentration section contains three things we saw in the five spiritual faculties and the seven factors of enlightenment skillful energy skillful concentration and skillful mindfulness the wisdom section has the last two parts of the path skillful thought or intention and skillful understanding or wisdom these two are often rendered in different ways but the meaning is the same understand the truth of your experience and aspire to kindness and wisdom in your thoughts and deeds again simple but powerful section six practical meditation considerations when where and for how long the best time to meditate is when you can as in get it while you can the best place to meditate is where you can and the best duration is for as long as is available or necessary for you to get what you wish out of it this may seem like an obvious answer but people sometimes get it into their heads that certain times are better than others and thus not meditate when that seemingly sacred time period is unavailable or interrupted they may feel that certain places or special circumstances special cushions noise levels etc are oh so necessary and if these are not available then they may feel frustrated and unable to practice they may feel that a certain minimal duration of meditation time is necessary and thus find themselves unable to make use of what time they may have if you have two hours each day for meditation great if you have two jobs six kids and just can't find more than ten minutes each day for meditation make good use of what you've got there have been times in my life when i was very grateful that i had twenty hours a day to practice on the other hand when i have only had ten minutes a day i have been grateful for the sense of how precious those ten minutes were skillful urgency and well-developed gratitude for a chance to practice at all can allow us to really use limited pieces of time to their fullest if you take off a month each year for intensive retreats wonderful if a weekend retreat once a year is all you can do go for it in short honor where you are and what you can realistically accomplish given your circumstances if they are not entirely to your liking and you want to make more time for practice work on rearranging things a bit in a way that leaves you with a life that you can still find fulfilling should you later decide to practice a bit less luckily meditation is an extremely portable endeavor you don't have to lug around special equipment have other people around or schedule an appointment there are no fees waiting lists or red tape reality happens sensations arise if you're paying careful attention to them really feeling exactly what it is like to be here now you're doing it 
It's just that simple. While I have definitely come to appreciate ideal meditation conditions and their obvious benefits, I have also had profound insights and extraordinary experiences in places that would hardly be considered ideal, such as in the break room at work while brushing my teeth. While I definitely appreciate the additional depth of long periods of uninterrupted practice, I am certain that being able to make use of little bits of time here and there has done much to move things along. I sometimes meditate when reclining before sleep, when reclining in the morning before I have to get up, when I wake up in the middle of the night, before catnaps on the couch, during boring lectures and meetings, and in the lounge of the school I attended before afternoon classes. I have come to the conclusion that five minutes of really engaged, clear, and focused practice in poor circumstances can often produce more benefits for me than an hour of poor, vague, and distracted practice in optimal conditions. I have also come to appreciate the value of timed sits, where I vow to sit and pay attention for a definite period of time. I take a little travel alarm clock or kitchen timer and vow to sit for a predetermined space of time usually somewhere from thirty minutes to one and one-half hours. I have found that during untimed sits, I tend to get up when I run into difficult territory, mild pain from sitting, or other things that I don't want to acknowledge and investigate clearly. A timed sit makes it much more likely that I will be able to sit in the face of these things, thus developing more confidence and discipline, as well as the insights that come from persistent investigation. DAILY LIFE AND RETREATS A very related issue here is that of the world of retreats and monasticism, and how it contrasts with the world of daily life, or the life of a householder. Each has its own set of issues, but many of them overlap, and the differences may be more a question of degree than of dichotomy. Now, it is true that the battle is not always to the strong, nor the race to the swift, but that's the way to bet. In other words, those who do lots of practice in daily life, go on more and longer retreats, are more consistently able to concentrate and investigate quickly and precisely, pay attention more often during their daily activities, and have their morality trip more together, are on the average much more likely to make progress. When on retreat, people have the opportunity to practice nearly all day, in settings that are usually designed to be very conducive to clear, precise, inquiry, and depths of meditation. Why so few people actually take advantage of these circumstances when they go on retreat is beyond me, and I will spend some time ranting about that later. The point is that going on retreats can give opportunities for much faster and deeper practice to those who choose to really practice. Said another way, if you go on retreat, make good use of that time. There is a huge difference between the experiences of people who do retreats halfway and people who really follow the instructions all day long. In my experience, there is no comparison between retreats I have done when I really powered the investigations from the time I awoke until I went to sleep at night, causing fast and profound progress, and when I took breaks here and there to think about things such as my issues and meditation theory, generally causing moderate to slow progress. While many people think that retreats are for more advanced practitioners, I think that a few retreats early in one's practice can really jumpstart things, allowing one to make much better use of meditation time off retreat. I often think of the momentum that retreats generate in terms of rolling a boulder over a hill. If you get a long running start, pushing hard the whole way, you are more likely to be able to get the boulder rolling fast enough so that it rolls over the hill in one straight shot. If you push intermittently or half-heartedly, the boulder is likely to roll back when you get to the steep part of the hill, but you have worn the hill down a little bit, and you may also be a bit stronger for the exercise. Thus, it is possible to wear down the hill given enough time, but it is much faster to simply power over it the first time and move on to the next hill. I know of no obvious benefits from slow practice that fails to gain some footholds in the territory of concentration or insight. Those who take the wear-down-the-hill approach may eventually lose faith and interest, having done lots of work to little effect. Those who really apply themselves and cross a few hills early on through focused and consistent effort, such as retreats or really solid daily life practice, will have more of a sense of accomplishment and empowerment, and may have put in less total time and effort than those who tried to wear down the hill. 
This irony should not be lost on those who want to be smart about developing their meditative skills. For example, let's say that you could allocate 365 hours out of one year to formal meditation practice. Given a choice, I would be more inclined to take half of those hours, about 182, and do a 10-day retreat practicing hard and consistently 18 hours a day, with minimal breaks at the beginning of the year, and then spend half an hour meditating each of the other days. I would be much more likely to cross into some interesting territory early on, and overcome some of the initial hurdles, than if I spent one hour each day for that year practicing well. The amount of time and effort is the same, but the effect is likely to be quite different. A few odds and ends about retreats. First, retreats tend to have a semi-predictable rhythm to them. Realizing this allows us, if we have the time and resources to spare, to choose how long a retreat we want to meet our meditative goals. Even if we are practicing well, the first few days of a retreat tend to be mostly about adjusting to the place, the posture, the routine, the people, the local customs, the schedule, etc. Similarly, the last day or two of a retreat tends to bring up thoughts about what we are going to do next. Thus, to give yourself some time in the middle when you are not dealing with these things as much, I recommend greater than five-day retreats when possible. It is not that benefit can't be derived from shorter retreats, but there is something about those middle days that tends to make strong concentration and good practice easier to attain. Second, every retreat center and tradition has its neurotic shadow aspects and downsides. This is inevitable, but by identifying them and realizing that there are ways to have them not slow our investigation down is helpful. One center where I've spent a lot of time is prone to attracting very serious, scowling people who trudge around in their walking practice like the slightest sound or glance from anyone around them might set them off like a bomb. I have been to another center where sometimes I have been the only meditator there, requiring me to have more self-motivation and discipline. Another monastic center I have been to has the whole male hierarchy thing going, which can cause all sorts of reactions from retreatants, both male and female. Then there are basically always neurotic things around food, huge topic of which vegetarian versus non-vegetarian is just the tip of the iceberg. Bathrooms, quarters, showers, hot water, washing clothes and dishes, cleaning duties, heating and cooling. One place I have been to has cantankerous wood stoves in some buildings for heat. Another, in a tropical setting, has open windows that let the mosquitoes swarm in. Clothing, such as some centers have people wear white, while others don't tolerate skimpy or revealing outfits, some don't care. Fragrances, chemical sensitives, incense, morning wake-up bells, too quiet, too loud, someone forgets to ring it at all. Schedules, roommates, particularly those that snore, smell, are noisy or messy, etc. Strictness of silence, eye contact or the lack thereof. Etiquette around teachers. For example, to bow or not. To ask a challenging question or not. Limits on time we have access to them. Their personalities and neurotic stuff, whether or not they speak the language we speak, etc. Etiquette of entering rooms with icons such as whether to bow three times or not, the presence of icons or not, and which icons, and issues of the orthodoxy of ritual, dogma, posture, and position, eating rituals, chanting, vows, etc. This list doesn't include issues of corruption, romances, cults of personality, affairs, crushes, miscommunications, vendettas, scandals, drug use, money issues, and all the other things that can sometimes show up anywhere there are people. In short, whatever you imagine that you or other people might have issues around, these are bound to show up sooner or later, if you spend enough time in spiritual circles or retreat centers. While solo practice is an option, that doesn't get you away from all these issues and has its own set of downsides. The crucial thing is to realize that great practice can occur in conditions far from perfect, particularly if we realize that all the sensations that make up these inputs and our reactions to them are all worthy of investigation, and thus as much a source of ultimate and often relative wisdom as any other sensations. 
I have rarely had what I considered perfect practice conditions, but I have done well, and you can also. That said, some centers, particularly retreats, and teachers are better than others, and it is worth exploring and asking around. All these things can be particularly distracting and distressing for a first-time retreatant, as often there are some naive hopes, however unacknowledged, of walking into the Garden of Eden, sitting with the Buddha, and hanging out with the most evolved fellow retreatants one could imagine. When off retreat, progress is still possible, particularly if one has used retreats to get past some of the initial hurdles, or hills, and get a few tastes of what is possible. Do not underestimate the value of careful and honest awareness of what one is doing during one's life off the cushion. On the other hand, if you want to significantly increase your chances of tasting the fruits of the path, do your best to make time for retreats in a way that honors your spiritual goals as well as your other commitments. One of the reasons for monasticism is that your commitments become your practice. But there are plenty of people who have figured out how to live in the world and use retreats and strong daily practice to achieve the same effects. In fact, in this unusual time in history, there are plenty of places to sit for very little money and get a great support for practice without having to deal with all the ritual, dogma, and other hassles that are involved in ordination. Some of my favorite places to go on retreat are the Insight Meditation Society, IMS in Barr, Massachusetts, Bhavana Society in Highview, West Virginia, the Malaysian Buddhist Meditation Center in Penang, Malaysia, the Gaia House near Totnes, England, also worth mentioning are the Mahasi centers in Burma, such as Panditarama in Yangon, formerly known as Rangoon. All of these are easy to find on the Internet. For those of you who are really into Mahasi Sayada style of practice as I am, the three-month retreat at IMS, about $3,000, or a few weeks to months at MBMC, about $1,000 to fly there, and then a few bucks a day plus donations to stay, are highly recommended. Both have excellent food and are very conducive to great practice. It is amazing the things we spend our time and money doing. As a good friend once said, if you had to flip burgers for 13 years to get up the money to do three months at IMS, it would be well worth it. I prefer MBMC for cultural reasons, but both are great. Burma is a great place to go for the real deal, but there are some issues around dealing with the government, the oily food, the culture, the water, the heat, the parasites, and the malaria-carrying mosquitoes that need to be strongly considered. Postures The four postures for meditation that are mentioned in traditional Buddhist practice are those of sitting, walking, standing, and reclining. Each has its own set of benefits and drawbacks, and each may be useful at one time or another. Looked at another way, this means that we can meditate in just about any position we find ourselves. We can be aware of where we are, what we are doing, and what our experience feels like all day long. Which posture we choose doesn't really matter from a pure insight point of view, but there are some practical reasons why we might choose one or the other for formal practice. Posture choice is mostly about finding one that works in our current circumstances and which matches our current energy level. Reclining practice has the advantages of being extremely sustainable, not requiring attention to maintaining a posture, generally being relatively free from pain, and of really allowing the attention to turn to subtle sensations. It has the distinct disadvantage of quickly putting many people to sleep, and thus most people prefer sitting. A few people, such as myself, are so naturally wired that they can meditate clearly when reclining most of the time and may sometimes find sitting just a bit too intense and edgy. How one will react to the energetic quality of a posture varies with the individual. The phase of practice and practical considerations, such as how much sleep we got the night before, it usually doesn't take much experimentation to let us know if reclining will work for us or not. Sitting is the classic meditation pose, but it is not so special as some would make it out to be. I will use the phrase, on the cushion, often in this book, but I do so because I find it catchy and not because there is something magical about the sitting posture. When I write, on the cushion, I am really referring to formal meditation of any of these four postures. 
Sitting has the quality of being more energy-producing than reclining, and less energy-producing than walking and standing. It can also be very stable once we learn to sit well. However, many people find that learning to sit well is a whole endeavor in and of itself. There are lots of postures, even within the category of sitting. For example, in a chair with our back off the backrest, or with our back on the backrest, in lotus position, in half-lotus position, sitting Indian style with our legs crossed, in the Burmese or friendly position, which is like the cross-legged position, except that our feet are both on the floor, one in front of the other, in a kneeling position, with or without a bench, etc. Many traditions make a big deal about exactly how you should sit, with some getting particularly macho or picky about such things, but in the end it doesn't matter so much. The things that seem to matter most are that you can sustain the posture, that your back be fairly straight so that you can breathe well, and that you are not permanently hurting yourself. Aches and pains are common in meditation, but if they persist for a long time after you get up from sitting, particularly in your knees, seriously consider modifying your sitting posture. Standing is an even more energy-producing posture than sitting, with the obvious advantage that it is even harder to fall asleep when standing than when sitting. It seems to up the intensity of a meditation session even more and can be useful when the energy is really low. I recommend standing with the eyes slightly open to avoid falling over, though some people can do just fine with their eyes closed. If you are sitting and finding that you simply cannot stay focused and awake, try standing. Walking is the most energetically active of the four postures and also provides a nice stretch for the joints and back, after we have been doing a lot of sitting. Its strengths are its weaknesses, in the fact that one is moving around can make it easier to stay present and also lead to a lack of stable concentration. Some people consider walking practice to be very secondary to sitting, but I have learned from experience that walking meditation should be given just as much respect as sitting meditation. Whether we walk fast or slow is really not so important, but that while walking, we investigate all the little sensations that go into walking. This is a great time to check out intentions and their relationship to actions, as walking involves a complex and interesting interplay between these. If you are having problems staying grounded when walking, I recommend staying primarily with the physical sensations in the feet and legs, particularly the sensations of contact between the feet and the ground or floor. Objects for Insight Practices As mentioned before, there are lots of insight traditions, and they have their favorite objects. Whereas, from one point of view of pure insight, the object of meditation doesn't matter. As with postures, there are some other practical considerations related to our particular abilities and the current phase of our practice that are worth taking into account. It should be noted here that no objects are inherently objects for insight practice versus concentration practice. The difference is whether or not we investigate the three characteristics of those objects or ignore the fact that the object is made up of individual sensations and thus artificially solidify it. Thus, you could use any of the objects mentioned below, as well as many others, for either type of practice. The first question is whether or not one has a particular agenda for what kind of sensations or focus one wishes to include in the practice. For example, whether one wants to do choiceless awareness practice or a more structured practice. Choiceless awareness practice, in which one investigates whatever arises without a more specific focus, has the advantage of being very inclusive and natural. And yet, by the same token, some people can easily get distracted and ungrounded when they don't take a more structured approach. For those taking a more structured approach, the axis one can move on are the degree to which one includes physical or mental sensations in meditation. Whether or not one focuses narrowly, or uses a more open field of attention, and whether or not one moves the attention around or keeps it in or about the same place. The primary advantage of trying to focus primarily on physical sensations such as the breath, the sensations of walking, the points of contact with the floor, or the sensations of our physical body in general, is that they are much less seductive than mental sensations. Mental sensations tend to trap us in the content and stories, as anyone who has ever tried to meditate knows all too well. The more mental sensations we include in our practice, 
the more of our emotional and psychological stuff we will encounter. This can be a mixed blessing. If our practice is very strong, we can enter such territory and yet still see the true nature of all of the sensations that make it up. If our practice is not very strong, we will simply be swamped, lost in the habitual patterns of thinking associated with our stuff. Thus, physical sensations help us ground ourselves, and mental sensations open us up to plunging into the depths of mental life or getting lost in it. From a pure insight point of view, neither one is more holy or more of the source of truth. However, when we do the experiment, we will quickly realize what works for us. Works in this case meaning that we can keep seeing the true nature of the numerous quick sensations that make up our reality. There are numerous other types of physical objects that may be investigated, including sounds, sights, and even smells and tastes. Some people have a natural proclivity for investigating the sensations of a particular sense door. There is a monk in Burma that recommends his students use the high-pitched tones in our ears as an object, and sometimes I have found them very useful and interesting. Rather than seeming to be a continuous tone, we can hear each little individual sensation of ringing as a discontinuous entity. We may also take sights as object, such as the colors on the back of our eyelids, or, if our eyes are open, whatever visual sensations present themselves. These are also impermanent, and if we are good at this, we may even see our visual world presenting itself like the frames of a movie. Another consideration is whether to use a narrow or broad focus of attention. The advantage of a more narrow focus of attention is that it may exclude many distractions. We may get very good at seeing certain selected types of objects, such as the sensations of breathing in the abdomen or at the tip of the nose, and this is just fine, and even a very good idea. Such one-pointed practice is routinely recommended, and some people, such as myself, have a natural inclination toward this style. Others find that this makes them too tight and irritable. However, they find that they do much better with a wider and more inclusive field of attention. These things vary with the person and the situation, and if we are honest with ourselves, we will be able to know what is working for us and what is not. The advantage of a wide field of attention is that we need to put less effort into staying focused and can be more present to whatever arises naturally. The downside is that we may become very lazy meditators and get lost in thought. These trade-offs must be weighed against each other. There are practices such as body sweeping that keep the attention moving all the time. This can be very helpful as it keeps us engaged with new and interesting sensations and may keep us from getting into ruts of thinking that we are staying in new sensations when we are really just remembering old patterns. However, these practices have the downside that they can sometimes lack the real precision of honest attention that comes from staying with more restricted areas of focus. We can end up giving more attention to keeping our attention moving than to clearly investigating what our attention reveals. Again, some people do well with moving attention practices, and some seem to thrive on keeping the attention in one place. It should be noted that we may not always know exactly what is best for us. We may pick practices that feel good to us precisely because they don't hit too closely, don't allow us to clearly investigate the disconcerting truths of impermanence and suffering, don't hit at our sense of identity in any way that really cuts to the bone. We might also pick traditions that are grueling and very painful for us because we imagine that this is what is important, even if such traditions do not facilitate clear investigations of the truth of our actual experience. Thus, working with good teachers who can advise us and help keep us from resting in our delusions is recommended. That said, some teachers only teach one practice, usually the particular one that worked for them. If that is also a technique that genuinely works for us, then we are set. If not, we may wish to investigate other traditions and techniques. On a related note, I have advocated figuring out what works for you considering how you are built and where you are. I do, however, recommend moderation in this. For instance, if you sit down to meditate and then decide you are just a bit sleepy, so you stand up, and then you settle down a bit. So a few minutes later you sit down again. Then a minute later you decide you really don't like that little pain in your knee, 
and so you lie down, and so it goes. Such practice is likely to be of little benefit to you, so try to pick a posture and stick with it, within reason. The same applies to objects of meditation, particularly when you are starting out. There is a lot to be said for cultivating this basic level of self-control and discipline. Without it, we can end up shifting our practice habits every time our investigation begins to hit close to home. Resolve. That brings me to the topic of resolve. I strongly recommend developing the freedom to choose what happens in your life that comes from discipline. While people often think of discipline as being contrary to freedom, I equate the two in many ways. Discipline and resolve allow one to make choices about what we do and stay strong in the face of difficulties. Thus, I recommend that when you set aside a period of time for a particular training, you resolve that for that period you will work on the specific training you have set out to work on, and that you will work on it wholeheartedly. Without discipline, without formal resolve, you may easily find yourself in something resembling the following situation. You sit down on the cushion with the vague intention of doing some insight practices, and begin trying to investigate, but soon you find yourself thinking about how you really should be paying your bills. Then your knee begins to hurt, so you tune into the low-level jahannic bliss that you have managed to cultivate the ability to find, and then you feel hungry, so you get up and fix yourself a sandwich. You then think to yourself, Hey, what am I doing here eating this sandwich? Wasn't I doing insight practice? You are not free. Instead, you are floundering, without discipline, without resolve. You are unlikely to be able to get past some of the difficult hurdles that stand between you and success in any of these trainings. I have found it extremely valuable, particularly when sitting down to do formal meditation, to state to myself at the beginning of the session exactly what I am doing, what I hope to attain by it, and why attaining that is a good idea. I do this formally and clearly, either out loud or silently to myself. Having done practice with and without them, I have come to the definite conclusion that formal resolutions can make a huge difference in my practice. One of my favorite resolutions goes something like, I resolve that for this hour I will consistently investigate the sensations that make up reality, so as to attain to liberating insights for the benefit of myself and all beings. Resolutions such as this one add a great deal of focus and consciousness to my practice. They galvanize my energy, make plain my intentions, and also seem to work at some more subliminal or subconscious level to keep me on track. I have also found that I can use resolutions in my daily life to good effect. For instance, when studying for a medical school exam, I might resolve, for this hour I will study this hematology syllabus so that I will increase my knowledge and skill as an aspiring doctor and thus be less likely to kill patients and more likely to help them. Such resolutions might seem overly formal or perhaps even goofy, and they sometimes seem this way to me but I have come to appreciate them anyway. If I make resolutions that do not ring true, I can feel it when I say them, and this helps me understand my own path and heart. If I am lost and wondering why I am doing what I am doing, these sorts of resolutions help me to consciously reconnect with what is important in life. I suggest that you try making these sorts of resolutions in your own life, at least so that you can see if they are useful to you. I am a big fan of formal resolutions, but you should see for yourself. Teachers There are many types of teachers out there from many traditions. Some are very ordinary, and some seem to radiate spirituality from every pore. Some are nice, some are indifferent, and some may seem like sergeants in boot camp. Some stress reliance on one's own efforts, others stress reliance on the grace of the guru. Some are very available and accessible and some may live very far away, grant few interviews, or have so many students vying for their time that you may rarely get a chance to talk with them. Some seem to embody the highest ideals of the perfected spiritual life in their every waking moment, while others may have many noticeable quirks, faults, and failings. Some live by rigid moral codes, while others may push the boundaries of social conventions and mores. Some may be very old, and some may be very young, some may require strict commitments and obedience, while others may hardly seem to care what we do at all. 
Some may advocate very specific practices, stating that their way is the only way or the best way, while others may draw from many traditions or be open to your doing so. Some may point out our successes, while others may dwell on our failures. Some may stress renunciation or even ordination to a monastic order, while others seem relentlessly engaged with the world. Some charge a bundle for their teachings, while others give theirs freely. Some like scholarship and the lingo of meditation, while others may never use or even openly despise these formal terms and conceptual frameworks. Some teachers may be more like friends or equals that just want to help us learn something they happen to be good at, while others may be all into the hierarchy, status, and role of being a teacher. Some teachers will speak openly about attainments, and some may not. Some teachers are remarkably predictable in their manner and teaching style, while others swing wide in strange and unpredictable ways. Some may seem very tranquil and mild-mannered, while others may seem outrageous or rambunctious. Some may seem extremely humble and unimposing, while others may seem particularly arrogant and presumptuous. Some are charismatic, while others may be distinctly lacking in social skills. Some may readily give us extensive advice, and some just listen and nod. Some seem the living embodiment of love, and others may piss us off on a regular basis. Some teachers may instantly click with us, while others just leave us cold. Some teachers may be willing to teach us, and some may not. So far as I can tell, none of these are related in any way to their meditation ability or the depths of their understanding. That is, don't judge a meditation teacher by their cover. What is important is that their style and personality inspire us to practice well, to live the life we want to live, to find what it is we wish to find, to understand that we wish to understand. Some of us may wander for a long time before we find a good fit. Some of us will turn to books for guidance, reading, and practicing without the advantage or hassles of teachers. Some of us may even seem to click with a practice or teacher, try to follow it for years, and yet get nowhere. Others seem to fly regardless. One of the most interesting things about reality is that we get to test it out. One way or another, we will get to see what works for us and what doesn't. What happens when we do certain practices or follow the advice of certain teachers, as well as what happens when we don't? Another thing about teachers is that they only know what they know. If we use the scopes of the three trainings to examine this, we may find that some teachers may have a good grasp on some of these scopes and not have a good grasp of the others. In fact, mastery in any area guarantees nothing about mastery of the others. It is worth being realistic about this fact, and so I will go on and on about this later. Also, when we interact with teachers, we may wish to also consider which of their bodies of knowledge we wish to draw on, such as which of the three trainings we want help with. In fact, I think it is very important to be clear about this explicitly, so that when we go in to talk with a teacher, we can ask questions from the correct conceptual framework and also fit their advice back into the correct framework. If we ask a teacher about how to attain some high state and they mention turning into boundless joy and we then try to do this when driving to work and crash into the rear end of a car of some poor commuter, we have not followed their advice properly. Similarly, we may wish to explicitly ask our teachers if they are skilled in the aspect of the specific training we are interested in mastering, and also to what level. While you cannot always trust them to tell the truth, either through their own self-deception or the desire to fool you, if they do say something like, No, I don't know enough to speak on that level, as my own abilities are not that strong yet, then at least you know to seek advice elsewhere. I have much more respect for a teacher who once told me that he didn't feel qualified to teach me than for the numerous teachers who were not qualified to teach me who either didn't realize this or tried to pretend otherwise. Also, I would recommend making specific goals for your life and practice. For instance, you may wish to get a job as a dishwasher so that you can continue to feed yourself. You go to the meditation teacher and say, I want to get a job as a dishwasher. Do you know how to do this? They may say yes, to which you could reply, How do you know this? They could just as easily have said, I have no idea, as I am a meditation teacher, not a career counselor or restaurant manager. 
the same basic conversational pattern could be repeated just as easily for the other two trainings. For instance, you could ask a meditation teacher, I wish to learn how to get into the early concentration states. Do you know how to do this? You could also ask, I wish to attain the first stage of enlightenment. Do you know how to do this? If they say yes, the next question would be, what are the specific steps that will likely produce that result? This sort of straightforward approach to spirituality is extremely pragmatic and empowering. Further, it makes interactions with teachers more fruitful. This brings me to another point. Teachers can generally tell if you are serious and if you have clearly thought through what you want. For instance, it takes about two seconds of someone asking a meditation teacher for advice on their emotional stuff for the teacher to realize that this person is interested in working on conventional happiness and is not interested in learning insight practices. Similarly, it takes a few conversations with a student to figure out if they are following your advice or not, so don't try to fool them. If you don't like their advice, better to tell them that and also why so that they can address this, either by modifying their advice or by further explaining why they feel their advice might be helpful. Further, if you follow some of their advice but change parts or select parts and add other things, and then find that this way of working has not produced the desired results, be careful about criticizing the teacher or the method, as you have not done the experiment they recommended. For instance, if someone told you to stabilize your attention on the individual sensations that make up the experience of breathing so clearly that you could see the beginning and ending of every single sensation consistently for an hour, and instead you do something else, or stop the practice before you can do this, don't blame them if you do not get the results they promised. Barring insurmountable external circumstances, the choice not to do the work was clearly yours, and thus you should accept personal responsibility for your own failure. I'm not trying to be harsh, but simply realistic. I'm obviously a firm believer that people should take responsibility for what happens in their lives and practices. Not doing so is tantamount to disempowering yourself. While all of this advice on practices and teachers may seem a bit overwhelming, reconnecting with the basics, the simple truths of the spiritual life, is highly recommended. To that end, the more we practice being kind and compassionate, the more we connect with the fundamental nature of our hearts, and the better our conventional lives will be. The more we practice being clear and equanimous, the more we connect with the nature of our mind and the healthy our minds will be. The more we practice understanding the three characteristics of all the little sensations that make up our reality, the more we penetrate into the fundamental nature of reality, and the closer we are to awakening and to freedom from fundamental suffering. Conclusion to Part 1 People have noticed a decrease in the importance of poetry to our society. It has been said that our desire for more information, faster images and quick sound bites is increasing. We are searching faster and faster, perhaps at the expense of looking more deeply. Rather than sitting with a Shakespeare sonnet for a few minutes, just pondering the beauty and meaning of it, we might read ten of them quickly and then feel a bit befuddled. Similarly, one might read through a dense little work like this one without stopping to ponder each paragraph along the way, and thus perhaps get little out of it. Just so, we may be constantly trying to find the next teacher, book, spiritual scene, technique, incense, mantra, costume, or doctrine that will get us the big E. Quick results are actually possible, though there are no promises about the speed of progress that can be given. Real progress will only come when we settle into the basics, into this moment, and go deep. These lists are good sources of the basic teachings that are sufficient to do the trick. Go deeply into them, or find them in another form, perhaps in another tradition, and go deeply into them. Slow down. Settle into these simple truths. Reflect, and then practice with diligence. Good teachers can help. They are nearly a necessity, and so are highly recommended. But you must do the work yourself. You must understand, and then you will have to do this again and again. Get used to it, as it can be quite an adventure. It is sometimes hard for people to believe that right there in their experience is what they are looking for. It is right here, right now, 
in your own experience, in your own heart, mind, and body. It is these sensations right now that are just soaked with the truth. Forgive me, but one more time upon my soapbox. There is so much completely useless and harmful sectarianism in the spiritual world, within Buddhism and between Buddhism and the other spiritual traditions. People can get so into their particular trip and get all down on the other perfectly good spiritual trips. This is faith out of balance, causing rigid adherence to dogma, isn't it? This lack of understanding of what the basics are and what are just the inevitable cultural trappings and individual emphasis of each tradition. These are the basics. Whenever you find a tradition with the components of even one of these lists, regardless of what they are called or how they are formulated, you find a tradition with the potential to awaken. Sure, there's a lot of junk spirituality out there, but there is also a lot of really good stuff. Again, each tradition has its strengths and weaknesses, and some may have cultural trappings and ornamentation that you like or don't like, but don't make a big deal about this. Instead, keep the basics in the front of your mind. Each valid tradition can help us gain further insight into the truth, and perhaps we will resonate with one teaching or tradition at one time or another, sometime later. Alternately, we can pick one tradition, not be sectarian about it, and go deep into it, into the simplicity and clarity of its basics, using its extrapolations, elaborations, and interpretations to go back more deeply into the simple truths. We can engage with the ordinary world, with the truth of this moment, and this will empower us and may awaken us. May this writing be a benefit to you and all beings, and may you and all beings realize the simple truth of the things in this lifetime. Section 7. Part 2. Light and Shadows. Introduction to Parts 2 and 3. Some chapters in Parts 2 and 3 have a distinctly cutting tone. This is intentional, though no harm is meant by it. There are a lot of shadow sides to Buddhism and mystical traditions in general, some of which will be discussed here. Perhaps a more cutting tone will help to illuminate points that tend to be unmentioned or poorly addressed. Perhaps it will also serve to spark skillful debate and inquiry, rather than causing needless contraction into fear and dogma. However, I should warn you now, some of the next three chapters have quite a bite to them. There is no information in those chapters that is essential to any of the basic practices. If you are not in the mood for some really heavy and scathing social commentary on Western Buddhism, please skip to the chapter called A Clear Goal Now. The practical reason for including Part 2 at all is that what often happens between trying to apply the basics of technical meditation discussed in Part 1 and the successful entry into real meditation territory discussed in Part 3 is that we run into the mainstream culture of Western Buddhism and the communities that develop around it. We need support, friends, who are into what we are into, good teachers and places to practice. We wish to be in the company of fellow adventurers rather than lone wanderers in strange lands. Unfortunately, much of what we find is not particularly conducive to adventure and deep exploration at all. Thus, as one small dissenting voice against the tide, I have included Part 2 to help those who want to go much deeper than most of those around them and avoid the numerous cultural sidetracks and disempowering voices that will keep them from their goals. It is as much a laundry list of my pet peeves as it is anything else, but I am happy to own my neuroses and make them overt. While I may be fooling myself, I think this section, while a bit harsh and probably disrespectful, is likely to be helpful to someone who also wishes to go against the grain and become an actual meditation master. The real dangers that come from using a cutting tone are that it will alienate both readers for whom such a tone is simply not helpful and those who could really benefit from such a tone but do not want to admit this. Worse, it may cause others to agree too strongly, thinking, oh yes, even though that Daniel fellow sometimes writes like a raving lunatic, he and I are really on the same side. We know what's going on. 
Those over there are the ones who really need to hear this. We all need to hear the points made in this book, myself included, though not necessarily in the style presented here. The ideals and standards presented in this book are very high so that they can be applied universally. Further, the numerous traps and pitfalls presented in this book are also so common that all of us need to be wary, reflecting regularly and honestly on how we have fallen into them once more. There are quite a number of very readable, helpful, and friendly Dharma books out there, such as Jack Cornfield's encyclopedic masterwork, A Path with Heart, many of which are loaded with brilliant statements that should basically shock and confound the reader, hitting at the very core of their sense of identity with the deadly accuracy of a master of Zen archery. However, as they have been written in a style that is so completely accessible, these statements have nearly the opposite effect, creating a mushy comfort in the reader with statements that should have stopped them in their proverbial tracks and provoked deep inquiry. I have grown tired of people routinely quoting profound Dharma statements from such works as if this represents their understanding when they have no idea what they mean. They seem to derive some false comfort from being able to parrot the masters. While I can understand the appeal of behaving in such ways, as I have done so myself on numerous occasions, I will do my best to keep the second two parts of this book from contributing to this phenomena. Thus I have intentionally written some sections of parts two and three in a style that is designed to sound combative and abrasive. Also, I must admit that it was fun to write that way. It should be noted that if you go through part one, which I tried to make very accessible, without being stunned at the staggering profundity of the statements made on nearly every page, then you either have no need to read this book, or you fell into the trap I just mentioned above. I think that most spiritual practitioners could and should become very much more comfortable admitting what they don't know and seeking clarification. The times when I myself have failed to do so have been much to my detriment. In these next two parts I will often mention very specific high states and attainments for the purpose of attempting in some small way to refocus Buddhism on those things that go far beyond philosophy, psychology, and dogmatic religion. It is full enlightenment that finally makes the difference, and was, according to the Buddha himself, the whole reason for all of this. Unfortunately, even fairly rational adults can suddenly lose the ability to stay in touch with ordinary reality when such language is used, and I will do my best to try to counteract this and bring things back down to earth whenever possible. It has become almost taboo to mention actual attainment or mastery of this stuff, among many meditation communities. And this is grossly unfortunate, which is to say, it is completely ridiculous and frighteningly ironic. Some reasons for this will be touched on occasionally, as well as some of what might be able to be done about this. However, if we are to have a clear standard for whether or not these techniques and teachings are working for us, it is vital that we have a thorough knowledge of what is possible and even expected of those who really practice well. That is the primary reason for Part 3. Remember, you are reading a book called Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. It has been written on the assumption that its readers actually want to do this. That said, there will probably be readers who will think that most of what is written in Part 3, which details the stages of enlightenment, the high concentration attainments, and even more unusual territory, is pure fantasy, myth, dogma, and nonsense. I have little to say to these readers except that this book is obviously not written for them. I hope that you will realize the difficulties inherent in language, concepts, doctrines, and maps of spiritual terrain. They are particularly clumsy tools even when used to their fullest potential, and this is unlikely to have happened here. Despite the fact that I will often use a tone implying certainty, it should be said that nothing whatsoever I have written here is absolutely true. Language at its best is a useful tool, though by its very nature it artificially divides, reduces, and oversimplifies. Hopefully one will concern oneself with what is pragmatic, rather than what is absolutely correct from some arbitrary point of view. 
the crucial thing is practice and direct experience for one's self once you understand yourself you will be able to laugh knowingly at my efforts buddhism versus the buddha one of my teachers once commented buddhism and the teachings of the buddha have been at odds for two thousand five hundred years these are cynical but appropriate words what the buddha taught was really extremely simple and as a practice particularly unglamorous and generally quite difficult though manageable if one has a chance to read the original texts one sees again and again that what the buddha taught was generally practical and as non-dogmatic as could be expected he basically said do these very specific things and these specific results will happen he had little use for ritual ceremony or philosophy that was not for some practical purpose now it is true that things did get a bit complex and religious in the later years of his teaching as the vijnana or code of conduct for monks was established the buddha said that the added rules and regulations were a response to the increased quantity of low quality students with whom he had to work in the later years of his life and the problems inherent in running a large organization after the buddha died however the process of turning the teachings of the buddha from a practical path for awakening into a number of realistic religions reached new extremes of dogma and division it is also true however that many worthwhile and practical variations on the fundamental teachings and techniques have been added that have provided great benefit to many of those who actually followed them rather than just talking about them in general as mystical teachings become religions all sorts of things get added on to them depending on the prevailing cultural norms the current government's attitude towards the teachings how well or poorly the teachings are understood by those teaching them and economic pressures christianity as a dogma rather than as a mystical tradition or a set of spiritual practices such as sitting in the desert for forty days facing one's demons and finding god is just one scary example of this but perhaps no scarier than the religions of buddhism just as christianity often seems to have little to do with what jesus was talking about and practically nothing to do with doing the practices he did or living the kind of life he did just so buddhism often seems to have largely forgotten about the core teachings of the buddha as buddhism enters america a whole new layer of cultural dust is being added to it most of which is regulated to the shadow sides of western psychology and those of the new age movement however there are also signs that fresh new life and health is being breathed into aspects of buddhism that had become somewhat moldy and calcified in their countries of origin the extra trappings are not necessarily all harmful in and of themselves but they may dilute the amount of practical information about how to awaken with all sorts of other information that may have little to do with awakening and may even be an impediment to it this may then lead to less than complete emphasis on the three fundamental trainings in morality concentration and wisdom which are quite a handful and a great undertaking even in their most simple forms i was extremely lucky in that i learned some great buddhist meditation technology long before i really got to know the culture of mainstream western buddhism i have much use for the former and as for the latter well read on it is true that buddhist training can take on many valid forms and this is a fine and beautiful thing as different training methods may be appropriate for different meditators at different times the added padding of tradition and religion can be a comfort and a support as most people seem to really like having some kind of dogmatic mythical or cultural foundation from which to work traditions and standardized conceptual frameworks can also provide the means by which people can talk to each other about experiences and techniques that might otherwise be very hard to explain clearly i have a friend from another mystical tradition who knows much that i find useful and interesting but it took us months to even begin to line up our terminology so that we could benefit from each other's understanding however these conceptual frameworks and trappings may also produce the huge amount of useless harmful and divisive secretarianism that exists within buddhism 
and between the various meditative or mystical traditions, as well as all sorts of effort going into things that produce no freedom and may cause other forms of suffering. Every time I leave my sheltered little academic life and enter the rough and tumble world of endlessly petty, secretarian dharma scenes, I am again astounded at how fixated people can be on the minute differences between their tradition and traditions that are so similar to theirs. They can only be differentiated by the clothes people wear and the names they call things. I can't tell you how tiring it is. Sometimes I wonder how these otherwise kind and reasonable people can stand themselves or each other when they are like that. We all want to be special, but I beg you, Find a way to be special that allows others to be special also. It is what is common to the great mystical paths that make them special. The differences are 100% guaranteed to be fundamentally irrelevant. Now that said, I am going to turn around and bust on cultural aspects of traditions that are not into awakening and mastering what the Buddha was talking about. This is Buddhism, after all and so it seems only natural that I should be into what the old boy was into. I have heard way too many conversations between members of differing mystical traditions that could be summarized. My dogma and ideals are better than your dogma and ideals. Even worse are the rare and astonishing conversations that might be summarized. My dogma and ideals are better than your actual realizations and profound insights. Frightening. There is a movement in the West, reminiscent of the original objectives of the Buddha in the early days of his teaching, to divorce Buddhism's core meditation technology and basic trainings from religion and ritual entirely. I am a great fan of this movement, so long as it does not cause people to throw out too many of the original Buddhist conceptual frameworks that are helpful as tools for mastering these practices. There is also a movement in the West to take the meditative technology of Buddhism and integrate it into everything from Catholicism to psychiatry to the freakish fringe of the New Age. I don't have a problem with this trend particularly, just as long as people realize that you could just as easily divorce these technologies from those traditions and have something that is still very useful and powerful. There is another related movement in the West and that is to make Buddhism into something for everyone. Unfortunately, what is happening is that Buddhism is becoming watered down in order to make it have broad appeal. The result is something very similar to what happens in places like Thailand, where most people practice Buddhism in a way that is largely devotional and dogmatic. In the West, this translates to people practicing Buddhism by becoming neurotic about being Buddhist, accumulating lots of pretty books and expensive props, learning just enough of some new language to be pretentious, and by sitting on a cushion engaged in free-form psychological whatnot, while doing nothing resembling meditative practices. They may aspire to no level of mastery of anything, and may never have been told what these practices were actually designed to achieve. Thus, their meditation is largely devotional meditation, something that externally looks like meditation, but achieves little. In short, it is just one more spiritual trapping, though one that may have some social benefits. Many seem to have substituted the pain of the pew for the pain of the zafu, with the results and motivations being largely the same. It is an imitation of meditation done, because meditation seems like a good and noble thing to do. However, it is a meditation that has been designed by those teachers who want everyone to be able to feel good that they are doing something spiritual. While it is good for a person to slow down and take time out for silence, I will claim that beyond these and a few cardiovascular benefits, there is often not a whole lot of any great worth that comes from this sort of practice. True, they are not out smoking crack. But why get so close to the real thing and then not do those practices that make a real difference? Many will consider my devaluation of low-grade sitting practice radical and counterproductive. Perhaps it is. But I claim that many who would have aspired to much more are being shortchanged by not being invited to really step up to the plate and play ball, to discover the profound capabilities hidden within their own minds. 
This book is designed to be just an invitation, an invitation to step far beyond the increasingly ritualized, bastardized, and gutless mock-up of Buddhism that is rearing its fluffy head in the modern West, and has a stranglehold on many a practice group, and even some of the big meditation centers. To be fair, it is true that spiritual trappings and cultural add-ons may, at their best, be skillful means, ways of making difficult teachings more accessible, and ways of getting more people to practice correctly, and in a way that will finally bring realization. A fancy hat or a good ritual can really inspire some people. That said, it is lucky that one of the fundamental defilements that drops away at first awakening is attachment to rites and rituals, such as Buddhism, ceremony, specific techniques, and religious and cultural trappings in general. Unfortunately, the cultural inertia of the religions of Buddhism is hard to entirely circumvent. It need not be, if the trappings can serve as skillful means. But I assert that many more people could be much more careful about what are fundamentally helpful teachings and what causes division, confusion, and sectarian arrogance. Those who aren't careful about this are at least demonstrating in a roundabout way that they don't know what the fundamental teachings are for themselves and have attained little wisdom. CONTENT AND ULTIMATE REALITY There is too much content-centered Buddhism and content-centered spirituality in general. It is not that content isn't important, but it is only half the picture, and the half we are already quite familiar with and typically stuck in. By content, I mean everything except determined effort to realize the full truth of the three characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and no-self. For example, to realize ultimate reality. Perhaps two illustrations will help. The first odd phenomenon I have noticed is that when students of meditation gather together to discuss Buddhism, they almost never talk about actual meditation practices in depth and detail. They almost never talk about their diligent attempts to really understand these teachings in each moment. It is almost an unacknowledged taboo that nearly any political correct topic under the sun is acceptable, as long as it doesn't have to do with trying to master meditation techniques. While there are sporadic moments of Dharma combat or heated discussion for the purpose of learning and sharing the Dharma, even these tend to be mostly on the philosophy of all of this. The second odd phenomenon I have noticed has occurred in situations when one might suspect that there would not be this problem. I have been to a fair number of retreats in the West, and these tend to have small group meetings. The Dharma teachers have invariably been giving instructions that emphasize following the motion of the breath or the sensations of the feet, developing concentration on these subjects, not being lost in thought, and giving precise attention to bare reality just as it is. They tend to use the phrase, moment to moment, often, which in my book means fast. This is all as it should be. They tend to mention things like impermanence, suffering, and no self, and tend to advocate trying to understand these qualities of all experience directly without the elaboration of thought. They mention time and time again that one should not be lost in the stories and tape loops of the mind. They may have traveled thousands of miles at great expense to help people understand these teachings that they themselves have spent many years learning. For the hundreds of dollars in retreat fees, donations, and spent vacation time, the students will perhaps get three meetings with the teacher during a ten-day retreat and perhaps get fifteen to twenty precious minutes of time to talk to a real meditation master assuming they are lucky enough to actually be sitting with one. However, when some eight to ten students finally get a chance to meet with the teacher in a small group meeting, a brief chance to really learn what this teacher has to teach, what happens? Do they talk about their wholehearted attempts at following the careful and skillful instructions of the teacher? Strangely, this only seems to happen on rare occasions. I was at one of these small group meetings where everyone was talking about their neurotic stuff. In a moment of feeling, like I might be able to actually add something useful, I said in a loud and exasperated voice, The breath! Is anyone trying to notice the breath? They just looked at me like I was out of my mind and went back to whining about their psychological crap. 
here was a room full of otherwise accomplished adults who somehow had been transformed into needy and pathetic children without any obvious ability to deal with their lives or follow very basic instructions beware of meditation cultures that consistently encourage this in people it is a mark of something gone horribly wrong stranger even than this when students actually do talk about trying to follow these careful instructions of their meditation teachers it can occasionally seem to be such a shock to the teachers such a violation of the unwritten taboos and perhaps even such a threat to the hierarchy that they sometimes hardly seem to know how to handle it in my more cynical moments i have sometimes suspected that the quickest way to get worried looks from many modern western meditation teachers is to talk about practice in a way that implies the attempt to actually master anything most of the students tend to whine about the relationships their childhood their neurotic thoughts their screwed up lives in short content i must say that i have great sympathy for these people i really do god knows we all have this sort of stuff to whine about and in the right context whining about our stuff might be a very good idea but two things are fairly clear these people have spent too little time in therapy or perhaps too much time in bad therapy and somehow have not heard one word of what the teacher had been talking about as regards insight practice now it is absolutely true that we all have our issues pains traumas scars and quirks we have to learn to deal with these somehow if we want to be happy and live the good life we all want to live we have to find ways to deal with the content to heal to grow to mature and all of that but we must also learn when to shift to seeing things on a completely different level there is a time and a place for everything imagine if you were an algebra teacher and you told your students to solve the homework in the back of chapter one instead your students turn in long rambling essays about the traumas of their childhood how would you feel unfortunately you would feel like many meditation teachers now it is true that many dharma teachers have a great time helping people deal with their stuff and some of these are even quite good at it there are others that put up with having to play this role but they would prefer to be teaching insight practices some teachers just can't stand it when they spend lots of time giving careful instructions only to have very few people follow them particularly when they know what an amazing opportunity for even deep healing increased well-being and clarity is being squandered by their students when they fail to really practice sometimes people have actually learned just a bit of the teachings on impermanence suffering and emptiness but then proceed to talk about this in highly content-centered terms they may say things like oh yes i am impermanent and will die one day this is awful and this thought causes me suffering truly i feel empty inside this is macroscopic about grand yet crude concepts and ideas and so is still squarely in the territory of philosophy and existentialism this meditator not only needs to learn what insight practice actually is but might also benefit from a bit more sunshine and exercise or perhaps even some of those new antidepressants a very small amount of such reflection can be of some limited benefit if the energy of the frustration is directed into practice there are other types of reflection that might be much more skillful but those are largely a topic for another day see jack cornfield's a path with heart or christopher tidmus light on enlightenment if meditators could actually just go microscopic and try to see the three characteristics of each and every little sensation that makes up their experience then they might begin to actually understand reality at the level that makes the difference effectively encouraging students to shift their attention from fixation on content and the macroscopic to also including the microscopic and universal is probably the hardest job of the meditation teacher i sometimes wonder how many of them have largely given up trying to do this when meditators on retreat focus on content instead of grounding the mind in the objects of meditation which just might produce the deep insights that will make the big difference that they are looking for they basically let their minds go and go they do after a day or two of silence and a nearly complete lack of distractions the spinning of their minds on neurotic content may have exhilarated like the turbine of a jet engine on full throttle 
if they were a mess before, now this has been multiplied by a factor of ten to a hundred. They then hit the small group meeting like a runaway freight train of exasperated mind noise, and all present get to be bathed in the profound lack of clarity that they have spent so much hard cushion time cultivating. Years go by, and their practice deepens, not into inside territory, but into a poxy-like faith and further fixation on content. They learn how to talk Buddhist. They learn the culture of Buddhism in just the same way that they learn the culture of transpersonal therapy, transactional analysis, or French extensionism. They become fascinated with their growing knowledge of Pali, their fancy brass bell from Nepal, or their knowledge of tantric iconography. They have taken Bodhisattva vows one hundred and eight times. They may become neurotic about right speech and self-righteous about noble silence. They may begin to adopt the gently condescending and overly deliberate speech patterns and mannerisms that quietly scream, I am so spiritual and aware. They may become fixated on complex, arbitrary, restrictive, and even disempowering models of what is proper Buddhist behavior, trying to be a good Buddhist, whatever that is. In short, they become very religious. At worst, they become gaudy and distorted caricatures of the spiritual life. Such people are generally very tiring to be around. They may even get sucked into the all-too-common trap of praying for a better rebirth and making merit, rather than actually trying to master the art of meditation and wise living here and now. In short, the trappings, dogma, and scene become everything and penetrating the illusions that bind them on the wheel of suffering is lost in the shuffle. At its worst, they can go on like this for enough time so that they develop quite a retreat resume, but little or no insight, and then get caught by this. They have been to India, sat with this teacher and that teacher, had tantric initiations, or been sitting for twenty years. They begin to become fascinated by all of this, and somehow they begin to feel wise, despite the fact that they may have no insight whatsoever into the universal truth of things, because they never actually learned insight practice. They use the word emptiness in casual conversation when they don't have clue one what it means, but they feel they do, as they have spent so much time hearing it, meditating on it, and being spiritual. They talk about letting go and mindfulness as if they are the experts. They may even begin to teach, and to do so they find themselves having to subtly and overtly rationalize that they completely understand what they are teaching. After all, they want to encourage faith in their beautiful tradition, and so try to appear clear and unconfused. They get stuck here, stuck in the muck of their rationalizations, the misapplied lingo, the sugar-coated dogma the role of the teacher, and the cultural trappings that they have become experts in. From this point it can become nearly impossible for them to actually learn anything, as they are now trapped in the very teachings that were originally designed to free them from just such a situation. What went wrong? How did this happen? How did they substitute knowledge of culture, content, and dogma for fundamental insight? A large number of such people are quite intelligent. Many have successful careers or graduate degrees. Most of the big-name teachers they sat with probably had some insight, and may have been highly enlightened. So what happened? I can only speculate, but perhaps something good will come of such speculation. It could be that they just are into spiritual scenes, trappings, and the like. That is what they went looking for, and they found it, in dizzying abundance. It could be that they had no idea what they were getting into or what they wanted, and so they ended up becoming fascinated with these things simply out of cultural inertia, as many around them will likely have done so. An old friend and former meditation teacher of mine and I were ranting in our typically passionate style about this very topic one day, and we came up with the mushroom theory. Mushrooms are fed manure and kept in the dark and we speculated that part of the problem was that some meditation teachers were using the mushroom method of teaching, thus raising a crop of mushroom meditators, all soft and pale. This is actually a bit of an extreme way to describe the situation, and is not meant to imply that the teachers were being malicious. However, there is this cultural factor in Western Buddhism 
that real insight insight into the fundamental nature of reality or the three characteristics is almost never talked about directly unlike in burma or some other settings my friend and i call this cultural factor the mushroom factor thus most teachers won't say something as blatant as well when i was meditating i spent some period of time lost in the stories and tape loops of my mind this was terrible and i got nowhere but nutty however one day a senior teacher straightened me out and somehow convinced me to ground my mind in the specific sensations that make up the objects of meditation and examine impermanence after some days of consistent and diligent practice using good technique i began to directly penetrate the three illusions of permanence satisfactoriness and self and my world began to be broken down into the mind moments and vibrations that i always thought were just talk by paying careful attention to bare phenomena arising and passing quick moment after quick moment i finally progressively moved through the stages of insight and got my first taste of enlightenment thus if you spin in content and don't penetrate the three illusions you are wasting your time and mine this is just the way it is if you develop strong concentration on the primary object and investigate the three characteristics consistently this will almost certainly produce insight this is just the way it is any questions most meditation teachers won't say this and there are some reasons why first they may not wish to alienate their student base one reason for this may come from the teacher hoping that if students are led into this gently and with great tolerance for their gross misinterpretations of the practice and teachings then they may be able to persevere another possible reason may have to do with the fact that making a living as a dharma teacher can be tough and more students means more donations in short the reality of what practice really is and entails doesn't tend to sell well despite the potential for extraordinary benefits as students tend to like their delusions and fascinations more than they realize teachers may also want to hold back the details of what real insight is like so that they can more accurately evaluate students practice without having to worry about students rationalizing that they are experiencing whatever it is the teacher is talking about disclosure of the details of what insight is actually like can result in students giving spurious reports in interviews either out of their own confusion or a genuine desire to fool the teacher and make themselves look good these situations definitely happen but probably not nearly as often as people completely missing the boat on what is inside practice and what is just wallowing in the muck of their mind and perhaps becoming even more neurotic about it thus my friend and i decided that we would talk about insight our practice and this sort of thing when we taught it turns out that doing this is harder than it would seem some hints about why we generally fail to completely live up to our own ideals will be given later in the chapter called more on the mushroom factor however we both have done our best to fight the trend and talk about the stages of insight and what is possible on the spiritual path another possible reason why people don't learn to actually practice correctly is that many people are not on retreat or in the meditation class to learn what the teachers have to teach this may be for a variety of reasons perhaps they are just there to find something else such as time away from some situation but are not there to find what the teachers are teaching some students may have so much invested in their level of education and high position that they just can't hear what the teachers are talking about or they hear it and think oh yes i myself have read many books and fully understand that trivial point about impermanence but when do we get enlightenment yikes some students may be there to further their psychotherapy which can be a fine and worthy goal however they may assume that the meditation teacher is probably the best psychotherapist they could have they think after all they are enlightened aren't they they must be completely sane and balanced they must know how to have the perfect relationship how to find the perfect job how to invest in the stock market how to talk to their mother how to end world hunger how to rebuild a carburetor and all other such details of wise living on this earth after all is an enlightenment about understanding everything gadzooks a quick digression here enlightenment is about understanding the fundamental nature of all things 
and what they happen to be is ultimately completely and utterly irrelevant to enlightenment. Thus, very enlightened beings understand something fundamental about whatever arises or however their lives manifest. For example, its impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and emptiness, as well as all of the stuff about the true self, which is the same thing and will be discussed later. However, they have no more knowledge about the specifics of the world, such as content or subject matter, than they have acquired in just the way that anyone else acquires knowledge about the specifics of this world. They can even have all sorts of psychological baggage to deal with, and this is probably the norm. Enlightened beings will know a lot about the territory of insight, having had to navigate it to get enlightened, but this is a strangely specialized skill and a fairly esoteric body of knowledge that is only really useful in helping others navigate it. True, being enlightened does provide by degrees deeper levels of extreme clarity into the workings of the mind, and this can be helpful. By understanding their own mind, they will have some level of insight into the basics of the minds of others. However, unless the meditation teacher is a trained psychotherapist, they are not a psychotherapist and probably shouldn't pretend to be one, though this unfortunately happens far too often, in my humble opinion. Just so, a trained psychotherapist is not enlightened, unless they get enlightened, and shouldn't pretend to understand insight practice if they don't. This also happens far too often, if you ask me, and the dark irony is that they tend to charge much more than real, qualified Dharma teachers. Note, the Buddha was quite adamant about no one charging for the teachings which are considered priceless. This system of non-obligatory donation and mutual support has worked quite well for 2,500 years, and it would be a tragic mistake to assume that it cannot function in the West. Using retreats or meditation purely as a form of continuing psychotherapy may have other problems associated with it. One may not be in the guidance of a trained therapist and may not be used to the mind-noise amplification factor that silence and a lack of distractions tend to create in the absence of grounding the mind in a meditation object. Further, one may not gain the benefits of the only thing that does make a permanent difference in ending fundamental suffering and bringing the quiet joy of understanding, mastering insight practice and getting enlightened. Another quick digression here. There is this odd idea that somehow lack of effort is a good thing, or that it is bad to want to get enlightened. This is completely absurd and has paralyzed the practice of far too many. I believe this has come from an extremely confused misunderstanding of Zen or the Bodhisattva vow. No one ever got enlightened without effort. This never happened and never will. Anyone who has really gotten into Zen or Mahayana teachings will know firsthand that they both require a tremendous amount of effort, just like every other spiritual path. As one of my teachers put it, in the end, you must give up even the desire for enlightenment, but not too soon. Sutta 131, in the middle length Discourses of the Buddha, is called One Fortunate Attachment and in it the Buddha clearly states that making effort to realize the truth of your experience is an extremely good idea. He also goes on and on about the three characteristics. Funny that. Another reason that students often fail to make progress is that they confuse content and insight. I suspect they are confused because they have spent their whole lives thinking about content, learning about content, and dealing with content in a context where content matters. For example, when one is not doing insight practice. You can't take a spelling test in first grade and say that all that is important is that words come and go, don't satisfy, and aren't you. This just won't fly, and it wouldn't be appropriate. Just so, when practicing morality, the first and most fundamental training in spirituality, content is everything, or at least as far as training in morality can take you. You can't be a mass murderer and rationalize this by thinking, well, they were all impermanent, unsatisfactory, and empty, so why not kill them? This just won't fly either, and so content and spirituality get quite connected. This is good to a point. See the chapter called Right Thought and the Aegean Stables. 
Fixation on content even works well when practicing the second training, training in concentration. When meditation students are learning to concentrate, they are told to concentrate on specific things, like breath, a green tara, a tantric deity, or some other such thing. This is content. There is no such thing as the breath or a green tara from the point of view of insight practices, as these are just fresh streams of impermanent and absolutely transitory sensations that are crudely labeled breath or green tara. But for the purpose of developing the second training, concentration, this is ignored and these impermanent sensations are crudely labeled breath or green tara. Thus, even for pure concentration practice, what you are concentrating on, such as content, matters. Thus the idea that content is everything is reinforced. However, when it comes to insight practice, content will get you nowhere fast. In insight practice, everything the student has learned about being lost in the names of things and thoughts about them, such as content, will be completely useless and an impediment. Here the inquiry must turn to impermanence, suffering, and no self. These characteristics must be understood clearly and directly in whatever sensations arise, be they beautiful, ugly, helpful, not helpful, skillful, not skillful, holy, profane, dull, or otherwise. Anything other than this is just not insight practice, never was and never will be. It doesn't matter what the quality of your mind is or what the sensations of your body are. If you directly understand the momentary sensations that make up these to be impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self, then you are on the right path, the path of liberating insight. However, as mentioned before, off the cushion the quality of your mind, your reactions, your words and deeds all matter. These are not in conflict. Insight practice is about ultimate reality, the ultimate nature of reality, and thus the specifics don't matter. Morality and concentration are about relative reality, and thus the specifics are everything. Learning to be a master of both the ultimate and the relative is what it's all about. Another reason that people don't make progress is that they may be being taught by people who have no or little insight, and so are taught by those who are themselves fascinated by content and unskilled in going beyond this into insight practices. The scary truth is that there are far more people teaching insight meditation that don't know what insight is than those that do, though this tends to be less true in big established retreat centers. Thus, even if the students learn what they are taught, if those who do not know are teaching them, then what they learn is unlikely to be correct or helpful. While the teacher may have learned to parrot the language of ultimate reality, this is absolutely no substitute for direct knowledge of it. In the tradition I come from, they consider the second stage of enlightenment, the second path, see part three, to generally be the minimum level of understanding for a teacher. This is a very reasonable standard. Another possible reason that people get lost and don't follow the clear and basic instructions of insight practices is that they just can't believe that doing something as completely simple as looking into the impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and emptiness of the mundane sensations that make up their ordinary world could produce awakening. It just sounds ridiculous to them, and thus they imagine that they are secret teachings somewhere that are the real way to enlightenment. Thus they may not try at all, may practice in their own way, or may keep trying to read more into the teachings than is there, and come up with their own special nonsense. These unhelpful ways of speculating can become very engaging, but they won't produce insight. These speculations can also lead to people trying to do very advanced practices that were originally designed for meditators that had already mastered concentration and insight practices to a pronounced degree, such as intensive tantric retreats and thus not deriving the full benefit from them or running into other problems. How do I know that solely content-based practice won't produce insight? Because there are only three doors to ultimate reality, that's why, and they are utterly unrelated to content, although they can be found in all content if the content aspect is ignored. Actually, there is a sort of fourth door that is accessible to very specialized beings 
See the appendix. Only three doors? But there are thousands of practices, many traditions. How can you say there are only three doors? There are only three doors, that's how. I don't care what tradition you subscribe to, what practice you do, or who you are. There are only three basic ways to enter into the attainment of ultimate reality, emptiness, nirvana, or whatever you want to call it. These doors relate directly to profound and direct understandings of the three characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and no self, and you have to understand the heck out of these to enter into the ranks of the noble ones. But there are many valid traditions that do not talk about the three characteristics. It may appear so, but if the tradition is a valid tradition, you will find these teachings in there somehow, in some other language or formulation, as these are the only way. You will find them in the works of Rumi, Kabir, and Krishnamurti. You will find them in the Bible and Koran. You will find them in the writings of St. John of the Cross and many other Christian mystics. You will find them in all the branches of Buddhism. You will find them in the Upanishads. You will find them in the writings of Carlos Castaneda. You will find them wherever you find a true spiritual path, and that is just all there is to it. It can help to consider that to completely understand compassion is to understand suffering and vice versa, as these are really two sides of the same coin. Also, to understand true self-practices is the same as understanding no self-practices, as these are also two sides of the same coin. But we are tantric practitioners, and the three characteristics are merely a lowbrow inyana teaching. Tantra primarily cultivates the emptiness door, that of no self, which is one of the three characteristics. It can also be useful for transmuting energy into more skillful forms, a bit of which will be discussed later. However, those who consider themselves to be Mahayanists or Vajrayanists should read the fine print. You will find that all three characteristics are there, and in fact that you are highly encouraged to master the Hinayana practices before moving on to the Mahayana or Vajrayana practices anyway. I strongly suggest checking out Lama Yishi's Introduction to Tantra. Further, the Hinayana is often confused with the Theravada, and while there are similarities, the Theravada is much more extensive than the Tibetan division of the Hayana and contains extensive teachings on compassion and emptiness, as well as helping others, but this topic is for another time. In short, should you enter ultimate reality or emptiness, it will be through one of the three doors. This is just the way it is. It is not negotiable. The nature of the mind and reality are just the nature of the mind and reality. You cannot change this, but you can understand it. But we are Zen students. We realize Buddha nature. We don't need the three characteristics as we sit Zazen. Read any good book on Zen, such as those by Dogen, Chi Nul, or the excellent Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, by Shun Ryu Suzuki. The three characteristics are in there in abundance, and those who think they can enter ultimate reality in some other way are fooling themselves. Paying direct attention to bare reality with clarity and precision will result in directly observing the three characteristics, regardless of whether or not you wish to call them that, as they are absolutely the truth of all conditioned things in all times and in all beings. Thus, the practice, tradition, and all of that, such as content, are irrelevant in the end. However, you need them right up until the last moment, so don't think that I'm advocating not following a tradition. I'm just advocating actually following the tradition correctly, and thus clearly penetrating into the nature of your actual experience just as it is. Nothing helps in the end but understanding the fundamental nature of reality, such as the three characteristics. It may often be true that people simply are not in a position where insight practices are appropriate for them. Insight practices are not for everyone. One of the clear marks of whether or not they are appropriate for someone is their ability to even do them in the first place. If despite clear instructions and appropriate support, a would-be insight meditator is simply unable to do anything but spin in content and fixation, they should try something else. 
until such time as they can hear understand and then follow the extremely basic but specific instructions of insight practices the last and perhaps most pernicious of the reasons that students don't really apply themselves is that they don't actually believe it can be done that they could actually get enlightened or that anyone else except a rare few get enlightened further if they do know of a potentially enlightened person such as a lineage teacher that person typically becomes thought of as being other an aberration one of those over there one of the chosen ones and somehow surreal like an imagined demigod this has been a terrible problem since the very beginning of all mystical traditions and is unfortunately unlikely to go away any time soon part of this is due to the mushroom factor but there are many other complex reasons for it suffice to say it can be done and is done today by students using these simple practices find someone enlightened who is willing to talk more about this if you want specific examples and see the chapter called more on the mushroom factor section eight a clear goal many of the possible reasons for why people get so into buddhism in every way except clear well-defined focused and precise practice are directly related to a lack of a clear goal if you have no clear idea of what you want or why you are doing something then the results are likely to be just as murky vague and fragmented why are you doing all of this this is a very important question people may wish to go on a retreat and have the whole thing be relaxing and blissful this can actually be obtained temporarily if they then gain some mastery of concentration practices though their clarity will almost certainly shatter the instant they leave the retreat as concentration practices produce no long-term stability on their own however they may think that they wish to get enlightened by doing insight practices insight practices involve hard work and clear non-anesthetized examination of suffering among other things thus these two goals of maintaining bliss and developing insight simultaneously are in direct conflict and the student's practice will surely be conflicted this is just one of many possible examples having a clear goal is absolutely fundamental to the practice in more ways than may be initially obvious in fact if you understood your actual reality right now clearly enough to get to the root of why you were doing all of this and where all this motion of mind comes from you would be highly realized you would penetrate to the heart of compassion and suffering of ignorance and emptiness and finally be free i do not write this lightly it is completely vital that your motivation be as clearly understood as possible as it actually is and that all of its energy be channeled into realizing your goals wishy-washy practice brings wishy-washy results and determined well-guided brave and wholehearted practice may bring the desired results knowing what is possible helps such as what each of the trainings can and cannot accomplish i will spell out the details of such things in part three the specifics of our goal may change with time as we become more familiar with the realities of these but the core motivation for all of this never changes that is quite a statement given that all things are impermanent and about as big a hint as can be given whatever ultimate truth you want on the spiritual path is to be found in the sensations of the wanting itself thus don't look out there except to find wise guidance about how to look inward for what you are looking for is nearer than near it is in the looking it is in the motivation it is in the suffering which is why this was the first noble truth that the buddha taught he went right for the heart of the thing it is in the question itself which is why koan training can work the experience of the question contains the answer to the content of the question it is in the undying love that drives our every wish for happiness strangely the process of creating the illusory sense of a self arises out of compassion but confused compassion which is desire this may sound odd but it is as if there was an eddy in reality that befuddled empty and compassionate awareness which is not a thing nor separate from things thus somehow it seems that there is something to defend some separate self that must be protected 
Thus, out of confused compassion, barriers and defense mechanisms continue to be erected to defend this territory, this illusion of a separate self. Spiritual practices are designed to systematically debunk this illusion and penetrate these barriers by providing clarity, whereas all of the traditions can easily become part of these barriers, cultures to defend, knowledge to assume as self or owned by self, and that sort of thing. It is if reality got caught in an unfortunate loop, and this is what we have to work with, as this loop of illusory duality thinks it is us. The natural tendency given our lack of clarity is to continue to defend this self out of compassion and lack of understanding that there never was such a thing. This defense and identification is the process of ego. Interestingly enough, all of the phenomena that make up this process— like all of the defilements, are themselves empty, intrinsically luminous and non-dual, though they seem otherwise by their own contrivance. Teachings such as, you are already enlightened, but you have yet to realize it, point to this. See Moon in a Dewdrop, the writings of Zen Master Dogen, edited by Kazuwaki Tanahashi, for a particularly profound discussion of the uses of this dangerous point of view. Thus, realization is not something created, but instead is discovered as being an intrinsic aspect of phenomena. Thus, with enough stability and clarity, concentration and wisdom, this natural, compassionate process of manifestation can begin to function more skillfully, as it has better information to go on, and can begin to see that creating the illusion of a separate, permanent self was not at all helpful, though it seemed to be. At this point, it will then let go of the illusion it has been perpetuating and return to understanding its natural state, which is freedom and non-duality. This is something that absolutely cannot be accomplished by an act of will. It only arises when the level of clarity is high enough and the heart accepting enough of things as they are. One might say that grace favors the well-trained mind. The pronounced tenaciousness of this process defending an illusory and arbitrary self demonstrates clearly just how much compassion and how much confusion there is in this. Work to see clearly so that the knot may begin to untie itself. I include all of this in the section called A Clear Goal, because the very sense of a drive to find something is actually the thing it is seeking. The motivation is looking for itself. In those sensations themselves is something very powerful and amazing. However, in order to see this, a shift has to happen, in which the drive becomes driven to understand the sensations of that drive itself, rather than looking to future sensations for satisfaction. This is a completely unintuitive thing to do, and this is one reason why meditation practices can seem so awkward sometimes. However, the fact that the drive or the goal contains its own solution is the reason why there is such restless emphasis on being present to what is happening now. If we can get this drive to just chill on its future fixation and simply understand itself, insight is close at hand. If you feel frustrated that your practice has not been as energized or as clear as you wish it to be, first sit with the fullness of that wish, with the fullness of that frustration, with the fullness of your fears, with the fullness of your hopes, with the fullness of that suffering and compassion, as clearly and bravely as you possibly can, until you understand them to their very depths as they actually are. Channel all of this energy into clear, precise, kind and focused living and practice. Since this whole book is clearly goal-oriented, I thought that it would be appropriate to add a few guidelines about formulating specific goals and working towards mastery that can help reduce the problems that poorly conceived goals can cause. Goals tend to involve a heavy future component. A trick is to add a component that relates to the here and now as well. For instance, one could wish to become enlightened. This is a purely future-oriented goal. One could also wish to understand the true nature of the sensation that make up one's world so clearly that one becomes enlightened. This adds a present component and thus makes the whole thing much more reasonable and workable. One could simply wish to deeply understand the true nature of the sensation that make up one's world as they arise in that practice session or during that day. This is a very immediate and present-oriented goal, and a very fine one indeed. 
it is also method oriented rather than result oriented this is the mark of a good goal similarly one could try to be kind honest or generous that day try to appreciate interdependence that day or try to stay really concentrated on some object for that practice session these present and method oriented goals are the foundation upon which great practice is based purely future oriented goals are at best mostly worthless and at worst very dangerous wishing to become enlightened or more enlightened is only helpful if it helps one live in the present as it is the same goes for training in morality and concentration as articulated in part one a good friend of mine once forgot these basic rules of goal-oriented practice and strived with great energy for months to attain a goal that had nothing to do with the reality he was experiencing at the time the results were disastrous and the dark consequences of his error ring on to this day don't get burned by the shadow side of goal-oriented practice avoid competition and comparing your practice to others stay present oriented whenever possible and always avoid purely future oriented or results oriented goals also be careful what you ask for you just might get it but with a price you could never have imagined it should be noted that the thoughts of the past and future occur now these sensations are worthy of investigation future mind is only a problem if the sensations that make it up are not understood as they are a fun practice to try is consciously thinking thoughts whose content is past or future oriented and noticing that they occur now there is something particularly profound about this that might be missed on first inspection while i am on the subject of goal-oriented practice i should say a few words about how to avoid overdoing it first if those around you particularly those with a lot of experience in meditation and the spiritual life are telling you that you should chill out a bit they are probably saying it for a good reason ask them why they think that and take their opinions into consideration now it is true that sometimes people will tell you to chill out on your practice a bit just because of their own envy of your determination and diligence but i haven't found this to be a common occurrence when on intensive retreats there are a few basic ways to sail a bit too far out there too fast the first is to stop eating it is true that there is a long and glorious tradition of people fasting when doing spiritual practice but generally they do so because they want to bring on severely altered states of consciousness fasting when meditating is an effective technique for doing this should you be doing insight practices altered states are not your intended focus and so these are more likely to be distracting than helpful further severely altered states of consciousness can sometimes be very disruptive and hard to process leading to what might be considered by some to be temporary insanity if you are the sort of person who would drop lsd when out in public then the altered states that fasting might bring on would probably not be a problem for you on the other hand if you are on retreat with other people consideration for the fact that they may not want to deal with the potential side effects of your vision quest is warranted another way to go out on the ledge is to stop sleeping sleep deprivation can eventually lead to very altered states of consciousness and visionary experiences the exact same considerations that come into play when not eating apply while it may be true that when doing intensive practice the need for sleep may go down to perhaps four to six hours or sometimes less try to get at least some sleep every night there are those that are such macho meditators that they will try to sit for very long periods of time say ten to twenty four hours while this might seem like a really brave thing to do a real tribute to one's determination i don't see the point i have managed to make very rapid progress when on intensive retreats where the longest sit i did was four hours and most were less than one and one half hours however if one sits long enough and really pushes the investigation with heroic effort one can get into states of consciousness that are quite volatile it can be very difficult to ground back down and integrate what comes out of that sort of extreme practice again out of consideration for your mind and body as well as for those around you on retreat who may not want to deal with your potential inability to integrate and control the energy that can be generated from that sort of practice 
consider moderation in sitting. Lastly, there are some who will try to mix mind-altering substances and meditation. This can seem like an easy and fast path. In fact, there are countless traditions that use these as an integral part of their path. However, there are numerous strong warnings against doing this at all, or against doing this without the guidance of those that really know what they are doing, or when not in the proper setting, such as far out in the desert with no one around except a friend to keep you safe, and no big cliffs or weapons nearby. I have found that simply doing really consistent insight or concentration practices well can quickly produce altered states and strange experiences that have taken me to the very brink of what I could handle skillfully, and sometimes beyond, many of which I will discuss in Part 3, so I don't see the need for using mind-altering substances. Further, there are reasons to learn to see things from different points of view on our own power, so that these things may become part of who and what we are, rather than some transient side effect brought on by tinkering with our neurochemistry. In short, those on the path of heroic effort can easily get sidetracked into ritualistic displays that seem like heroic effort, but they are not. Heroic effort on the insight path means heroic investigation of the three characteristics of the sensations that make up our experience, whatever they may be. Thus, my advice, when on an insight meditation retreat, is to really power the investigation all day long, whether you are sitting, walking, reclining, standing, eating, washing, etc. Get enough sleep. Eat well to keep up your health. Take care of your body, particularly your knees and back. Should those with more experience than you in these matters consistently tell you to back off on the effort just a bit, give it a try. I have occasionally done otherwise and regretted it. William Blake wrote that we do not know what is enough unless we know what is more than enough. Unfortunately, most insight meditators will not put forth enough effort to know either. However, should you find that you are simply cooking yourself through too much effort, learn from your mistakes and follow the middle path. The last point about having a clear goal I make reluctantly, as I am afraid that I will justify the very thing I wish to speak out against. Here goes. I heard someone speculating that Zen might have developed as being very austere and drab because of how colorful and unstable Japan was during its development, and likewise the Tibetan tradition was colorful and complex because Tibet was so bleak. Burmese Buddhism might also be extremely technical, goal-oriented, efficient, and effective, because their country is such a chaotic mess. Perhaps in just this way, we have the most goal-oriented culture in the world, and yet tend towards the least goal-oriented, least practical and least effective take on Buddhism I have found anywhere. This is an unfortunate shadow side of our culture that many of us can barely tolerate one more goal to attain, one more hoop to jump through, one more exam to pass, one more certification or degree to obtain, one more SUV to buy. Perhaps we are crafting a Buddhism in which you don't have to really ever accomplish anything so as to find a refuge from our extremely neurotic fixation on achievement. This might explain why we often fixate on teaching such as effortless effort. There is nothing to attain, and postponing enlightenment through the Bodhisattva vow. Believe me, as someone who has two graduate degrees and actively involved in a field that requires constant reading, recertification and training. I am often sick of the whole achievement trip as well. On the other hand, I have found that goal-oriented practice combined with good instruction and a few good conceptual frameworks is largely unstoppable, barring extreme circumstances. Thus, if you are sick of goals to the point that you can't make any room for those that will soon follow, strip down your daily life so as to make room for the drive to master the states and stages of the path. Take more vacations, back off on the career ladder climbing a little, and make time to really bust out some serious meditative accomplishments. The Buddha was known for saying that there was nothing so valuable in this world as mastering the Dharma. I couldn't agree more. Harnessing the Energy of the Defilements 
I am astounded at how many people are completely paralyzed in their practice because they feel bad about so many of the types of emotional sensations that arise. Unrealistic ideals of the emotional perfection that meditation might bring often create an inability to face one's actual humanity or to continue practicing. The energy in undesirable emotions can actually be used to fuel one's practice, which is good, as this is much of what we have to work with. This paralysis happens because people tend to feel that bad emotions should not arise and are worthless and embarrassing. While there is a lot to be said for repressing the defilements, there is also a lot to be said for using their tremendous energy in ways that are skillful. Basically, until we are very enlightened, some odd mixture of compassion and confusion motivates everything we do, as mentioned elsewhere, and so we have to learn to work with this. Further, these potentially useful emotional energies will continue to arise like the weather, even in very enlightened beings, contrary to popular belief, so we must learn how to deal with them and use them well. Remember that these practices and teachings are not about becoming some kind of emotionally devoid, non-existent entity, but about clearly understanding the truth of our humanity and life. Becoming fluent in the true nature of all categories of sensations, including the sensations that make up all categories of emotions, is a particularly good idea and highly recommended. This might even be undertaken as a systematic practice by those who are dedicated to thorough understanding. Thus, those doing noting practice, which I highly recommend, can note which emotions they are feeling, such as fear, boredom, anger, confidence, restlessness, joy, jealousy, etc. Further, if the powerful energy of the emotional life can be harnessed to energize our practice, this can be extremely helpful. Some level of skill and moderation is required here, a middle way between defilement restraint and energy transmutation. Either extreme can be harmful or helpful depending on how much wisdom the student has, how good their teachers are, and how well the student listens to their teachers. It should be noted that those who are passionate about practice and learning to actually practice correctly are much more likely to make progress than those who are not. Those who are able to channel all their rage, frustration, lust, greed, despair, confusion and anguish into trying to find a better way are the only ones who are likely to have what it takes to finally attain freedom. Those who are actually able to sit with the specific sensations that make up rage, lust, anger, confusion, and all the rest with clarity, precision, acceptance of their humanity, and equanimity are even more likely to get enlightened. This paragraph deserves to be read more than once. It is common for people to feel bad about their lack of progress. This can cause them to feel extremely frustrated and produce all sorts of self-judgment, jealousy, extremes of blind faith, and rigid adherence to dogma. It can paralyze a student's practice if they get caught in these or in thinking that desire for enlightenment is a problem, when in fact it is the most compassionate wish that someone could have for themselves or others. The whole trick is to channel this energy into actual practice, using good technique rather than comparison or thoughts about progress. Simply examine the sensations that make up all of this frustration and comparison. For example, don't stop investigating when certain categories of sensations arise. Try this little exercise the next time some kind of strong and seemingly useless or unskillful emotion arises. First, stabilize precisely on the sensations that make it up and perhaps even allow these to become stronger if this helps you to examine them more clearly. Find where these are in the body, and see as clearly as possible what sorts of images and storylines are associated with these physical sensations. Be absolutely clear about the full magnitude of the suffering in these, how long each lasts, that these sensations are observed and not particularly in one's control. Now find the compassion in it. Take a minute or two, no more, to reflect on why this particular pattern of sensations seems to be of some use, even though it may not seem completely useful in its current form. Is there a wish for yourself or others to be happy in these sensations? Is there a wish for the world to be a better place? Is there a wish for someone to understand something important? Is there a wish for things to be better than they are? 
is there a wish to find pleasure, tranquility, or the end of suffering? Sit with these questions, with the sensations that make them up, allowing them to be strong enough to see what is going on, but not so strong that you become completely overwhelmed by them. Notice that fear has in it the desire to protect us, or those about whom we care. Anger wants the world to be happy and work well, or for justice to be done. Frustration comes from the caring sensations of anger being thwarted. Desire is rooted in the wish to be happy. Judgment comes from the wish for things to conform to high standards. Sadness comes from the sense of how good things could be. I could go on like this for a whole book. Actively reflecting along these lines, sit with this compassionate wish, acknowledge it, and feel the compassionate aspect of it. Allow the actual sensations that seem to be fundamental to wanting to be directly understood, as and where they are. Remember that this same quality of compassion is in all beings, in all their unskillful and confused attempts to find happiness, and the end of suffering. Sit for a bit with this reflection as it relates directly to your experience. Then examine the mental sensations related to the object that you either wish for, attraction, wish to get away from, aversion, or wish could just be ignored, ignorance. Examine realistically if this will fundamentally help you and others, and if these changes are within your power to bring about. If so, then plan and act with as much compassion and kindness as possible. Remember then that all the rest of the suffering of that emotional pattern is created by your mind and its confusion and vow to channel its force into developing morality, concentration, and wisdom. Reflection on the fact that the emotions have unskillful components as well as skillful ones can give us a more realistic relationship to our hearts, minds, and bodies, and allow us to grow in wisdom and kindness without blindly shutting ourselves down or chaining ourselves to a wall. From a certain point of view, we are all doing our best all the time, and the problem is just that we do not see clearly enough. There is a Tibetan teaching from Tantra called The Five Buddha Families, or Five Sky Dancers, that does a good job of dealing with the wide world of emotions and their helpful and less than helpful aspects. There is also a Tibetan teaching called The Six Realms that can help us well. Both of these teachings are too rich and deep to do them justice here. If you are interested in these fine teachings, you might check out Journey Without Goal, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism and Transcending Madness, all by Chugyam Trumpa. It should be noted that the fundamental rule when applying emotion-derived effort in practice is actually put into practice rather than thoughts about practice, thoughts about some goal that seem far off, thoughts about success or failure, thoughts about one's strengths or weaknesses or even thoughts about putting effort into practice. These traps are all too common, blindly waste the vast power inherent in our emotional life, and cause rather than reduce difficulties. Some of us will have to learn the hard way. I remember some time ago, when I realized that something I thought that I had understood quite thoroughly was actually only partially understood. I was very much less happy with this, and decided to put the fullness of this compassionate rage into relentless, focused investigation of the three characteristics during whatever periods of time I could find during the day for doing so. It was only two months later that I came to understand what I wished to, and I was grateful for the power of the emotional life and what it can lend to practice. Remember, there is love and wisdom mixed even into our worst emotions. If that is what we have to work with, let's use it wisely. Some may then say, That is not right motivation. You cannot proceed without right motivation. Well, aside from the fact that this simply isn't true, such people trap themselves in a catch-22. To attain this very pure motivation, to use dangerous language, we must understand what it is that one wants to use this pure motivation to understand. Thus, we are unable to proceed based on our somewhat deluded motivations. Awakening would be impossible by definition. Luckily, awakening is possible, and the only tool we have is practice based on semi-deluded motivations. I am extremely grateful that this seems to be sufficient if we are willing to use what we have, rather than fantasizing about some perfect us that doesn't exist. 
without greed, rage, grandiosity, frustration, insecurity, fear, and a host of other semi-deluded forces, we would hardly budge. We wouldn't pick up Dharma books. We wouldn't go on retreats. We wouldn't deal with our stuff, and we wouldn't care at all. But we do care, and so we forge on. Thank the metaphorical God for the power of our emotions and the pain the dark ones cause. They are the gasoline that drives us on the road to understanding. Right Thought and the Aegean Stables There is a lot of emphasis on right thought and suppressing the mental defilements in Buddhism, as well as training in morality, right speech, and that sort of thing. These are the agendas for what happens in our ordinary reality. They are aspects of training in morality. This emphasis on controlling our thoughts can be helpful, but it has its limits and often causes problems when misunderstood. This becomes the predominant thrust of one's practice and involves images of self-perfection that deny the basic realities of human existence and the inevitable dark sides of life. Trouble is basically guaranteed. The Buddha did not go on and on about restraining thought, transforming thought, and that sort of thing. He was making a very important point, but he didn't stop there. He also advocated that people go on to cultivate concentration and then insight, so as to temporarily quiet and then overcome forever the fundamental delusions that drive our noisy minds. This same point would apply to psychotherapy. It can be useful, but to find the end of suffering we must go much deeper. Sutta 20, in the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, great book, by the way, is called The Removal of Distracting Thoughts. In it, Buddha admonished his followers to deal with unskillful, evil, unwholesome, or useless thoughts in the following ways. First, if the student is paying attention to something that is causing these unskillful thoughts, then they should pay attention to something wholesome that does not produce unskillful thoughts. If this fails, then they should reflect on the danger in those thoughts, and thus try to condition themselves not to think such thoughts in this way. If this fails, then they should try to forget those thoughts and not give any attention to them. If this fails, then they should give attention to quieting the mind and to stilling these thoughts. If this fails, then the student should bear down with their full will and crush mind with mind, forcing the thoughts to stop with unremitting and unrestrained effort. He also recommended the formal concentration practices of loving-kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. See Loving-Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness by Sharon Salzberg or The Training Mind by Kagyum Trunpa. Those familiar with cognitive restructuring will notice great similarities between this 2,500-year-old approach and more modern techniques. These can help develop morality and also suppress the hindrances that cause distraction and poor concentration, as well as begin to create better mental and personal habits. However, this can have its problems if not understood in a realistic and clear way. A subtle but incorrect modification of these techniques can create a large amount of internal conflict, as can failing to understand the limitations of such techniques. The subtle modification that is definitely not recommended but all too common is the following. The student substitutes feelings of self-judgment or self-loathing for the thoughts they feel are unskillful. This results from only seeing the ignorant side and not the compassion side of intentions and thoughts. It can produce some extremely detrimental results, as well as highly neurotic and repressed individuals who are in basic denial of their actual humanity and heart. It can produce students who are quite bitter, tight, judgmental, puritanical, and generally unpleasant to be around. This is one extreme. The other extreme tends to come when people only focus on the compassion side of their emotions and not the confusion and suffering that can be mixed in with them. Aspects of the late sixties come to mind. This error can lead to extreme misunderstanding of Tantra, unhealthy Epicureanism, addictions, and general debauchery that are simply destructive. While this may seem fun and liberating for a while, the consequences tend to be as bad as would be expected. Thus, a sophisticated examination of our heart's desires, aversions, and confusions can help sort out what aspects are skillful and worth cultivating, 
and what aspects are unhelpful and worth abandoning by the various methods available. The last problem comes from not understanding that the only way to really bring some permanent relief from these persistent and somewhat uncontrollable thoughts is to get quite enlightened. Until this happens, even in the early stages of awakening, the defilements of the mind will continue to cause the creation of all kinds of unhelpful thoughts and mind noise that are easy to get caught in and fooled by. Thus, while training in thought restraint can be very helpful and is highly recommended, it should not be viewed as being more powerful than it is. Remember that training in morality and concentration does not produce awakening without training insight. This point is mentioned again and again, but somehow continues to be overlooked. A useful analogy is that of the Aegean stables. The story goes that one of Hercules' tasks was to clean the Aegean stables. This housed a very large number of cattle that continually produced great mounds of excrement. He tried again and again with superhuman strength to clean them, but there were too many cattle producing too much excrement too fast for him. As soon as he had cleaned one area, the other areas were full of manure, and so he despaired. However, when he diverted a great river through the stables, this was able to wash the whole of the stables clean at once, and his task was accomplished. While the sensations that make up our reality are still misunderstood, we can feel a bit like Hercules before he diverted the river. This is par for the course and normal. Enlightenment is a sudden thing, but the cultivation of that initial awakening is a gradual thing and proceeds in fairly predictable stages, detailed in Part 3. For more information on this topic, I recommend the excellent works of Chi Newell, presented in Tracing Back the Radiance, as translated by Robert Buswell. At each progressive stage, certain unhelpful patterns of identification with experience are forever eliminated or overcome, sort of like channeling a river through one part of the stables, but many more remain until final and complete awakening. Thus the mind becomes progressively clearer, more spacious and quieter and those unskillful thoughts regarding identification that do arise are more likely to be caught before they can do damage. Thus, for those who wish for the end of suffering should strive to be kind, stabilize the mind, and carefully and precisely understand the actual truth of their experience in each moment in a way that goes beyond content. FROM CONTENT TO INSIGHT in the previous chapter, I explained the method of cognitive restructuring that was designed to help us stop thinking, distracting, or unhelpful thoughts. As those techniques have an agenda for what happens, rather than an agenda for perceiving something fundamental about whatever happens, they are an aspect of training in morality or concentration. However, if we are willing to realize that we can also make an insight-oriented perspective on difficult or distracting thoughts, either on the cushion or when walking around, then we can begin to make the transition from content to insight. As you would expect, this method is grounded squarely in the three characteristics, as well as the other basic assumptions of insight practices, such as one's current sensate experience being the gold standard for reality. This method is probably best shown by way of examples. In this case of a few people with a big issue, who are on an insight meditation retreat and reporting their experiences to their teacher. The first example is of someone who is completely buying into the content. So in my practice, I have been working through my big issue, you know, really trying to deal with it. It just seems to come back again and again. Every time I sit on the cushion, I find myself thinking about my big issue again. This big issue is such a big part of my life, such a huge issue. I am afraid that if I look too closely at my big issue, it will overwhelm me. I wish my big issue would just go away. I have been doing so much practice, and yet I still have to deal with this darn big issue. Notice that the person assumes continuity of the existence of the big issue. They also assume that all thoughts about the big issue are either self, the property of self, or separate from self. Further, they are not working at the sensate level trying to see the true nature of the thoughts and physical sensations that make up the big issue and the rest of their reality. In short, the practice they mention is some sort of practice other than insight practice. 
Let's try that again. I sat down on the cushion, and I had barely begun to practice noticing my breath when a thought about my big issue arose. I tried to ignore it, but then more thoughts about big issue arose, and my stomach began to feel queasy. I tried to focus on breath again, but then found myself thinking about the big issue again. Thought after thought, mostly the same old thoughts, repeating again and again. This person is already making progress toward using these thoughts and physical sensations as a basis for insights. They are beginning to apply the assumptions of insight practices to their experience. They are trying to focus on a physical object, trying to notice the individual sensations that make up their thoughts and physical sensations. However, they have poor concentration and have not learned to see the true nature of the sensations that make these up. I sat on the cushion, and I tried to see each of the sensations that make up the breath. Interspersed with these physical sensations were mental images of the breath. Interspersed with all these sensations were also thoughts about the big issue. They were quick and seemed also to involve some mildly painful or disconcerting physical sensations in the region of my stomach. I could see these come and go and that they were observed. I could feel as they arose that there was something irritating about these quick sensations. I noticed that most of my experience was made up of sensations that didn't seem to relate to that big issue. Sometimes I noticed the three characteristics of sensations that seemed to be related to the old big issue pattern of sensations, and sometimes I was able to stay with the sensations of breathing. However, regardless of which sensations arose, I was generally able to see some aspect of the true nature of them. Thus I find that I am able to keep practicing and not get lost in the old circular thoughts about that big issue that do me little good and have caused me much pain. These are the sorts of descriptions that really light up a meditation teacher's eyes. They can see that this is a person who is getting a sense of what is insight practice and how it can be useful. The meditator not only understands the focus and assumptions of insight practices, but is also able to actually do fairly consistent and strong practice. Even being able to do this when we are walking around and dealing with our stuff can be helpful. Shifting to the sensate level reveals things about our stuff that can be very helpful for keeping it in perspective and not getting overwhelmed by it. It also develops habits that make it easier for us to shift to a sensate level when we do formal insight practice. Thus, if you have an issue that keeps bugging you, try taking the time to see the three characteristics of the sensation that make it up as you go about your day, thinking. The pattern of sensations that make up the big issue are quick, transient, and observed. I will do my best to notice this as those sensations occur. When speaking of the big issue to others and myself, I will try to keep my descriptions at an insight-oriented level. By seeing this big issue as objective and transit phenomena, I will not be lost in my negative and painful thoughts about my big issue. I will be able to bring more clarity and spaciousness into the big issue, able to bring more intelligence to the big issue, able to bring more common sense and balance to the big issue. If I can do this, it will be of great benefit to me. If I continue to wallow in my circular thoughts about my big issue, that get me nowhere. I will simply experience unnecessary pain to little good effect. This is my plan and my resolve. Though I may fail again and again to be able to do this, eventually I will break the habit of not being able to see the true nature of the big issue, and thus will grow in wisdom and happiness. That's the way the game is played. Just for fun, I will give you two examples from even more advanced practitioners and how they might describe their practice. I sat down on the cushion and began noticing the three characteristics of the sensations that make up experiential reality showing themselves. There were physical and mental sensations, all rising and vanishing quickly and effortlessly. I could see perhaps five to fifteen sensations per second, primarily in the abdominal region, but there were many other little sensations coming in from all over. Colors on the back of my eyelids, sounds from other meditators breathing. Occasionally there were some quick sensations interspersed with these about that big issue, like little phantoms vanishing in a sea of flickering color and form. They cause no interruptions in my investigations, being just more sensations for investigation. This is obviously a strong practitioner with solid insight skills. They know exactly what they are looking for and do so.
they are willing to make time for bare sensate investigation. We cannot instantly make transition to this sort of practice, but I am a firm believer that making clear exactly what we are looking for can make it much easier to actually make the transition from content to insight. By observing what we are able to do and taking a look at what someone else at the next higher skill level can do, we will be able to proceed with more confidence that we are on the right track. This last example is a description of practice from a particularly strong and advanced practitioner. I sat down on the cushion, and the cycles of insight presented themselves effortlessly. There was a shift, and very fine, fast vibrations arose instantly, dropping down quickly and then shifted out, getting vague for a few seconds. Concentration restabilized and revealed the quick ending of sensations one after the other, perhaps five to ten per second, and then things began thickening somewhat, getting somewhat irritating but vibrations remained the predominant experience. It was just that their unsatisfactory aspect became more predominant, and there were a few sensations relating to the big issue. I may have noticed a few hints of what dualistic perspectives remain, and the basic pain and confusion they cause. There was a shift, and a more panoramic and easy perspective arose, accompanied by more coherent and synchronized vibrations, including most of the sensed reality including much of space, at perhaps five to fifteen per second. There was a short period of barely noticeable but mature equanimity in the face of these, as the vibrations became more inclusive. Any sense of practicing dropped away entirely. A minute later, two of the three characteristics presented completely in quick succession, including the whole background of space, revealing something incomprehensible in the nature of the subject and object, and reality vanished. Reality reappeared quiet, clear, beautiful, and easy. I solidified space in that afterglow so as to enjoy the formless realms for a few minutes, rising up through them and back down to boundless space. A vision relating to the big issue arose. I stabilized on the vision, noticing the feeling of it, and before I knew it I was out of body, traveling in a strange realm, having interactions that replayed the issue of the big issue in symbolic or mythic form. I saw something about this issue that I never had before, how an old, unexamined, and fictitious train of associations lead to my inability to come to some more balanced understanding of this issue. This epiphany broke my concentration, and I returned to my body. I then dropped out of the formless realms, allowing a new insight cycle to begin again. When I got up off the cushion, I noticed that the psychological insights that arose in the other realm gave me an increased sense of humor and a more compassionate perspective towards those involved in this issue. They were just trying to be happy, just as we all are. It will be interesting to see how this plays out. They have a talent and wide range of skills. They are not only an advanced insight practitioner, but they also have strong concentration skills, and can even chance into some of the more unusual concentration attainments. Further, they can even seem to be able to use their ability to travel out of body to gain relative insights into the content of their stuff. Last, they are on the lookout for the subtle signs of the limits of their insights. They are not only skilled, but they realize what they do not yet know. They are well on their way to mastering the core teachings of the Buddha. Section 9. Part 3. Mastery. Concentration versus Insight. There is a lot of confusion on the differences between concentration practices and insight practices. This may be caused in part by the mushroom factor, or it may be due in part to other factors, such as concentration practice being easier than insight practices, and distinctly more pleasant most of the time. Concentration practices, samatha or samadhi practices, are meditation on a concept, an aggregate of many transient sensations, where insight practice is meditation on the many transient sensations just as they are. When doing concentration practices, one purposefully tries to fix or freeze the mind in a specific state, called an absorption, jhana or dhyana. While reality cannot be frozen in this way, the illusion of solidity and stability certainly can be cultivated, and this is concentration practice. 
Insight practices are designed to penetrate the three illusions of permanence, satisfactoriness, and separate self, so as to attain freedom. The illusion of satisfactoriness has a lot to do with the false sense that continuing to mentally create the illusion of a separate, permanent self will be satisfactory or helpful, and is not referring to some oppressive, fun-denying angst trip. Insight practices, various types of vipassana, zochen, zazen, etc., lead to the progressive stages of the progress of insight. Insight practices tend to be difficult and somewhat disconcerting, as they are designed to deconstruct our deluded and much-cherished views of the world and ourselves, though they can sometimes be outrageously blissful for frustratingly short periods. Concentration states are basically always some permutation of great fun, extremely fascinating, seductive, spacious, blissful, peaceful, spectacular, etc., there is basically no limit to how interesting concentration practices can be. Insight practice stages and revelations can also be very interesting, but are not potentially addictive the way concentration states and side effects can be. Insight practices tend to be hard work most of the time, even if that work is just surrendering to things as they are. One of the factors that actually adds to the confusion is that the concentration state terminology, jihanas, is used in the original texts to describe both the progressively more sophisticated concentration states and also the progress of insight, with little delineation of which is which. This was solved to some degree a few hundred years later when the stages of the progress of insight were articulated in the canonical commentaries, but the original problem was not mentioned. It was only in the second half of the twentieth century that the problem was sorted out to some degree by the Burmese, and I will delineate the Vipassana Janus later. To try to keep this clear in a way that the old texts simply don't, whenever I refer to Jhana without meaning, whether I mean Samitta or Vipassana Jhana, I always mean Samitta Jhana, a stable state produced by concentration practices. When I refer to those jhanas produced by insight practices, I will always refer to them vipassana jhanas. Concentration practices develop concentration, but they don't develop wisdom. The problem is that concentration states can easily fool people into thinking they are at the end goal of the spiritual path, because these states can become so blissful, spacious, and even formless and thus can closely match some imprecise descriptions or expectations of what awakening might be like. However, concentration practices can be very helpful and are very important. Without at least some skill in concentration practices, insight meditation is virtually impossible. There is an esoteric debate in the ancient commentaries about some students who got enlightened without even attaining the lowest of the concentration states. The first jhana, explained later, practitioners call dry insight workers, but I wouldn't bank on this being a common occurrence. Luckily, insight practices themselves can simultaneously develop concentration and insight, though the dangers of being seduced by concentration states can lie in wait there as well. In short, you must master the first jhana as a minimum basis for beginning the progress of insight, but this is all that is required for enlightenment. As long as one is very clear about what is concentration practice and what is insight practice, which may not be as easy an understanding to come by as some might think, concentration practice beyond the first jhana can be helpful to the insight practitioner. All of the concentration states stabilize the mind, obviously, and this has four primary benefits. First, just as a movie camera that is shaking wildly will not be likely to produce a clear or intelligible movie, so a mind that won't stay settled on an object will not clearly perceive the ultimate truth of it. Second, as concentration states cultivate deep clarity and stability on content, they are very useful for promoting deep and healing psychological insights. Put another way, if you want to bring up your stuff, do concentration practices. Third, concentration states can be a welcome and valid vacation from stress, providing periods of very deep relaxation and peace that can be an extremely important part of a sane, compassionate, and healthy lifestyle. 
The Buddha highly praised those who had mastery of the concentration states, and this should serve as a reminder to those who underestimate their great value, or erroneously feel that not enjoying one's life is somehow spiritual. Fourth, concentration practices can help the insight practitioner stay somewhat more mentally stable and balanced, as their old concepts of their existence are rent asunder by insight practice. However, if these states end up blocking this process by solidifying a sense of self as being anything or creating aversion to clearly experiencing suffering, then they become a hindrance. This is a very tricky balance. If a student clings to stability or fluidity, they will surely not make progress in insight. However, if they plunge into the fast and harsh vibratory experiences of insight practice without the soothing effects of concentration practice to help them stay somewhat grounded, the student can be a bit like someone who has taken a small dose, or a big dose in the worst cases, of LSD or drunk way too much coffee. I spent the first five years of my practice giving only a moderate amount of attention to the Samitha Janus, and now I realize that this was probably an error. Sometimes spiritual openings can be extreme and dramatic, and being able to slow things down and calm down can sometimes be very useful and skillful if we have to deal with the world and deal with these openings at the same time. In short, if you want to gunk up your insight practice because you simply need to slow down so as to be able to get on with your life, or not completely flip out, such as to study for medical school boards, etc., one way to do this is to indulge in concentration states. Coupling this with formal resolutions to not make progress in insight can be very effective. There are many concentration states, and they become progressively more refined as one masters them. A brief description of the concentration states follows. It is basically straight out of the standard text and very accurate. Regardless of the tradition you are following, when you begin to get some mastery of its concentration practices, you will go through these states in this order up to the level of your current ability, though some people can master skipping over jhanas. The specific object of meditation may limit the level of jhana that can be obtained, as well as color the experience of these states. Such details are spelled out in various canonical texts, such as the Visidumaga, and the more readable but harder to find, Vimutimaga, Bahante Gunaratanas the Janus, included in his more complete work, The Path of Serenity and Insight, is a scholarly work based on the subject, as is Nyana Taloka's Path to Deliverance, published by the Buddhist Publication Society out of Sri Lanka. Some of these texts, particularly the first two, go into long and sophisticated discussions about which posture and which object might be best suited to the individual proclivities of various types of people. It is unfortunate that this sort of information is not in common use today. I suppose that a suit off the rack will work for most occasions, but there is something about one that has been tailor-made. I am told that there are still a few monasteries that provide this sort of traditional training. Unfortunately, this topic is way too complex to treat properly here, but those of you who are that serious about these subjects are highly advised to check out the original sources. They contain an astounding amount of powerful information, but unfortunately make for fairly tedious reading. Many of the traditions use the breath as the primary object initially, and then shift to the qualities of the states themselves as the object of meditation when they arise and the concentration is strong. The quality of jhana can either be soft or hard, depending on how solidly one is in the state. In soft jhana, the qualities of that particular state are definitely recognizable in a way that is different from the ordinary experience of those qualities to the degree that we are confident we are in the altered state defined by those qualities. In really hard jhana, it feels as if our mind has been fused to those qualities and the object with superglue as if we were nothing but a solid block or field of those qualities or that object, as if they and the object were the whole world and nothing else remaining. Getting into really hard jhana states 
dramatically increases the beneficial effects of the practice, though it takes greater strength of concentration and usually requires more favorable practice conditions to do so. Taking the beneficial factors of the jhana soli as the object of concentration is helpful for this, as it can be using an easily identified external object such as a candle flame or colored disc. For detailed instructions in practices that use an external object called casino practices, the works listed above, particularly Bahante Gunaratana's The Path of Serenity and Insight, provide such a good treatment of them that you should simply obtain and read those sources. However, the basic instructions are these. Stabilize your concentration on an external object, casino, until you can see the object with your eyes closed or when you are not looking at the object. Take that vision as the new object and stabilize your attention on it until your concentration is like a rock. From this foundation you should be able to easily attain any of the states I am about to describe. The basic pattern one goes through with these states is as follows. First, one develops enough concentration to attain the jhana. Then the mind sees, feels the jhana, moves towards and into it, with almost all such state shifts occurring between the end of the out-breath and the beginning of the new in-breath, sometimes accompanied by the eyelids flickering. Then there is the honeymoon period, where the jhana is fresh but unsteady. Then there is the maturation period, when the jhana really comes into its own more solidly and shows its true glory. Then the faults of the jhana tend to become noticeable, as well as the proximity of the state to the state below it, and the ease of falling into that lower state. Next, the concentration deepens, and some sort of equanimity about good and bad aspects of the jhana sets in. When the concentration grows strong enough, and the current jhana is no longer desirable, the mind will naturally shift to the next higher jhana, and the cycle goes around again, within the limits of the humanly attainable states and your current skill level. The Concentration States Submitted jhanas. The first jhana. The first jhana rises after the practitioner has gained the ability to actually steady the mind on some object, such as the breath. For example, after a state called access concentration, meaning the level of concentration needed to access the first jhana or insight practice. Notice that if we are spinning lost in thought, this is basically impossible. If you wish to attain this, I would try to stay as completely as possible with an object for perhaps one minute. When you can do this, try for ten minutes. When you can do this, try for an hour. For instance, if you are using the breath as an object, try to be aware of every single breath at least in part for a full ten minutes, and then for an hour. This is definitely possible and a reasonable goal. Try not paying too much attention to the individual sensations themselves but conceptualize the breath as a coherent and continuous entity, with many different types of sensations all being thought of as being the breath. It is important to know that really getting into a sense of breath as a continuous entity for ten seconds will do you more good than being generally with the breath on and off for an hour. Tune in to the illusory smoothness of things by purposely and calmly working with illusions of solidity or fluidity. There is a certain intuit quality which helps, sort of like really getting into a slow groove when playing an instrument, having sex, playing a sport, or just sinking into a well-deserved and warm bubble bath. Being in a silent and safe place is very helpful, as is giving yourself permission to relax, put the cares of the world behind you, and enjoy. If you are using the breath as an object, you might try purposefully visualizing it as sweet, smooth waves or circles that are peaceful and welcome. Try breathing as if you were in a garden of fragrant rose and wish to experience the fullness of their fragrance. Perhaps these tips will help illustrate the kind of non-restraint and peaceful presence that can help one attain these states. Tune in to sensations in and around the primary object that feel good. Harbor no guilt, anxiety, or fear related to the depths of pleasure, ease, and well-being. The spiritual life need not be some sort of relentless, austere grind, particularly when doing concentration practices. 
As concentration improves, it is as though the mind sees the first jhana and grabs onto it. Having an idea of what you're looking for, such as something enjoyable and steady, can be helpful for this. It has the five primary factors of applied and sustained effort or attention, rapture, happiness, and concentration. Thus, it is great fun, feels good, but it takes consistent effort to sustain. The attention is focused narrowly, as though one were looking at a small area of this page. This state can be quite a relief from the pain and discomfort of sitting meditation, and can temporarily quiet the mind somewhat. As with all the concentration states, it is generally quite easy to concentrate on something that is very enjoyable. Thus, one's concentration skills may improve rapidly and easily after attaining the first jhana and tend to basically flounder until one has attained the first jhana. Thus attaining the first jhana is really, really important. People tend to really like this state and may cling to it for the rest of the retreat if on retreat, or cultivate it again and again in their sitting practice at home. It is a valuable attainment, and it serves as the minimum foundation for both insight and concentration practices. From the first jhana there are basically three things a meditator can do. They can either get stuck there. I know someone who spent some twenty years cultivating the first jhana in their daily practice and thinking this was insight practice. They can progress to the second jhana, or they can investigate the first jhana and thus begin the progress of insight. By investigate the state, I mean that they can direct their attention to breaking the illusion of the solidity of that state into its component individual sensations, so that one can understand their true nature, such as the three characteristics, as it is done in insight practice with all objects. Special attention must be paid to trying to experience the precise arising and passing of every individual sensation that makes up the state particularly the primary beneficial factors of the state listed above. While it is not actually possible to perceive the arising and passing of every single sensation, or to even be mindful of every sensation, it is definitely possible to be clear about enough of them to get enlightened, and that is what matters. It is somewhat common for people to do this half-heartedly and not pay particular attention to the myriad sensations that make up rapture and happiness, as they secretly wish them to be permanent, satisfy and be self or the property of self. Stagnation is basically guaranteed in insight practice if you cling to the pleasant sensations in this way, or anything else for that matter. Put another way, if you fail to see the impermanence of objects, you will have artificially solidified them, clung to them, and will not gain insight from them. A near enemy of the first Samantha Jhana is access concentration, and when applied and sustained effort or attention flag somewhat, access concentration sets in. As the texts rightly say, the applied and sustained effort, such as the fact that you have to make effort to get into and stay in this state, is somewhat annoying. This becomes more and more apparent, and clear awareness of just this simple fact while staying in the jhana causes the mind to eventually bail out of the first jhana and into the second jhana. The second jhana. The second jhana is like the first, like a seemingly solidified mind state. With the dropping of almost all of applied and sustained effort, the rapture and happiness factors created by concentration can really predominate. Thus, whereas the first jhana feels like something you need to pay attention to, the second jhana has the quality of showing itself to you. The focus of attention widens out somewhat, sort of like looking straight ahead without focusing the eyes on anything specific. Whereas mind-generated objects in the first jhana are stable, they will move, such as spin, pulse, or resonate, etc., in the second jhana, in ways that correlate with the phase of the breath, moving slowly toward the top and bottom of the breath and more quickly in the middle. The silence of the mind is noticeably increased, and the pleasure of this state may increase greatly as well, particularly if pleasure is the focus of attention. When this state is really cultivated, the intensity of the pleasure of this state can become pretty much as strong as you can stand it. Again, this state is a fine attainment, but can be quite captivating. 
some may get stuck cultivating this again and again for some period of time ranging from days to years again the meditator also has the option to try to go on to the third jhana or to investigate this state and begin the progress of insight paying careful attention to completely deconstructing the state into its moment-to-moment -moment components the third jhana if the meditator decides to go on to the third jhana then just cultivating the second state more deeply and noticing that the rapture or emotional wow factor of that state eventually becomes annoying can cause the mind to eventually abandon this state and shift into the third jhana in this state the rapture drops away and what is left is more cool bodily bliss and equanimity with a lot of mindfulness of what is going on it must be noted that it is possible to be so deeply into any jhana even the first jhana that the sense of the body is quite vague distorted or even entirely absent so this must be kept in mind when reading these descriptions attention is now in wide focus sort of like resting in the half of space that is in front of oneself the third jhana is like the counterpoint to the focus of attention of the second jhana in the second jhana wherever we look we see clearly whereas in the third jhana the wide periphery of our attention is clear and the center of our attention is murky this can be extremely confusing until one gets used to it and trying to stay with one object in the center in the third jhana will cause the meditator to miss what this state has to offer and teach moving from the second to the third jhana is like going from focusing on the doughnut hole to focusing on the outer edge of the doughnut except that now you are sitting in the center of the doughnut remember this when you get into descriptions of the dark night in the section on the stages of insight as the dark night has its foundation in the third jhana but adds the three characteristics focusing on the wide periphery is a more inclusive broader more sophisticated and complex kind of concentration than the first two jhanas like going from listening to elvis to listening to very complex dissonant jazz in its pure and simple spaciousness profound clarity balance and contentment the third jhana is even better than the second jhana there is no wonder that people can easily mistake these states for enlightenment as they seem to fit the description of what enlightenment might be like remember that enlightenment is not a mind state nor is it dependent on any condition of reality it does not come and go as these states do again from this state the meditator has a few options they can get stuck which definitely happens they can move on to the fourth jhana or they can investigate this state and begin the progress of insight this would require special attention to make sure that all of the specific sensations that make up peace equanimity bliss and spaciousness are clearly observed to raise and pass not satisfy and not be self or the property of self these qualities are not easy to let go of and so this can be difficult however upon leaving such a state the mind will still have a measure of the good qualities of the state this can be useful to inside practice if one is willing not to cling to such things this applies to the other states as well and this is why many teachers have their students master concentration states before they move on to inside practice on the other hand such states can be so intoxicating and such a stagnant dead end for those that become fooled by them that some teachers have their students avoid them like the plague until they have some very deep insights into the truth of things the fourth jhana as before if the practitioner wishes to go on to the fourth jhana then they must cultivate the third jhana and begin to pay attention to the fact that even the bodily bliss is somewhat irritating or noisy eventually the mind will abandon the third jhana and shift into the fourth jhana which is the height of equanimity this state is remarkable in its simple spaciousness and acceptance the extreme level of imperturbability would be astounding if there was not so much pronounced imperturbability this is by far the most restful of the first four jhanas the focus of attention is now largely panoramic and thus even saying focus here is a bit problematic in the first jhana the object was finally clear but static and solid in a way that we can stay with 
In the second jhana, the object begins showing itself, and some simple motion is allowed. In the third jhana, we go from the spot of attention to a wide circle of attention, and the motion gets more complex. So now we have two spatial dimensions and time. In the fourth jhana, things get three-dimensional, and mind-made objects such as visualizations take on a life of their own, becoming living, luminous, and transparent. The fourth jhana includes space and awareness in a way that the previous three do not. Mindfulness is considered to be perfected due to equanimity, though this factor does not stand out as in the third jhana. When we are really in this state, the basic sense we have of where our body is and what it looks like can get very vague or even vanish entirely, though this is less true if we are in this state with our eyes open. This is quite a high attainment, and can easily be confused with the goal of the spiritual life, though it very much isn't. From this state the practitioner has quite a number of options. They can get stuck, they can move on to the formless realms, they can cultivate what are described as psychic powers, or they can investigate this state and begin the progress of insight. When investigating this state, special attention must be absolutely given to the fact that the mirrored sensations that make up equanimity and spaciousness come and go moment to moment, do not satisfy or provide a permanent resting place, and are not self. Again, it is easy to get attached to the sensations that make up these high states, and so great precision and attention, as well as honesty, must be given to this if the practitioner chooses this option. Another alternative is to leave this state and then begin insight practice, as the qualities that this state writes on the mind linger for a short time, and this can be helpful if the practitioner does not cling to these benefits. The Psychic Powers As to the psychic powers, Siddhas in Pali, the texts list all kinds of special abilities that may be cultivated using the fourth jhana, or perhaps lower or higher jhanas as a base, and these are attained today. These may include all kinds of strange experiences, including full-blown and extremely realistic experiences of other realms that can seem quite magical and fall quite in line with what one might think of when one thinks of various psychic powers. Whether or not these are real is a question that I am happy to avoid, though these experiences can be so extremely vivid that they can seem more real than the real world. Much more interesting than the question of what is real is the question of what is causal, such as what leads to what. For example, we might decide that our dreams are not real, but we must admit that there are real-world consequences of having dreams. All this can be a slippery business, and the psychic powers generally don't turn out to be quite what they seem. As one of my friends once said, Yeah, I can fly, just not in this realm. Buyer beware, or proceed with care. On the other hand, it does seem to be possible through powerful intent, strong concentration ability, appreciation of interdependence and careful experimentation, to manipulate what we might call this world, as well as those in it, in very unusual and profound ways. Yes, I am referring to things such as telekinesis, mind control, reading other people's thoughts, pyromancy, on all of that. The more you get your concentration and insight trips together, and the more you look into the magical aspect of things, the more you will learn about what I call the magical laws of the universe and how to use your will to manipulate it. However, if you don't have your morality trip really together, and perhaps even if you do, I would be quite cautious about formally and consciously tapping into that sort of power. It is absolutely vital to remember that you will reap what you sow, and that like leads to like when considering the formal use of such power. Kind intention is absolutely essential, but even this is often not enough to keep us from screwing up when we give in to the temptation to formally manipulate the world in unusual ways. Power corrupts, as the old adage goes. Spiritual tradition across the board have a clear love-hate relationship to the powers, and if you begin playing around with them, you will come to understand why. The stories of the Buddha demonstrate clearly that he and those around him simultaneously found them extremely fascinating, occasionally useful, and often profound. 
They also found them dangerous, a sidetrack and abhorrent. Just as with any powerful energy, such as sexual energy, the powers tend to reveal our true colors, as it were. When playing around with the powers, I recommend careful attention to how we define real and the practical implications of our personal definition of real for our daily life. For instance, you might have just come back from a retreat where you were playing around with visualization abilities, and a few days later see a troop of radiant angels floating through the walls and into your living room where you are entertaining guests. This was your actual experience. Whether you choose to ignore them, give them lots of attention, mention them to your guests, get down on your knees and begin praying, or run screaming out the door, will have different implications for your actual life. These implications should be carefully considered when conducting yourself in the face of such experiences. On a side note, if you have learned to see angels, you will probably run into devils soon enough. As to the more manipulative powers, you might begin to get the sense that you can read the thoughts and emotions of others. Do you want to tell them this, or even act on these intuitive feelings on the assumption that they are correct? You might get the sense that you can manipulate the emotions or energetic states of others in ways that would be considered magical. Is this a good idea? There are no easy answers to some of the ethical and practical questions that can arise from the powers, but I would advise a high level of caution and restraint. Respect others' rights, and remember that actions done for other than compassionate reasons are likely to cause an ugly backlash. The experiences of the psychic powers can be infinitely fascinating, as anything you can imagine experiencing is possible. The powers can also lead to people getting really, really weird. If you want to get to know about your shadow side, this is one way to have a crash course. For instance, it might be very educational to have your relationship issues with your parents manifest as two large, slobbering demons who hurl flaming stuffed animals at you while you are traveling out of your body to the Grand Canyon. But it can often take lots of time and reflection to figure out how these sorts of experience make a practical difference in our lives. As one Burmese man once said to a friend of mine, My brother does concentration practice. You know, sometimes they go a little mad. He was talking about what can sometimes happen when people get into psychic powers. Remember, most of these experiences are sufficient grounds for a diagnosis of mental illness in the conventional medical world, particularly if they begin to interfere with love and work. So seek the guidance of those who simultaneously appear to be quite sane and functional, and who also know how to navigate skillfully in this territory. Finding these sorts of people is difficult, but well worth the effort. Also, playing around with visions and other extrasensory experiences, such as traveling out of body, by location, etc., can sometimes cause one to feel ungrounded, disconnected, otherworldly, and scattered for hours or even days afterwards, something I call a city hangover. Exercise focusing on anything physical can help as can heavy foods, orgasms, and simply not practicing for a while. Very strong insight practices with a focus on impermanence can also help to break up these experiences, but are not particularly grounding in and of themselves, and may often be otherwise. Strongly stated resolutions do not experience or use the powers can also be very helpful, such as simply saying out loud, I formally resolve that I will not experience or use these powers, name them here, until I formally resolve otherwise. I would suggest care and caution in dealing with all the visions and other supernormal or paranormal experiences which might arise in practice. The primary danger is taking them too seriously and thus assuming that they are more important than they really are. It may be a good idea to leave them until very late in one's practice, unless one has someone around to guide one through their skillful use, or unless someone is fairly balanced and has a good sense of humor about them. If not, they can very easily become further tools of our defilements, long psychedelic and manipulative tunnels to nowhere or destruction. I remember a letter I received from a friend who was supposed to be on an intensive insight meditation retreat, but had slipped into playing with these sorts of experiences. 
he was now fascinated by his ability to see spirit animals and other supernormal beings and was having regular conversations with some sort of low-level god that kept telling him that he was making excellent progress in his insight practice which was exactly what he wanted to hear however the fact that he was having stable visionary experiences and was buying into their content made it abundantly clear that he wasn't doing insight practices at all but was lost in and being fooled by these cetus you get the picture now don't get me wrong if one is looking for another way to address one's content and stuff visions of things like spirit animals can be very helpful the trick is not to mix up content and fundamental insight psychic powers can be used skillfully as well and there are whole traditions that use them as their primary path they can significantly broaden one's horizons and are so interesting that great depths of profoundly steady concentration can easily be developed they can increase the intensity of our mental process to such a high level that they become very easy to see as they are should we choose to do so they can also begin to blur the line between the mental and the physical in ways that can be both disorienting and profound when we start playing around with intentions extended sensate realities and energetic phenomena it can seem as if there are two worlds or fields of experience that interpenetrate each other the ordinary one the real world and the magical one second attention astral plane spirit world etc integrating these two perspectives into one causal field without artificial dualities or boundaries is quite a project one with the potential to lead to very high levels of realization or to madness it is the high stakes way to play the game but unfortunately seems to be largely unavoidable past a certain point the experiences of the powers can help people live in the world in a way that is at once appreciative of its richness and yet not overly serious about it or fixated on it at their best they can serve as a basis for a very deep exploration of sides of ourselves that we rarely see with such clarity particularly the territory detailed by the likes of young and the shamanic traditions occasionally such experiences can bring profound epiphanies sometimes when we see our issues and shadow sides so clearly that our lives are definitely transformed for the better while this next point might sound a bit radical there are good reasons to assume that we are all acting at what might be considered a magical level all the time and just doing it with little awareness of that fact the best argument i know of for learning how to work at the level of the powers is to bring consciousness and compassion to a process that is happening already said another way as we are already casting spells all the time actually any time there is awareness and intent we might as well learn to do it well on the other hand playing around with sidis can bring up really screwed up stuff from our subconscious that we are just not ready or able to handle skillfully causing city bleed through into our lives that is simply unhelpful and very hard to integrate actually when playing around with any meditative technology there is no free lunch you always end up being forced to face some further challenge having to do with personal or spiritual growth either then or shortly thereafter there doesn't seem to be any getting around this if you want to cultivate the sidis one must generally attain very hard jhanic states with the specific intention to attain these experiences though they can and often do arise spontaneously as well the visuddhimagga and the vimuddhimagga less encyclopedic and harder to find but much more readable both spell out how to attain psychic powers in great depth and detail you could also check out bahante gunaratanta's excellent work the path of serenity and insight simply follow the directions and explore as they are as accurate as it gets one should also see sutta two the fruits of the homeless life in the long discourses of the buddha for more information on all of the concentration states and psychic powers while magical or mythical thinking is generally very helpful on the spiritual path it must be admitted that it is the only kind of thinking that can make much sense of these sorts of experiences however know when to turn it on and when to shut it off if you are doing jungian psychotherapy shamanic pathworking 
working up the tree of life or through the tarot or similar work think as magically and mythically as you wish it might actually be very helpful if you are trying to do most other things don't while the theravada buddhism clearly states how to obtain the psychic powers it does not say much about how to use them the benefits of them or their dangers tantra and many other traditions such as some of shamanic traditions do a much better job of dealing with these one might also check out the later writings of carlos castaneda when he was not so fascinated with hallucinogens such as the art of dreaming go to an ashram that focuses on these aspects of spiritual training or check out traditions such as ceremonial magic wicca thelema the golden dawn note i will use the word magic with a k at times due to being influenced by this and related traditions as they advocate making a distinction between show magic illusions based on mechanisms and sleight of hand and the territory of the powers or real magic donald michael craig's modern magic is a classic on the subject as are the works of alistair crowley opinions on crowley vary widely but buried in his frustrating works is gold that is hard to find elsewhere despite all his quirks and failings i have a deep appreciation for many aspects of his work and the depths of his dedication to making meditation and magic accessible it is also possible to use the experiences of the psychic powers particularly the visions and traveling out of body as a basis for insight practice by the standard method of bare sensate investigation with a focus on the three characteristics of those sensations as they arise out of extremely high levels of clarity and concentration these experiences can also be so otherworldly in content that our normal fixations and preoccupations may be left behind experiences of insight in these realms can be staggering and awesome they are not soon forgotten tantric visualization practices at their best make powerful use of this fact by definition if you have visualized a 3d intelligent entity that is doing its own thing you are in strong concentration in the fourth jhana and it is just a question of seeing the three characteristics of that to get some serious insight psychic powers can also arise spontaneously from insight practice particularly at stage four the arising and passing away and sometimes at stage eleven equanimity see progress of insight below while the fourth jhana is traditionally said to be the basis for the psychic powers simply getting so strongly into the first jhana that you can no longer perceive a body coupled with the previous intention to have these experiences can sometimes be sufficient to make them occur get really into the jhana leave it resolve to have these experiences and see what happens repeat as necessary if that doesn't work learn to visualize the colors white blue red and yellow clearly as stable experiences and then repeat the above instruction if that doesn't work find the rare teacher who will actually guide you into this esoteric territory remember find a good teacher before getting into this territory if all of that is not enough here is my best advice for working with the powers formally once you have enough concentration to get into hard fourth jhana with a range of objects and colors here's traditional buddhist magic 101 with some practical points thrown in one make the bases clean meaning bathe quietly and put on clean clothes this instruction helps but it is not necessary two find a suitable place to work meaning a place that is quiet and free of distractions if you can't find such a place or you feel compelled to do magic in less than optimal circumstances such as in public on the fly obviously skip this step three think the whole thing through before you proceed never ever skip this step if you can possibly help it this step not only helps to keep you from seriously screwing up it is actually part of the spell and a very important part of the setup essential things to include are a what you are asking for b how to phrase it or intend it being as specific as you possibly can c why you are asking for that particularly if there is some more fundamental desire you hope to fulfill that you should focus on while letting the less important specifics happen as they may d 
exactly who or what is involved, e, and every possible good and bad ramification of what you are about to do that you can possibly think of. Really take your time with this one, visualizing the whole thing out in time and space as far as it could possibly go. f. Note. If the ethics of what you are going to do feel at all strange in any part of your being, particularly your heart or gut, you probably need to go back up to the top and rethink the whole thing while looking at the problem from other points of view. 4. Rise from the first to the fourth jhana. Build up each one carefully and fully along the way so that you have a good foundation from which to work. Those who can access the formless realms, discussed shortly, might rise all the way through them as well. Then leave the fourth or eighth jhana and formally intend to make whatever you want to occur happen, which is to say, let the full energy of your attention fly without hesitation or restraint. If you are going to do this, make sure you commit to it, which is why the third step is so important. 5. Let it go and see what happens. One last warning on powers. Doing these things in private is one thing. Doing magical things in public that involve other people is something else entirely. If you do overt public magic or discreet public magic, you are bound to run into someone else's paradigms, values, and set of beliefs about how the world is and what is possible and what are not in alignment with your own. The potential for bad reactions from others is very real for a large number of reasons. Consider the long, strange relationship between the Western mainstream point of view and everything from witchcraft to crime-solving psychics. In short, if you do formal magic and anyone else finds out about it or thinks they were affected by it, be ready for the possibility of serious backlash and fallout. The formless realms are the last option one can follow from the fourth jhana, and they can definitely be very useful for putting things into perspective and sorting out a few details about awareness. As will be mentioned below, before I go into the formless realms, I will digress for just a moment to a brief and belated discussion of No Self versus True Self. Section 10 No Self versus True Self this is one of those questions that tends to arise when Hinduism or Christianity come in contact with Buddhism. However, perhaps it should arise more when Buddhism is thinking about itself. I include this discussion here because it addresses some points that are useful for later and previous discussions. True self and no self are actually talking about the same thing, just from different perspectives. Each can be useful, but each is an extreme. Truly, the truth is a middle way between these, and is indescribable, but I will try to explain it anyway, in the hope that it may support actual practice. It may seem odd to put a chapter that deals with the fruits of insight practices in the middle of descriptions of the Samantha Janus, but hopefully when you listen to the next chapter, you will understand why it falls where it does. For all of you intellectuals out there, the way in which this chapter is most likely to support practice is to be completely incomprehensible and thus useless. Ironically, I have tried to make this chapter very clear, and in doing so have crafted a mess of paradoxes. In one of his plays, Shakespeare puts philosophers on par with lawyers. In terms of insight practice, a lawyer, who is terrible at insight practices but who tries to do them anyway, is vastly superior to a world-class philosopher who is merely an intellectual master of this theory but practices not at all. Remember that spiritual life is something you do and hopefully understand, but not some doctrine to believe. Those of you who are interested in the formal Buddhist dogmatic anti-dogma should check out the particularly profound Sutta One, the root of all things, in the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, as well as Sutta One, the supreme net, what the teaching is not, in the long discourses of Buddha. Again, realize that all of this language is basically useless in the end, and prone to not making much sense. Only examination of our reality will help us to actually directly understand this. 
but it will not be in a way accessible to the rational mind. Nothing in the content of our thoughts can really explain the experience of the understanding I am about to point to, though there is something in the direct experience of those thoughts that might reveal it. Everything that I am about to try to explain here can become a great entangling net of useless views without direct insight. Many of the juvenile and tedious disputes between the various insight traditions result from fixation on these concepts and inappropriate adherence to only one side of these apparent paradoxes. Not surprisingly, these disputes between insight traditions generally arise from those with little or no insight. One clear mark of the development of true insight is that these paradoxes lose their power to confuse and obscure. They become tools for balanced inquiry and instruction, beautiful poetry, imitations of the heart of the spiritual life, and of one's own direct and non-conceptual experience of it. No self-teachings directly counter the sense that there is a separate watcher, and that this watcher is an I that is in control, observing reality or subject to the tribulations of the world. Truly, this is a useful illusion to counter. However, if misunderstood, this teaching can produce a shadow side that reeks of nihilism, disengagement with life, and denial. People can get all fixated on eliminating a self, when the emphasis is supposed to be on the words, separate and permanent, as well as on the illusion that is being created. A better way to say this would be, stopping the process of mentally creating the illusion of a separate self from sensations that are inherently non-dual, utterly transient and thus empty of any separate, permanent self. Even if you get extremely enlightened, you will still be here from a conventional point of view, but you will also be just an interdependent and intimate part of this utterly transient universe, just as you actually always have been. A huge and yet subtle difference is that this will be known directly and clearly. The language eliminating your ego is similarly misunderstood most of the time. You see, there are physical phenomena and mental phenomena, as well as the consciousness or mental echo of these, which is also in the category of mental phenomena. These are just phenomena, and all phenomena are not a permanent separate self, as they all change and are ultimately interdependent. They are simply aware, as in manifest, where they are without any observer of them at all. The boundaries that seem to differentiate self from not-self are arbitrary and conceptual, such as not the true nature of things. Said another way, reality is intimately interdependent and non-dual, like a great ocean. There is also awareness, but awareness is not a thing or localized in a particular place. So to even say, there is also awareness, is already a tremendous problem, as it implies separateness and existence where none can be found. To be really philosophically correct about it, borrowing heavily from Nagarjuna, awareness cannot be said to fit any of the following descriptions. That it exists, that it does not exist, that it both exists and does not exist, that it neither exists nor doesn't exist. Just so, in truth, it cannot be said that we are awareness, that we are not awareness, that we are both awareness and not awareness, or even that we are neither awareness nor not awareness. We could go through the same pattern with whether or not phenomena are intrinsically luminous. For the sake of discussion, and in keeping with the standard Buddhist thought, awareness is permanent and unchanging. It is also said that all things arise from it, and all things return to it. Though again, this implies a false certainty about something which is actually impenetrably mysterious and mixing the concept of infinite potential with awareness is a notoriously dangerous business. We could call it God, Nirvana, the Tao, the Void, Allah, Krishna, intrinsic luminosity, Buddha nature, Buddha, Baba, or just awareness, as long as we realize the above caveats, especially that it is not a thing or localized in any particular place, and has no definable qualities. Awareness is sometimes conceptualized as pervading all of this while not being all of this. 
and sometimes conceptualized as being inherent in all of this while not being anything in particular neither is quite true though both perspectives can be useful if you find yourself adopting any fixed idea about what we are calling awareness here try also adopting its logical opposite to try to achieve some sense of direct inquisitive paradoxical imbalance that shakes fixed views about this stuff and points to something beyond these limited concepts this is incredibly useful advice for dealing with all teachings about ultimate reality i would also recommend looking into the true nature of the sensations that make up philosophical speculation and all sensations of questioning while phenomena are in flux from their arising to their passing there is awareness of them thus awareness is not these objects as it is not a thing nor is it separate from these objects as there would be no experience if this were so by determining our reality just as it is we may come to understand this further phenomena do not exist in the sense of abiding in a fixed way for any length of time and thus are utterly transitory and yet the laws that govern the functioning of this utter transience hold that phenomena do not exist does not mean that there is not a reality but that this reality is completely inconstant except for awareness which is not a thing this makes no sense to the rational mind but that is how it is with this stuff one teaching that comes out of the theravada that can be helpful is that there are three ultimate dharmas or ultimate aspects of reality materiality the sensations of the first five sense doors mentality all mental sensations and nirvana though they would call it nibbana which is the poly equivalent of the sanskrit in short this is actually it and that which is beyond this is also it notice that awareness is definitely not on this list it might be conceptualized as being all three from a true self point of view or quickly disregarded as being a useless concept that solidifies a sense of separate or localized watcher from the no self point of view buddhism also contains a strangely large number of true self teachings though if you told most buddhists this they would give you a good scolding many of these have their origins in hindu vedanta and hindu tantra all the talk of buddha nature the bodhisattva vow and that sort of thing are true self teachings true self teachings point out that this awareness is who we are but it isn't a thing so it is not self they also point out that we actually are all these phenomena rather than all these phenomena being seen as something observed and thus not self which they are also as they are utterly transit and not awareness this teaching can help practitioners actually examine their reality just as it is and sort of inhabit it in an honest and realistic way or it can cause them to cling to things as self if they misunderstand this teaching i will try again you see as all phenomena are observed they cannot possibly be the observer thus the observer which is awareness and not any of the phenomena pretending to be it cannot possibly be a phenomenon and thus is not localized and doesn't exist this is no self however all of these phenomena are actually us from the point of view of non-duality and interconnectedness as the illusion of duality is just an illusion when the illusion of duality permanently collapses in final awakening all that is left is all of these phenomena which is true self such as the lack of a separate self and thus just all of this as it is remember however that no phenomena abide for even an instant and are so empty of permanent abiding and thus of stable existence this all brings me to one of my favorite words non-dual a word that means both duality and unity fail to clearly describe ultimate reality as awareness is in some way separate from and unaffected by phenomena we can say that that unity is the true answer unitive experiences arise out of strong concentration and can easily fool people into thinking they are the final answer they are not that said it is because awareness is not a phenomena thing or localized in any place that you can't say that duality is true a duality implies something on both sides an observer and an observed 
however there is no phenomenal observer so duality does not hold up under careful investigation until we have a lot of fundamental insight the sense that duality is true can be very compelling and can cause all sorts of trouble we extrapolate false dualities from sensations until we are very highly enlightened thus the word non-dual is an inherently paradoxical term one that confounds reason and even our current experience of reality if we accept the working hypothesis that non-duality is true then we will be able to continue to reject both unitive and dualistic experiences as the true answer and continue to work towards awakening this is probably the most practical application of discussions of no self and true self no self and true self are really just two sides of the same coin there is a great little poem by one kalu rimpush that goes something like we live in illusion and the appearance of things there is a reality we are that reality when you understand this you will see that you are nothing and being nothing you are everything that is all there are many fine poems on similar things presented in soigal rimpushi's the tibetan book of living and dying it is because we are none of this that freedom is possible it is because we are all of this that compassionate action for all beings and ourselves is so important to truly understand this moment is to truly understand both which is the middle way between these two extremes see nisar gadatas i am that for a very down-to-earth discussion of these issues while only insight practices will accomplish this there are some concentration attainments the last four jhanas or formless realms that can really help put things in proper perspective though they do not directly cause deep insights and awakening unless the true nature of the sensations that make them up is understood the formless realms the formless realms never fail to impress and amaze they can also be taken to be much more significant than they really are the trick is to come into a balanced understanding of what they are and what they aren't what they are useful for and what they do not accomplish this is not always easy boundless space the fifth jhana to attain this state one simply continues to cultivate the fourth jhana and begins not to pay attention to the objects in the meditation space but gently to space itself how big is reality turning into the panoramic quality of attention itself when the fourth jhana can be very helpful this is quite a fine line but it can definitely be done forms then slip away like ghosts into thin air and the mind turns to boundless space the fifth jhana as the object of concentration this jhana is often called infinite space as the next one is often called infinite consciousness but i prefer the word boundless because it is much closer to the actual experience of these stages people imagine that they might simultaneously perceive the whole of space but what actually happens is that the perceptual boundaries drop away and a very unitive openness prevails this open quality itself becomes the primary focus rather than what is unified in that openness this aspect was already present in the fourth jhana but now it comes to the fore the same is true of the next formless realm this is not necessarily as perfectly clean as it sounds depending on how solidly one is in this state but it still is quite spectacular when this state is really cultivated all or most images and sense of body are gone and almost all of what is left is vastness there is still thought and the illusion of a separate self for example duality but the mind is extremely quiet and the duality subtle the equanimity from the fourth jhana remains as the formless realms use this state as their foundation sounds might still be noticeable depending on the depth of the state Note that if one attains this state while meditating with the eyes open it may have a very different quality to it than if the eyes are closed from this state the meditator has a few options they can get stuck which may be more likely if they are incorrectly practicing non-dual formless practices such as tsogchen by fixating too much on the phrase space-like awareness they can also either go on to the next formless realm boundless consciousness or investigate this state and thus begin the progress of insight 
If this last option is chosen, special care and extreme precision must be given to each and every instant that the many sensations make up the perception of space. Silence or equanimity are perceived so as to see each of these experiences arise and pass completely in each instant, not satisfy and not be self. It may seem odd to think of sensations of space arising and passing away each instant, but space is a conditioned aspect of relative reality, and is thus impermanent like all other aspects of experiential reality. This can be an important attainment, as it clarifies that awareness, that non-thing that is often described as space-like, is actually not even space, though it is not separate from space, as in the chapter No Self versus True Self. There are few things quite as odd, profound, and possibly disconcerting as investigating the first three formless realms and perceiving them strobe in and out of existence. But this is powerful practice and a very valuable and high attainment. Again, this state may be left and insight practice is begun with the benefits of the residue of this state calming, opening, and stabilizing the mind for a short time after it ends. Boundless Consciousness, the Sixth Jhana. If the meditator wishes to go further into the formless realms, then they should continue to cultivate attention to boundless space and begin to notice that they are conscious of all of it, and thus space is filled with consciousness. At some point the mind will abandon boundless space and shift to perceiving boundless consciousness, the Sixth Jhana. This can feel outrageously unitive, as consciousness seems to fill the whole universe. Space becomes luminous, and this can be confused with descriptions of the fundamental luminosity of awareness and with non-duality, though this is definitely not the attainment of the understanding of those. Again, equanimity prevails. This state has a sense of presence to it that boundless space doesn't. It is also a great staging ground for exploration of the psychic powers. From here, the meditator has various options. They can get stuck, which can happen fairly easily if they are mistaking Dzogchen or other non-dual formless practices for meditation on the concentration object of boundless consciousness, again due to misunderstanding or overemphasizing the phrase space-like awareness. They can also go on to cultivate the next formless realm, nothingness or they can investigate boundless consciousness and then begin the progress of insight. For this last option, extremely careful attention must be given to each moment that the sensations make up the perceptions of consciousness, vastness or equanimity arise and pass away. Great precision must be given to the fact that these sensations do not satisfy and cannot be self or imply a separate self. Because of how fundamentally disconcerting or unsatisfactory it can be to have the three illusions shattered at this level of clarity and simplicity, this is not an easy practice, but it can be very powerful. It is actually much more likely that such insights into the true nature of the first three formless realms will arise spontaneously due to previous skillful insight practices. Again, Experiencing boundless consciousness strobing in and out of reality can be profoundly helpful in convincing us that even boundless consciousness that fills the vastness of space is not awareness, though awareness cannot be said to be separate from consciousness. What is observing boundless consciousness strobe in and out of reality? Now there's a question, perhaps the question. Nothingness, the seventh jhana. If the meditator wishes to attain the next formless realm, that of nothingness, they simply cultivate the jhana of boundless consciousness and disenchant themselves with the vastness and luminosity of that state. Eventually, the mind will abandon these and shift to the jhana of nothingness. To imagine this state, imagine space with all of the lights completely out, so that there is no vastness and almost no sensations other than those of nothingness. It is almost as though attention is out of phase with nearly all phenomena except those that imply nothingness. They are still there somewhere, but they are not being attended to. This jhana is different from the previous two formless realms in that they are quite present to reality in some way, and panoramic in perspective, where nothingness is more turned away from phenomena and perhaps more focused in some way. There is, however, some very subtle thought, and some extremely subtle sense of a separate self. 
note well nothingness is absolutely not emptiness though it is empty but this is not the attainment of this understanding however one can easily be convinced that this is emptiness due to the extreme profundity of it as before this jhana can have different degrees of intensity to it even when one is not strongly in it there is a sense of being out of phase with reality like being disassociated reality is there but you have tuned it out on your radio note well this is very different from just being tuned out in the colloquial sense while equanimity prevails this state can be a bit scary at first and this can cause some instability of this state now even consciousness and space are basically gone however there is still awareness of this state indicating that there can be awareness that is not particularly consciousness or space this really helps debunk the sense that awareness is consciousness or space or even a thing that we are our body etc that said it is not nothingness either nothingness may be perceived whereas awareness may not from this state the mind may get stuck but this is not quite as likely as with the first two formless states as this state is quite refined but not as breathtaking as the first two in some ways the meditator may then try to move to the next jhana or may investigate this state it may seem incredible that the sensations of nothingness itself could be observed to arise and pass strobe in and out of reality or that they could be known to not satisfy or not be self however this is definitely possible if potentially quite disconcerting due to its extreme profundity and ability to really kick some sense into the mind about the truth of things it also helps debunk the false idea that the void or awareness is nothingness it is not even this remember no sensation can observe another so anything you can think of cannot be said to be awareness by simply paying close attention to every instant that nothingness or equanimity is perceived and with precise attention to the exact arising and passing of each of these that these transient moments do not satisfy and that these neither can impute nor can be a separate self the three illusions can begin to be penetrated in the highest state in which this can be accomplished as this is a particularly subtle business the meditator may also leave the jhana and begin insight practice in the afterglow of this state as before strobing sensations of nothingness are more likely to arise during the progress of insight in the stage called high equanimity for those with very strong concentration skills neither perception nor yet non-perception the eighth jhana if the meditator wishes to attain the next jhana they simply hang out in nothingness until they get bored with perception entirely and understand that even perception is somehow disconcerting thus the mind will eventually shift on its own to the state with the perplexing but thoroughly appropriate title of neither perception nor yet non-perception hereafter the eighth jhana for the sake of brevity this state is largely incomprehensible but it is absolutely not emptiness it is empty but this is not the attainment of that understanding the eighth jhana may very easily be confused as being emptiness especially if it is attained through insight practices remember that insight practices can simultaneously cultivate concentration and wisdom there is no reasonable way to attempt to describe this state save for that it is a mind state and thus is not emptiness as emptiness is not a mind state or anything else for that matter i am tempted to say that one is simultaneously focused so narrowly that one notices nothing and yet so broadly that one doesn't notice even that but such a description doesn't quite do this state justice one way or the other there is complete inattention to diversity the eighth jhana is the highest of the states of concentration that can be attained ignoring the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling it is not possible to investigate this state as it is too incomprehensible thus as this state ends the meditator may return to lower states or turn to insight practice in the afterglow of this state it should also be noted that in contrast to the previous seven jhanas the issue of hard or soft jhana that relates to how solidly one is in a state does not apply to the eighth jhana you are either in it or you are not 
the eighth jahana may have a certain stability that nothingness doesn't due to the inability to make sense of it thus the mind may move fairly quickly from boundless consciousness through nothingness and drop into the eighth jahana for a while though the vaguest hint of attention to anything specific demolishes this state instantly it is also possible to sort of drift up and down through the various formless realms and shifting back down to the lower johannes after being up in the higher johannes such as this one can lend a great deal of intensity to them there are some higher johannes that can be attained by beings with moderate to high levels of realization and i will discuss these in the appendix but for the moment and for most people the listing of the eight johannes is a good working model the eighth johannes can be sorted out from the attainment of emptiness by the number of signs having to do with the way the entrance to the state presents itself such as not being one of the three doors and thus not relating to the rapid and clear presentation of one of the three characteristics three or four times in quick succession what may come before this for example the stages of insight and the fact that there is still some subtle sense of a state and thus relative reality just to drive this point home an important feature of concentration practices is that they are not liberating in and of themselves even the highest of these states ends the afterglow from them does not last that long and regular reality might even seem like a bit of an assault when it is gone however jahana junkies still abound and many have no idea that this is what they have become i have a good friend who has been lost in the formless realms for over twenty years attaining them again and again in his practice rationalizing that he is doing dzogchen practice a type of insight practice when he is just sitting between the fourth and sixth johannes rationalizing that the last two formless realms are emptiness and rationalizing that he is enlightened it is a true dharma tragedy unfortunately as another good friend of mine rightly pointed out it is very hard to reach such people after a while they get tangled in golden chains so beautiful that they have no idea they are even in prison nor do they tend to take kindly to suggestions that this may be so particularly if their identity has become so bound up in their false notion that they are a realized being chronic jahana junkies are fairly easy to identify even though they often imagine that they are not i have no problem with people becoming jahana junkies as we are all presumably able to take responsibility for our choices in life however when people don't realize that this is what they have become and pretend that what they are doing has something to do with insight practices that's annoying and sad try to differentiate clearly between concentration practice and insight practice i will now give a detailed description of the stages of insight so that the contrast will be clear as possible pay careful attention to how different these descriptions are from those of the pure concentration states the progress of insight the progress of insight is a set of stages that diligent meditators pass through on the path of insight some of the content-based or psychological insights into ourselves can be interesting and helpful but when i say insight these stages are what i'm talking about names of stages of insight in order are one mind and body two cause and effect three the three characteristics these are found in the first jahana four arising and passing away the second jahana five dissolution the foregoing are the pre-vipassana stages six fear seven misery eight disgust nine desire for deliverance ten reobservation these are the dark night and the third jahana in the dark night and the fourth jahana are eleven equanimity twelve conformity thirteen change of lineage fourteen path in nirvana and also part of the fourth jhana are fifteen fruition sixteen review i will give detailed descriptions of them shortly i will refer to these stages by their shortened titles their numbers and occasionally shorthand slang these are formally known as knowledge of and then the stage such as knowledge of mind and body but i will just use the part after the of they are also called jnanas which means knowledges usually with a number 
as in the first jnana. Notice that I used the word stage rather than state. These are stages of heightened perception into the truth of things, opportunities to see directly how things actually are, but they are not seemingly stable states as with concentration practice. The jhanic groupings refer to the vipassana jhanas, which will be covered in more depth later, but they borrow their perspectives and certain fundamental aspects from their samantha jhana equivalents. In other ways, they may diverge widely from the experience of pure samantha jhanas. One of the most profound things about these stages is that they are strangely predictable regardless of the practitioner or the inside tradition. Texts two thousand years old describe the stages just the way people go through them today, though there will be some individual variation on some of the particulars today as then. The Christian maps, the Sufi maps, the Buddhist maps of the Tibetans and the Theravada, and the maps of the Kabbalists and Hindus are all remarkably consistent in their fundamentals. I chanced into these classic experiences before I had any training in meditation, and I have met a large number of people who have done likewise. These maps, Buddhist or otherwise, are talking about something inherent in how our minds progress in fundamental wisdom that has little to do with any tradition and lots to do with the mysteries of the human mind and body. These are describing basic human development. These stages are not Buddhist but universal, and Buddhism is merely one of the traditions that describes them, albeit unusually well. The progress of insight is discussed in a good number of books, such as Jack Cornfield's A Path with Heart, in the section called Dissolving the Self, which I highly recommend. A very extensive, thorough, accessible, and highly recommended treatment of it is given in Mahashi Sayada's works The Progress of Insight and Practical Insight Meditation, a partially castrated version of which appears in Jack Cornfield's Living Dharma. It should be noted here that Practical Insight Meditation is my favorite Dharma book of all time, with no close competitors. If you can ever lay your hands on a copy, do so. Even the section of it that appears in Living Dharma is much better than having access to none of it at all. Sayada Upanditas in this very life also covers this territory, and is a bit of a must-have for those who like lists and straight-up Theravada, but he leaves out a lot of juicy details. The Visuddhimagga, a 5th century text by Buddhaghosa, also does a nice treatment of these stages, and contains some interesting and hard-to-find information. It focuses largely on the emotional side effects and thus misses many useful points. Another good but brief map appears in Ven Kempo Karthar's Renpusha's Dharma Paths. You could also check out Bhante Gunaratana's The Path of Serenity and Insight if you would like to know the dogma as well. It is a thorough and scholarly work. Matthew Flickenstein's Swallowing the River Ganges is a light treatment of the basic Buddhist concepts and contains a very superficial treatment of the stages of insight. It's kind of like what would happen if you condensed a medical school textbook down to a fifth-grade science text. It focuses almost entirely on the emotional side effects and thus misses a huge amount that is worthy of discussion, but it comes from a good place and is harmless enough. It doesn't add anything to the above sources, but is easy to read. There are many less accessible maps of insight as well. The Tibetan Book of the Dead, Liberation Through Hearing in the Bardo, requires some prior familiarity with this territory to sort out the wild symbolic imagery. A 12th century Sufi map is given in Journey to the Lord of Power by Ibn Arabi, but again, the medieval symbolism is somewhat hard to untangle, unless you are already personally familiar with these stages. It also provides a very interesting, if quite cryptic, description of the higher stages of realization. St. John of the Cross, the Dark Knight of the Soul, does a good job of dealing with the most difficult of the insight stages. His map is called the Ladder of Love. Unfortunately, the translation of the medieval Spanish and thickness of complex Catholic dogma make it fairly inaccessible. I strongly recommend that you consult some of these other sources, particularly the first five mentioned. While I consider the treatment of the stages of insight that follow shortly to be by far the most comprehensive and practical explanation of the stages of insight ever written, and I mean that honestly, 
There are still lots of great points made in those books, and you should check them out. There is a huge amount of valuable information left out in all of these sources, perhaps due to the mushroom factor, but perhaps due also to some of the difficulties in describing all the little nuances of the subject in all its possible variations. Thus, working with a teacher who has a personal mastery of these stages, regardless of what they call them, is an extremely good idea most of the time. The model terminology I'm using is from the ancient commentaries from the Pali Canon of the Theravada tradition. This model is used mostly in Burma, but is also used to some degree in the other Theravada traditions. Zen is quite aware of these stages, as all Zen masters had to go through them and continue to do so, but they tend not to name them or talk about them, as is their typical style. This can be helpful, as people can get all obsessed with these maps, turning them into a new form of useless content and a source of imprisoning identification and competition. This is the ugly shadow side of goal-oriented or map-based practice, but it often, though not always, may be overcome with honest awareness of this fact. That said, Zen's persistent lack of attention to them can cause other problems, and some balance between intentionally ignoring them and obsessing over them works better than either extreme. Luckily, if the meditator really is into insight territory, continued correct practice has a way of making things happen given time. Also, when the proverbial stuff is hitting the fan, having a map around can really help the meditator not to make too many of the common and tempting mistakes of that stage as well as provide the meditator with faith that they are on the right track when they hit the hard or weird stages. These stages can significantly color or skew a meditator's view of their life until they master them, and it can be very helpful to remember this when trying to navigate this territory and keep one's job and relationships functioning. Those who do not have the benefit of the maps in these situations, or those who choose to ignore them, are much more easily blindsided by the psychological extremes and challenges, which may sometimes accompany stages such as the arising and the passing away, and those of the dark night. While many people don't want to know the maps for various reasons, such as their own unexamined insecurities, I suspect that many more people could get a lot farther in their practice if they did know them. At the very least, the maps clearly demonstrate that there is vastly more to all of this than just philosophy or psychology. They also clearly and unambiguously point to how the game is played step by step and stage by stage, what one is looking for, and more importantly, why, and give guidelines for how to avoid screwing up along the way. Why people wouldn't want to know these things is completely beyond me. They fill in the juicy details of the seemingly vast gap from doing some seemingly boring and simple practice to getting enlightened. Further, providing all of this extremely precise information on exactly what to do puts the responsibility for progress, or lack thereof, clearly on the meditator, you, which is exactly where it should be. If after reading this book you don't put this extremely powerful information into practice, the fault is your own. There is considerable evidence that lack of this information in insight traditions that don't use the maps has been one of the primary obstacles to progress. On the other hand, the maps can sometimes cause furious competition and arrogance in the traditions that do use them, as well as harmful fixation on purely future-oriented goals. Please do your very best to avoid these sorts of problems. The more intense, consistent, and precise the practice, the easier it is to see how the maps apply. The more energy, focus, and consistency is put into practice, the more dramatic and even outrageous these stages can be. If these stages unfold over long periods of time and gently, it can be more difficult to see the progression through them, though it does happen regardless. Certain emphasis in practice, such as Mahasi, Sayadaw style noting practice, particularly on intensive retreats, seem to produce a clearer appreciation of the maps, and some individuals will have an easier time seeing how these maps apply than others will. Each stage is marked by very specific increases in our perceptual abilities. The basic areas we can improve are in clarity, precision, speed, consistency, inclusiveness, and acceptance. 
it is these improvements in our perceptual abilities that are the hallmarks of each stage and the gold standard by which they are defined and known each stage also tends to bring up mental and physical raptures unusual manifestations these are fairly predictable at each stage and sometimes very unique to each stage they are secondary to the increase in perceptual thresholds of ways by which we may judge whether or not we are in a particular stage each stage also tends to bring up specific aspects of our emotional and psychological makeup these are also strangely predictable but these are not as reliable for determining which stage is occurring they are suggestible ordinary and will show more variation from person to person however when used in conjunction with the changes in perceptual threshold and the raptures they can help us get a clearer sense of which stage has been attained further these stages occur in a very predictable order and so looking for a pattern of stages leading one to the next can help us get a sense of what is going on thus when reading my descriptions of these stages pay attention to these separate aspects the shift in perceptual threshold the physical and mental raptures the emotional and psychological tendencies and the overall pattern of how that stage fits with the rest so the meditator sits down or lies down stands etc and begins to try to experience each and every sensation clearly as it is when the meditator gains enough concentration to steady the mind on the object of meditation something called access concentration they may enter the first jhana now called the first vipassana jhana which is in some ways the same for both concentration practice and insight practice at the beginning however as they have been practicing insight meditation they are not trying to solidify this state but are trying to penetrate the three illusions by understanding the three characteristics they have been trying to sort out with mindfulness what is body and what is mind and when each is and isn't there they have been trying to be clear about the actual sensations that make up their world just as they are they have been trying to directly understand the three characteristics moment to moment in whatever sensations arise be it in a restricted area of space such as the area of the sensations of breathing a moving area of space body scanning practices in the whole of their world as is done in choiceless awareness practices using some other technique or object or just by being alive and paying attention thus this first stage has a different quality to it from that of concentration practice and they attain to direct and clear perception of the first knowledge of one mind and body there is this sudden shift and mental phenomena shift out away from the illusory sense of the watcher and are just out there in the world with the sensations of the other five sense doors this is an important insight as it shows us clearly and directly that we are not our mind or our body it is also a really nice clear and unitive feeling state it really is still more state-like than stage-like, and people can try to hold on to it just as with the first jhana and get stuck. Reality can seem just a bit more brilliant the first time one chances into mind and body. We may feel more alive and connected to the world. For some, it may hit with unusual force, filling them with a great sense of unity or universal consciousness. For others, it may not seem very profound with the sensate experience of both mental and physical phenomena being clearly observable the relationships and interactions between the two begin to become obvious what is meant by the dualistic split is very obvious during this stage somewhere around the first stage either just before it or shortly after it there may arise odd job pains on one side throat tensions and some other such unpleasant physical occurrences regardless it soon becomes easy to see that each sensation is followed by the crude mental impression of it and that intentions precede actions and thoughts thus we come to number two cause and effect in this stage the relationships between mental and physical phenomena become very clear and sometimes ratchet like the joy and wonder of mind and body have left and now the interactions between the mind and body become somewhat mechanical seeming motion such as walking or the breath may begin to get jerky as there is the intention and the motion the sensation and the mental impression of it the cause and the effect 
all occurring in a way which can seem sort of tight and robot-like. You note the breath moves just a bit. You stop noting, the breath stops. You note quickly, the breath jerks quickly. You note slowly, the breath follows. Some will stop noting quickly or stop noting at all, thinking that they are messing up the breath. The advice here is as before. Note quickly and don't worry about what the breath does. Remember how I recommended trying to experience one to ten sensations per second consistently, noting which were mental and which were physical? At this stage, the meditator is finally able to do this with a fair degree of skill, confidence, and consistency. Those with stronger concentration tendencies or bent toward such things may notice thoughts and perhaps even visions of insight into cause and effect on a macroscopic scale where past action or circumstances led to various consequences. Some event led to some rebirth. Some previous life led to something today, and in general may get a sense that they are able to intuit aspects of the workings of karma in a way they did not before. As the meditator becomes more clear about the beginnings and endings of each of these, about the irritation caused by this jerkiness and about the fact that all of this seems to be happening fairly on its own. They come to directly perceive for themselves the three characteristics. Section 11 3. The Three Characteristics the three characteristics of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and egolessness, or no-self, become predominant, which is good, as these are the fundamental basis for insight. Here it begins to become quite clear that these intentions and actions, sensations and the knowledge of them, and all of the constituents of this experience are quickly arising and passing, somewhat jarring, and not particularly in our control or us. Further, as these sensations are all observed, including the crude mental impression that follows them, consciousness, the whole of the mind and body process is not a separate self. It is merely a part of the interdependent world. These characteristics become clearer and clearer, as well as faster and faster, as the meditator diligently pays careful attention to exactly what is happening at each moment. For those doing noting practice, Somewhere around here your speed and precision may begin to get so fast that you cannot note every sensation you experience. Move to more general noting, monosyllabic noting, such as beep for each sensation experienced regardless of what it was, or drop the noting entirely and stay with noticing bare sensations that come and go. At this stage, practice begins to really take off despite the fact that this stage tends to be fairly unpleasant. This unpleasantness tends to be mostly physical, though this stage can also cause numerous dark feelings and a sense of wanting to renounce the world and practice. Occasionally, the early part of this stage can cause people to feel vulnerable, raw and irritable to a small or large degree in the ways that a migraine headache or a bad case of PMS can. I have occasionally been laid out on a couch for hours by this aspect of this stage holding my head and just wishing that these early stages didn't sometimes involve so much pain and anguish. There may be odd bodily twistings, obsession with posture and painful tensions, or strange other sensations, particularly in the back, neck, jaw, and shoulders. These tensions may persist when not meditating and be quite irritating and even debilitating. The rhomboid and trapezius muscles are the most common offenders. It is common to try to sit with good posture and then find one's body twisting into some odd and painful position. You straighten out, and soon enough it does it again. That's a very three-characteristics sort of pattern. People sometimes describe these feelings as some powerful energy that is blocked and seems to want to get out or move through. Feelings of heat and sensations, like those of a fever, may sometimes accompany this stage. One's neck and back may become very stiff, either on one or both sides. The right and left sides of one's body may feel quite different from each other sometimes. The easiest way to get these unpleasant physical manifestations to go away is to keep investigating the three characteristics, either of them or of whatever primary object you have chosen. 
These are common early retreat experiences, particularly in the first few days. Fighting them or trying other methods, such as back rubs, etc., seems to either help only a little, work only temporarily, or sometimes make them even worse, though sometimes hatha yoga and related practices done with a high degree of awareness can be helpful. This is a common time for people to go to health practitioners of various kinds, from orthopedists to dentists to chiropractors and body workers. For example, I had a wisdom tooth removed during one pass through this stage because I thought it was throwing my jaw out of alignment, and perhaps it was, but this was clearly exasperated by this stage of practice. Even if these unpleasant physical manifestations do slack off for a bit, they are likely to keep coming back until one's insight is sufficient to progress beyond this part of this stage. Thus, should one find such things interfering with one's life, I recommend continued, precise, and accepting practice. This is the phase of practice when strong effort and very quick investigation really pay off. Certain traditions may look at such physical manifestations as energy imbalances or in some other negative light, and I can see where they're coming from, but I find those perspectives limiting. Rather, I see this stage in its broader context as just one more phase of practice. Others may invent very strange stories to explain these experiences. A friend of mine ran into this jnana on retreat, found it very unpleasant, stopped practicing, and began to spin out all sorts of fantastic stories in her head about how the poor fellow sitting next to her was very angry and how it was making her tense. This didn't help whatsoever, and she got stuck there. I have learned to welcome these odd manifestations as clearly recognizable markers of progress on the path. They are clear objects for practice and reassure me that I am on the right track. Unfortunately, this is a hard lesson to teach others. True, these manifestations can suck, but being able to appreciate what is happening in the face of the difficult stages is important and becomes much more important later on. As the mind gains speed at really seeing each of the sensations of the mind and body come and go, the jerkiness from cause and effect can get quite rapid and pronounced. These physical movements and spasms seem to help break up the physical tension that may sometimes accompany this stage and are a sign of progress. 4. The Arising and Passing Away This is also the beginning of the second Vispasana Jhana. As in the second Samitha Jhana, the applied and sustained effort or attention begin to drop away, and meditation can seem to take on a life of its own. An overall general point about this stage is that it tends to be very impressive. When people say to me, I had this big experience, 99% of the time it is almost certainly related to this stage. The description I give of it may not line up exactly with how it happens or happened for or to you but pay attention to the general aspects of the pattern. I tend to describe it as it happens on retreat and with strong practice going on, but it may happen off retreat, in daily life, without warning, in people who don't think of themselves as meditators and even in dreams. In the early part of this stage, the meditator's mind speeds up more and more quickly and reality begins to be perceived as particles or fine vibrations of mind and matter, each arising and vanishing utterly at tremendous speed. The traditional texts actually call this stage the beginning of insight practices, as from this point on there is as much more direct and non-conceptual understanding of the three characteristics. This stage is marked by dramatically increased perceptual abilities when compared with the previous stages. For example... One might be able to hone one's awareness to laser-like precision on the tip of one's little finger and seemingly be able to perceive the beginning and ending of every single sensation that made up that finger. Spontaneous physical movements and strange jerky breathing patterns that showed up in cause and effect and became more pronounced in the three characteristics may speed up significantly. This stage explains where many practices, such as Tibetan inner fire practices of the yogic breath of fire, come from. It can also reveal the source material that inspired teachings, such as those about chakras and energy channels. Many descriptions of Kundalini awakening are talking about this stage. Reality is perceived directly with great clarity and great bliss, rapture, equanimity, 
mindfulness, concentration, and other positive qualities arise. Practice is extremely profound and sustainable, and there may be no pain even after hours of sitting. Unfortunately, the positive qualities that have arisen can easily become what are called the ten corruptions of insight, if the true nature of the individual sensations by which they are known are not understood as well. And until this happens, a meditator can easily get stuck in the immature part of this stage. The ten corruptions of insight are illumination, knowledge, rapturous happiness, tranquility, bliss, resolute confidence, exertion, assurance, equanimity, and attachment. To quote the great meditation master, Sayada Upandita, from his great but very hard-to-find book on the path to freedom, as for the practicing yoga, he will at once recognize the above as imperfections of insight, not representing Dhamma breakthrough, but are only to be noted off. Remembering the teacher's advice as to what is path and what is not path, being disabled by the ten imperfections, you would not be capable of observing the triple characteristics in their true nature. But once freed from imperfections, he is able to do so. In short, they may feel that they are now a very mighty meditator, and that they should try to hold on to this forever, such as they stop actually doing insight practices and instead solidify these qualities as concentration practice objects. Thus the advice given about deconstructing and investigating the positive factors of the Samitha Jhanas, particularly the second one, is also very helpful when trying to stay on the narrow path of the progress of insight. Visions, unusual sensory abilities, such as seeing nearby things through one's closed eyelids, out-of-body experiences, and especially bright lights tend to arise to the meditator, sometimes first as a jewel-toned sparkles, and then as a bright white light. I have seen the light. The technical meditator may easily sit for hours, dissecting their reality into extremely fine and fast sensations and vibrations perhaps even up to forty per second or even more, with an extremely high level of precision and consistency, where the absurd and disheartening rumors of billions of mind moments per second come from is beyond me. Fine vibrations may spread over the body, revealing the interference patterns between experiences, enabling one to know directly that when one thing is experienced, in that instant, something else is not. It is very easy to confuse this stage with descriptions of stage 11, equanimity, especially as the stage before it, reobservation, has some distinct similarities to stage 3, the three characteristics. A brief discussion of the fractal nature of things that describes this will follow in the chapter called the Vipassana Jhanas. The big difference is that this stage is ruled by quick cycles, rapidly changing frequencies of vibrations, odd physical movements, strange breathing patterns, heady raptures, a decreased need for sleep, strong bliss, and a general sense of riding on a spiritual roller coaster with no brakes. The higher stages, 10 and 11, do not have those qualities. As to the cycles, they tend to proceed as follows, with this description assuming that you are using the breath as object. The mind kicks in, follows faster and faster vibrations, things really engage and speed up, perhaps accompanied by more pronounced shaking or strange breathing patterns, increasing in speed, and then finally, halfway down, an out-breath, there is a shift. Things drop down slowly. It takes work to stay with things as they slow down, and then things bottom out. The breath may stop entirely for a while. Then things come back up with the breath, attention tends to flag. Things relax, and then the cycle begins again with things speeding up, etc. These breathing cycles may happen quite on their own, and may even be difficult to stop when we are deeply into this stage. Those using visualizations as object may notice that the objects begin to spin with the phase of the breath, or move in ways that they seem to have a life of their own, albeit a two-dimensional one, as compared to the three-dimensional visions that may arise later. As this stage deepens and matures, meditators let go of even the high levels of clarity and the other strong factors of meditation, perceive even these to arise and pass as just vibrations, not satisfy and not be self. 
they may plunge down into the very depths of the mind as though plunging deep under water to where they can perceive individual frames of reality arise and pass with breaking clarity as though in slow motion it can even feel as if we have been submerged in thick syrup and partially sedated with some strong opiate-like drug at the bottom of these depths however they present themselves individual moments may sometimes have a frozen quality to them as if sensations were stopping completely in the middle of their manifestation for just an instant and this way of experiencing reality is unique to this stage somewhere in there is the entrance to the third vipassana jhana in upandita's model though there is some controversy about exactly which insights line up with which vipassana jhanas from here on out i prefer to think of the arising and passing away being purely second vipassana jhana i will discuss these controversies in the following chapter the meditator may be able to meditate with profound clarity even when asleep and the need for sleep may be greatly reduced wild kundalini phenomena are very common at this point including powerful physical shaking and releases explosions of consciousness like a fireworks display or a tornado visions and especially vortexes of powerful fine electrical vibration blasting down one spinal column and or between one's ears these vortexes can be very loud these sorts of experiences can occur quite unexpectedly and even off the cushion such as in lucid dreams they may be followed by various mixtures of wonder excitement bliss extraordinary joy and sometimes disorientation it is not uncommon for those in the height of the rapture of this stage to associate some of these occurrences with those of an extended orgasm none of these things are a problem unless their true nature is not understood or unless they happen when one is doing something like driving a car down an interstate at seventy-five miles per hour a yeah, story for another time strong sensual or sexual feelings and dreams are common at this stage and these may have a non-discriminating quality that those attached to their notion of themselves as being something other than partially bisexual may find disturbing further if you have unresolved issues around sexuality which we basically all have you may encounter aspects of them during this stage this stage its afterglow and the almost withdrawal like crash that can follow seem to increase the temptation to indulge in all manner of hedonistic delights particularly substances and sex as the bliss wears off we may find ourselves feeling very hungry or lustful craving chocolate wanting to go out and party or something like that if we have addictions that we have been fighting some extra vigilance near the end of this stage might be helpful this stage also tends to give people more of an extroverted zealous or visionary quality and they may have all sorts of energy to pour into somewhat idealistic or grand projects and schemes at the far extreme of what can happen this stage can imdue one with the powerful charisma of the radical religious leader finally at nearly the peak of the possible resolution of the mind the meditator crosses something called the arising and passing event a and p event for short or deep insight into the arising and passing away this event marks a profound shift in the meditators practice and from then on they will be somewhat changed by what they have seen with this being the point of no return that i mentioned in the foreword and warning the intensity of this event can vary though it tends to be quite clear and memorable particularly the first time one crosses it during that cycle however for some there will simply be something that seems to have the general characteristics of the a and p territory that then fades without an obvious peak event it should also be noted that some people will have a big and obvious build-up to such experiences and for others they will suddenly just show up completely without warning sometimes spontaneously and even without formal meditation training as happened to me around age fifteen i have a number of friends who ran into these things without formal training and in daily life others who ran into them when doing hallucinogens including mescaline and lsd others during yoga practice others while around powerful spiritual figures including one who had it happen while hanging out with a christian faith healer 
and a few who were hanging out with various gurus. Whatever context the first A&P event happens in, that context will tend to hold a special place in that person's heart from then on. For me, it happened on my own, by my own meditation efforts and without a tradition, and so I have always associated my own practice with progress. My friend, who had it happen with a Christian faith healer, became the most hardcore Christian you could find, and many people who have had born-again experiences have just crossed the A&P. Another friend had it happen while on mescaline and has since held a special place in her heart for shamanism. Those who had it happen with gurus tend to follow those gurus for some period of time, associating it with the guru's presence. Some others who had it happen in apparently random context usually had no idea what it was or what it had done to them. But most have realized that something was different and most, though not all, remember it with an uncanny clarity as somehow standing out from ordinary experiences. Once one has attained this event, it is fairly likely that one will be able to attain the first stage of awakening sooner or later if one can navigate the dark night skillfully, meaning simply keep practicing. Thus, a good first goal in insight meditation is to cross the A&P event at one's earliest possible convenience, with caveats given later in the section on the dark night. The A&P event can happen in three basic ways, corresponding to the three characteristics, just as can the entrance to insight stage 15, fruition, and the two are easily confused for this and other reasons. There is great variation in the specifics of what we are seeing and feeling when we cross this profound and intense event, but certain aspects of these events will be common to all practitioners. This event tends to manifest in a way that can mirror the three doors, described below, at about the middle of the outbreath, leading to an unknown event, followed by a few exceedingly clearer and more distinct moments imparting some deep understanding of the three characteristics before a second knowing event at the end of the breath. It is not uncommon for the A and P event to occur during a particularly lucid dream or at least in the middle of the night. Now, it should be noted here that it is unlikely that these extreme moments for the sense of the breath to be particularly clear, but this is how things happen regardless. In these moments, most, but not all, of the meditator's sensate universe strobes in and out of reality, arises and passes. The subtle background and sense of an observer still seems to stay stable. In contrast to this, the entrance to stage 15, fruition, is through one of the three doors, involves the complete sensate universe, which is background, time, space and all, happens at the end of the outbreath and does not involve too closely related unknowing events. The usefulness of this information may become apparent later on. Those who have crossed the A&P event have stood on the ragged edge of reality and the mind for just an instant, and they may know that awakening is possible. They typically have great faith, may want to tell everyone to practice, and are generally evangelical, or excited about spirituality, religion, and or philosophy for a while. They will have an increased ability to understand Dharma teachings due to their direct and non-conceptual experience of the three characteristics. Philosophy that deals with the fundamental paradoxes of duality will be less problematic for them in some way, and they may find this fascinating for a time. Those with strong philosophical bent will find that they can now philosophize rings around those who have not attained to this stage of insight. They may also incorrectly think that they 